the history. Love the history. The Committee on Energy and Commerce will now come to order. And today the committee is holding a hearing entitled Lift America, Revitalizing Our Nation's Infrastructure and Economy. And of course, due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, today's hearing is being held remotely. All members and witnesses will be participating via video conferencing. And as part of our hearing, microphones will be set on mute for purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members and witnesses uh, will need to unmute their microphones each time they wish to speak. Uh, documents for the record can be sent to Rebecca Tomalchek at the email address we provided to staff, and all documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of the hearing. So I'm going to start uh, by recognizing myself for five minutes for an opening statement. And as I said, today we begin the process of rebuilding and revitalizing our economy by modernizing our nation's infrastructure. Over the last year, we've seen the devastating results of inaction, major power outages, water disruptions, healthcare facilities stretched to the limit, and communities left behind due to the digital divide. The Lift America Act, which was introduced last week by all 32 committee Democrats, will help build back a better economy. It invests a total of $312 billion in clean and efficient energy, safe drinking water, expanded access to broadband, brownfields cleanup, and improving our nation's healthcare infrastructure. This legislation will serve as the blueprint moving forward, and it provides us an opportunity to work together in a bipartisan fashion to deliver a robust and comprehensive infrastructure package. And I'm hopeful that we can work together to find bipartisan solutions. So I want to stress, and I said this to to uh, our ranking member. I mean, this is a, a, a beginning, you know, a, we introduced this as Democrats, but we would like to have Republican input uh, into this, you know, before anything moves forward. And there are a lot of bipartisan provisions, including the overall bill and, uh, you know, measures that were introduced by Republicans. So the bill itself has, does have a, a number of Republican initiatives in it, but be that as it may, I, you know, we, 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 we look at this as a work in progress. The Lift America Act will help us combat the climate crisis by investing more than 69 billion in clean energy and energy efficiency. We include funding to modernize our electric grid to accommodate more renewable energy and make it more resilient, uh, fund, more resilient funding to help rapidly deploy new technologies aimed at reducing emissions and funding for energy efficiency. And, you know, we worked a lot on energy efficiency and resiliency in that energy package that was a lot of which was included uh, in the omnibus at the end of the year. We also invest more than 41 billion in the deployment of electric vehicle infrastructure, including 12.5 billion to accelerate domestic manufacturing of batteries, power electronics, and other technologies for use in plug-in vehicles. Collectively, these investments will help us take an important step in combating the climate crisis while also rebuilding our economy, creating good paying jobs and providing much needed relief to consumers on their energy bills. We also invest more than 51 billion to protect Americans drinking water. The legislation extends and increases funding for the state revolving loan fund and other safe water programs targeting lead service lines, water system resiliency and water system security. We also established a new $2.5 billion grant program to help filter toxic PFAS chemicals or forever chemicals out of water supplies uh, in effective communities and ensure that water systems in U.S. territories will have access to resources they need. We also further fund the Brownfields program, which has successfully helped communities, including many environmental justice communities, clean up contaminated sites, remove public health threats, and prepare the sites for development. And the Lift America Act also makes significant investments in the expansion of broadband internet services. We invest $80 billion for the deployment of secure and resilient high-speed broadband, uh, and this allows for 100% broadband deployment across the country, closing the digital divide. Over the last year, we've seen how essential internet connectivity is, and this investment will lead to stronger small businesses and more jobs. And the legislation also invests one point. I should say 15 billion for the implementation of next generation 911 services that allow callers to send text messages, images, or videos to 911 in times of emergency. Again, um, a, a very much a bipartisan initiative. And there's 9.3 billion for broadband affordability and adoption to ensure that everyone can afford internet services. And finally, the Lift America Act invests 30 billion in our nation's health infrastructure. The COVID-19 
uh, pandemic has exposed an alarming number of pre-existing weaknesses in our nation's healthcare infrastructure, and the pandemic has also stretched our health infrastructure to the breaking point. And this funding will be used to upgrade hospitals and community health centers, improve clinical laboratory infrastructure, support the Indian Health Service, and increase the overall capacity for community-based care in America. So I don't think there's any better way to stimulate the economy uh, for the future than to modernize our badly aging infrastructure. And I obviously uh, want to work on this together as much as we can uh, over the next few weeks. So with that, I'll yield back and I will recognize Mrs. Rogers, the ranking member of the committee for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning and to all my colleagues. I'll start by reflecting on what life was like before the pandemic. Just over a year ago, our economy was booming. It was the hottest job market in half a century. After a decade of people asking, where are the jobs? Wages were rising. More jobs were available than people looking for work. People were coming off the sidelines. More people, including a record number of women and people with disabilities were coming off the sidelines. This economic boom was driven by lifting the regulatory burden as opposed to more government mandates and requirements. As a result, there was optimism again. People were hopeful, not fearful. Today, we should be leading to replicate this success. The hardworking people of this country are anxious for the days when we had hope and optimism driven by jobs. Which brings me to this progressive wish list, which is before us today. It's the complete opposite of what will deliver results. It's more regulations and mandates and less freedom to innovate and create jobs. The LIFT Act was first introduced in 2017 with a price tag of 85 billion. Today, it's a whopping 300 billion for the government to regulate the cars we drive and how we heat our homes and businesses. This is not the American way. It's another example of how Speaker Pelosi wants to take us back to the dark ages, rolling blackouts, Uncertainty as to whether the lights will come on when we turn on a, a light switch. People having to buy generators to ensure heat in their homes. The LIFT Act will hurt our energy security, affordability, and reliability. It establishes a multi-billion dollar slush fund for the Green New Deal to subsidize the left's mission to nationalize California's downfall. It fails to include solutions Republicans are focused on to secure cleaner American energy, to unleash private investment and remove barriers for new energy infrastructure and natural gas pipelines, nuclear licensing, and clean rene renewable hydropower. On broadband infrastructure, I'll leave it to former FCC Commissioner Michael O'Reilly to explain how this bill wastes billions without actually closing the digital divide and even setting rural America back further. Overall, I hope that we can have an honest debate on how this bill forces a regulatory regime and higher cost on America, uh, Americans who have struggled enough in the worst economic crisis in our lifetime. For our economy to boom again, we should be lifting the regulatory burden. If the majority is sincere, about turning this partisan bill bipartisan, we stand ready to engage. We're bringing solutions to the table to secure our clean energy future and boost broadband connectivity. I would offer, I am ready, we should be working together. Rather than holding these virtual hearings where we're all guilty of just making our own points and not listening, I, I long for the day when we can work to counter the forces that keep us from building trust, better relationships, and workable solutions. May this committee lead something new and lead the way. Thank you, and I'm, I'm going to yield the remainder of my time to uh, whoever. Oh, they, I, Guthrie. Grant Guthrie, sorry about I, that. <laughs> thank you, uh, ranking member, a Republican leader. I want to thank you for yielding. There are lessons to be learned from this pandemic on how to strengthen our public health infrastructure. It would be a wasted opportunity not to examine what areas need improvement after being tested from the pandemic of a century and finding solutions to enhance our public health infrastructure. I'm pleased the uh, 
chairman has said that we want to work together with these bills that have been put forward, as he said, from the Democrat perspective. The current text in the bill is essentially copied and pasted from a 2019 bill. Uh, and since, 20, since the 2019 bill was filed, Congress has provided billions and billions of dollars because of the pandemic in discretionary spending and even more in mandatory spending towards states, federal, federal and local public health projects. This includes workforce data systems, lab equipment, and some of which we will uh, still spend more than two, the money's two, two years more from now to be spent according to CBO. We do need to work together, when, not to authorize duplicate streams of funding, but to identify what we need to do as we move forward. I appreciate uh, the gentlelady for yielding and I yield back. Thank you. So uh, what we're gonna do now is, um, allocate five minutes uh, to each uh, side uh, before we go to uh, our uh, witnesses. And so the Democrats divided it uh, amongst the uh, chairs of jurisdiction. They'll get one minute each, and then I believe that the Republicans have divided it uh, between two, so they'll get like two and a half minutes each. So with that, I'm gonna go through the Democratic five minutes and I recognize uh, first Mr. Russ, chairman of the subcommittee on energy. But each of you guys only have one minute. Mr. Rush. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to begin by thanking you for your tenacious leadership in introducing the leading infrastructure for tomorrow's America Act, the LIFT Act. As the chairman of the energy subcommittee, this important bill is a top priority for me, especially considering the bill's strong support from all 32 committee members of the Democratic side. The Lift America Act makes critical invest investments to combat the climate crisis, expand broadband internet access, and revitalize America's lagging healthcare infrastructure. This bill also makes a serious and sizable investment to modernize our grid after recent grid failures, improve energy efficiency, and re uh, rejuvenate our communities, all while job driving job creation. Much needed investment in these key areas will support our nation in building back better a top priority for Bobby, most Bobby, people. Bobby, I got to interrupt you, otherwise the others aren't going to have a chance, if that's all right. Uh, you're back the mouth of my time, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Next, we're going to go to Chairwoman Eshoo. Good morning, Anna, we... colleagues. Uh, over the past year, our country has really undergone uh, profound changes because of uh, COVID-19, and it's laid bare a glaring shortcoming that our nation's public health infrastructure is outdated and unprepared for crisis. Uh, today's legislation invests over $36 billion to renovate and modernize public health departments, local hospitals, community health centers, the Indian Health Service, and the public health labs. Uh, the bill rebuilds our health system after a year from hell. As chairwoman of the health subcommittee, I'm proud that the legislation counteracts our nation's chronic underfunding of public health uh, and, um, and closes the disparities in public health infrastructure and data systems between regions and uh, the IHS. Uh, I'm very pleased that two of my bills are included, uh, one that will upgrade thousands of legacy call centers, emergency call centers, and the other protects uh, municipal broadband, uh, which expands access to broadband and offers higher speeds at lower prices. Uh, this uh, uh, would really be a vitamin B shot. Uh, right. in the and I'm going to have to interrupt you too. Thank you. All right, next we have Mr. Doyle. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing. The Lift America Act is a transformational investment in the future of our nation. We've been talking about closing the digital divide for as long as I've been on this committee, and far too many Americans, broadband's unavailable, too slow, or too expensive. This legislation will change all of that by delivering on the promise of universal high-speed broadband for all. We upgrade our nation's 911 system, giving our first responders more effective and reliable tools. We make massive investment in upgrading our nation's water and infrastructure. Good to see Ernie Muniz and Tom Wheeler here. I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Doyle Short, as always. And then last is Mr. Tonko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Lift America Act includes important contributions from ENC's uh, uh, subcommittee perspectives. It reauthorizes several drinking water programs, including the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. Uh, it's funded at increasing levels and reaches $5.5 billion annually. This long overdue investment is responsive to EPA's sixth drinking water infrastructure needs survey, which found over $470 billion is needed to maintain the nation's drinking water infrastructure over the next 20 years. Lyft also authorizes $22.5 billion for lead service line replacements. replacements. The bill creates a new EPA grant program to reduce emissions from ports and reauthorizes EPA's Brownfields program at increasing levels reaching $550 million for fiscal year 2026. It's all about creating jobs and uh, securing a stronger economic development. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Tonko. So now we're going to recognize the minority for five minutes to be evenly divided between Mr. Latta and Mr. McKinley. And I'll recognize uh, Mr. Latta at this point. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. During the several Congresses that Republicans led this committee, we were able to work with you all to pass substantive bipartisan policies to move the country forward. We're extremely disappointed that we have not been able to reach the same consensus we've had in the past years and the importance of bipartisanship has been seemingly forgotten. The issues before us today should not be bipartisan, should not be partisan. They impact Americans in each of our districts, regardless of their political party. Then we owe it to them to work together on their behalf. Republicans on this committee recently reintroduced the boosting broadband connectivity agenda to help Americans get broadband more quickly. And not a single one of those proposals is included in the legislation before us today. Same goes for broadband mapping, which has historically been a bipartisan issue. Acting FCC uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel, who has several times stated no money before maps, is now saying that it could take up to a year to complete the maps. Yet here we are today evaluating legislation that pushes 80 billion out the door before the maps are completed. We've made this mistake before and it appears we could make it again if this legislation proceeds. Furthermore, it has long been a bipartisan effort to upgrade our 911 networks to next gen 911. In fact, we've been working with you and your staff diligently over the last several years on legislation to authorize this program. But in this legislation, you threw away all the bipartisan work. On top of that, I'm not convinced that the 15 billion in this bill for NG911 will actually accomplish the goal of an in interoperable nationwide 911 network. I could go on, but I'll leave it there for now. I'm truly disturbed by the actions. It is clear that this legislation is a, is a partisan wish list. We must strategically and smartly fund programs that have real impact only after evaluating what we have done already in order to see if it is working or not. Unfortunately, this bill does not uh, do that at all, but instead throws money thoughtlessly at every problem in hopes that it will be fixed. I can tell you right now, that isn't how we make long lasting solutions. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'm gonna yield the balance of my time to my colleague, the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley. Thank you. Mr. McKinley's recognized. And thank you, Mr. Lotta, and thank you, Chairman uh, Pallone on that. Uh, uh, this massive partisan partisan bill seeks to further carry out Biden's environmental agenda. And part of that includes the infrastructure needed for electric vehicles. Look, I'm one of those engineers that you mentioned earlier on a uh, civil engineer uh, that, that get they degrade on the infrastructure. But I'm fascinated by the injection of political timelines and ideology into an engineering decision fundamentally transforming our entire trans uh, transform transportation away from the dependable internal combustion engine is one thing. 
And I don't really have a serious problem long term on that. But performing open heart surgery on such a crucial component of our economy should demand more than an academic exercise. Congress needs to grasp the, the consequences. So I will ask a number of questions like, how do we ensure a stable and resilient electric grid? How, what's the impact on jobs in refineries, pipelines, and drilling? How are we going to develop a domestic a battery supply chain? Will America have a reliable source for lithium, cobalt, nickel, and other critical minerals? How are we going to replace the gasoline tax that will be lost for, for road maintenance? What about the time lost in recharging stations? What about accounting for the lack of trade-in values for people trying to get rid of their internal combustion engine? They're going to pay the nurses and school teachers are going to have to pay 100%. Is this another unfunded government mandate? Or, or what about the, the addressing the increase in landfill waste from batteries and renewable energy pieces? Wouldn't this transition be less stressful if it occurred using free market forces? Wouldn't that be a novel thing in Washington to use a free market approach? Not unexpectedly, California and Massachusetts already to have, are banning the sale of cars with internal combustion engines as early as 2035. So, you know, Mr. Chairman, this debate is no longer the same as legislating against plastic straws and styrofoam. This is real world what we're talking about, people's jobs, economy, and communities. Congress should find the answers to questions like I've just phrased before we move headlong into something so so transformative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. Um, so um, I just want to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. So that's the end of our opening statements, but please submit written statements if you like. And now I'm going to introduce our witnesses. I just want to get a little, little background on each of them. Uh, first is the Honorable Ernest Moniz. Uh, he's President and Chief Executive Officer of Energy Futures Initiative and, of course, the former Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy. Then there's Dr. Tom Frieden, who's President and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives, an initiative of vital uh, strategies, and he's former director also of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We have the Honorable Michael O'Reilly, who is a principal of MPO O'Reilly Consulting, LLC, and former commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission. And the Honorable Tom Wheeler, visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, and of course, former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And we're, we are definitely looking forward to your testimony. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Moniz, who's recognized uh, for five minutes at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Rogers, uh, members of the committee, uh, for this opportunity to discuss the Lift America Act. Coming on the heels of the disaster in Texas, this hearing and the Lift America Act's focus on improving the nation's energy infrastructure is very timely. We made energy infrastructure an early priority uh, in my tenure as Energy Secretary, the development of the Quadrennial Energy Review, and I'm pleased to see close alignment uh, with the Lift America Act. The urgency of upgrading our energy infrastructure in a changing climate is painfully clear. The weather patterns of the past are not adequate to inform those of the future, and this profoundly affects infrastructure planning. In looking ahead to infrastructure needs, it's useful to note a number of technologies that will drive major infrastructure needs. Electricity and the grid, the reliable and resilient grid is the infrastructure on which others depend. Electrification of other economic sectors, especially transportation and a continental scale charging infrastructure. Large scale carbon management, CCUS of gigaton scale and several carbon dioxide removal pathways will depend on large scale carbon management infrastructures. Fuels to complement clean electricity a low carbon fuel will be needed, and hydrogen is the most likely candidate, requiring yet another major infrastructure. In this opening statement, I'll highlight only a few of the observations and recommendations in my written testimony. Electric grid modernization must meet multiple objectives, but transmission build out is challenging. Permitting could be streamlined in a number of ways in a broad stakeholder process, such as harnessing existing rights away, and Congress could initiate a review of federal policy on wholesale market design. Electric vehicle infrastructure, 
must be scaled up rapidly in the next three to five years consistent with social equity. Battery supply is also a critical need. Incentives for domestic battery manufacturing and IP protection in an area of intense international competition are critical. Battery supply considerations illustrate the importance of supply chains for critical metals and minerals, such as lithium and cobalt, suggesting development of sustainable domestic mining. Offshore wind is a good example of the importance of infrastructure planning to enable a critical low carbon pathway and create lots of good jobs. New federal policy for transmission system build out could include expanding DOE's loan program funding to enable offshore wind, extending investment tax credits and reinstating 48C advanced energy manufacturing tax credits. Decarbonization of port infrastructure operations through electrification or use of hydrogen or other net zero carbon fuels should be integral to infrastructure modernization. For the natural gas system to be leveraged as part of the clean energy transition, its emissions must be reduced to meet climate policy targets. Greatly reducing methane emissions deserves full commitment from industry. Hydrogen is a clean energy carrier with multiple applications across every sector of the economy. The infrastructures needed for hydrogen market formation tend to be highly regional. Finding synergies with other infrastructures, uh, infrastructure needs for achieving deep decarbonization could lower the overall development costs of a hydrogen fueled economy. Federal and state governments should work together to incentivize early mover hydrogen CO2 hubs, perhaps through approved multi-state regional compacts. Carbon capture utilization and storage will be an essential element in any portfolio of actions for meeting a mid-century net zero goal. Congressional action to encourage repurposing of existing rights away to allow for CO2 pipelines to co-locate with other infrastructures would be beneficial. DOE's carbon safe program could be enhanced and accelerated to advance geologic storage hubs. New business models could encompass creation of third party carbon management entities, perhaps a CO2 utility model, transitioning firms and workers with expertise in managing fossil fuel production and processing. Energy infrastructures are also increasingly dependent on digital technologies, making broadband access a critical part of modernizing those infrastructures. Smart cities and communities should focus on the digital backbone infrastructure, integrated smart electricity and telecommunications systems linked to big data, sensors, real-time modeling, and artificial intelligence capabilities. In concluding, I'll note two broad themes. First is unequivocal support for a focus on good jobs as part of any successful climate action and clean energy infrastructure plan. At EFI, we have partnered with the AFL-CIO to form the Labor Energy Partnership. Without attention to jobs, we will face unnecessary headwinds in reaching our climate goals. Second, we strongly support a regional focus for solutions to climate change and the associated energy infrastructure needs. A one-size-fits-all approach to policy and financial support will likely impede, not accelerate, progress towards deep decarbonization. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Rogers, members of the committee, the Lift America Act is a very important and necessary step towards supporting the infrastructure we need for deep decarbonization of energy systems and for building resilience into our infrastructures in anticipation of increasingly extreme weather patterns. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Uh, next, we have Dr. Frieden, who's recognized for five minutes. Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Pallone, Ranking Member Rogers, distinguished members of the committee. Um, uh, my group, Resolve to Save Lives, partners with countries to prevent 100 million deaths from heart disease and stroke and to make the world safer from epidemics. It's been more than a century since there's been a pandemic this disruptive. And we have to always remember that every case, hospitalization, and death, represents a mother, a father, a neighbor, a colleague, or friend, and it's been unprecedented, but there is really room for optimism. The situation is much better than it was weeks ago. We're vaccinating more than 2 million people a day, uh, and deaths are steadily decreasing as a result, but better doesn't mean good. Case numbers are still high, declines have stalled or even increasing in some areas of the country, and the emergence of spread and spread of variant viruses is the wild card and single greatest concern about response to the pandemic. 
Accelerating vaccinations and other control me measures as quickly as possible is the best way to save lives and decrease the risk of dangerous variants. Now, here's the bottom line in terms of our health, and that I can talk to that specifically. We have to fix our broken primary health care system. I won't talk more about that in this testimony. We have to fix our broken public health system, and we have to make the world safer because if people are stronger there, we're safer here, safer from epidemics. And the plain truth is we haven't adequately invested in public health. We spend $11,000 per person on health care, but 40, four zero times less, less than $300 per person for public health. We're underfunded, understaffed, poorly coordinated, and not equipped for modern day crises. And the result was uh, avoidable illness and death with the pandemic. Now, we can do five things to make a difference. Uh, sorry, six things. First, long-term investments. It's very important that you've made a down payment, but a sustainable system cannot rely on one-time funding. It's inevitable there will be future outbreaks. What's not inevitable is that we'll continue to be so underprepared. One-time supplemental doesn't answer the question. We need an ongoing support. Second, use a cross-cutting support. The Centers for Disease Control has more than 160 budget lines. The solution isn't to cut or merge or block grant those lines. The solution is to come up with new lines that are cross-cutting, that meet the needs at the local level, state level, city level, and global level. Fourth, uh, strengthen local and state health agencies so they can rapidly respond to outbreaks. Fifth, address the chasms between federal and state, and in most states, state and local public health agencies. That will mean greatly expanding CDC programs that embed staff for two to five years or longer in state, city, and local and global public health departments. That's how we move toward a more unified, effective, efficient system that we should all support. And sixth, strengthen global health security. Disease spread anywhere is a risk everywhere. Last year, I testified about new ways to ensure sustained public health financing. We cannot build sustained infrastructure if our health defense agencies, including CDC, HRSA, and others, have to compete with very laudable and important funding priorities, Head Start, research at NIH, and many, many more. We proposed a sustainable funding mechanism for public health infrastructure that would fund lines that are essential for preventing, detecting, and responding to health threats. We called this the Health Defense Operations Budget Designation, or HDO. It would exempt specific congressionally designated health security infrastructure funding from the annual 302 spending caps. You decide in Congress what those lines are. This would not be a fund. Congress would maintain oversight on all programs, projects, and activities that you in Congress designate as essential to secure our health security. And you can mandate a OMB bypass professional judgment uh, budget so that you can know the unvarnished truth about what's needed uh, to provide sustained and sustainable funding so we can escape this terrible and deadly cycle of panic and neglect, because that's what we're in now. The HDO proposal has strong bipartisan support 49 leading public health groups have signed on, and I hope that no matter how divided groups are politically, we recognize that we share a common enemy. That enemy is dangerous microbes. We need a sustainable public health infrastructure to defend our country, our people, from health threats, just as we defend the that we depend on the military to defend us from threats foreign and domestic. We can prevent the next pandemic, this is the moment to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. Um, next, we have Mr. O'Reilly. He's recognized for five minutes. Members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to share my views on the communication portions of H.R. 1848, the Lift America Act, and efforts to expand broadband deployment for all Americans. For clarity, I do not represent any public or private entity on this matter. These are my own views. The availability of high-speed internet allows users around the world to communicate, learn, work, conduct commerce, and so much more. These benefits have never been so apparent than during the COVID-19 pandemic when American families have been isolated and quarantined, driving households to seek and use broadband technologies, whether via cable, fiber, wireless, satellite, or otherwise, to a far greater extent than ever before. 
despite dedicated efforts, there is no dispute that millions of American households are still without access to broadband. Thankfully, this situation is improving. Over the last several decades, the FCC has taken many steps to facilitate broadband deployment and greater access. During my tenure at the agency in both minority and majority capacities, I helped spearhead efforts to reform and modernize existing programs and initiate key new ones. These programs are working and helping to shrink the unserved household population. Respectfully, there are a host of issues addressed in H.R. 1848 that deserve more attention and major revisions, but I'll focus my comments on the broadband access provisions because they are so questionable. Experience has shown that there are two leading ways to extend broadband to the unserved. First is through very targeted, well thought out subsidy programs that focus directly on unserved Americans and exclude areas that the private sector is already serving or ready to serve. Second, barriers to private sector deployment must be reduced or completely eliminated. Again, respectfully, I find the Lift America Act severely lacking for these reasons. While I appreciate the interest of some to future proof networks, I disagree with the extensive funding and out of touch definition of broadband. For instance, the push for symmetrical speeds at exorbitant levels such as 100, 100 megabits per second makes little sense. I couldn't figure out where the recommended upload speed came from, so I chatted with some experts in the space. The best anyone can figure out is it came, at least in part, from the Fiber Broadband Association filings. In a 2021 table, the association assumed a household would have two HD video streams with an upstream requirement of 5 megabits per second one AR VR stream with an upstream requirement of 40 megabits per second, three security monitoring streams with an upstream two megabits per second requirement and a gaming stream with an upstream requirement of 20 megabits per second for a total of 82. Think about that. Almost half of the upload speed is for AR VR, which is at best extremely raw and gaming for the average family. A 100 meg upload speed does not reflect reality for now or anytime soon. And if I read the bill correctly, 20% of the 80 billion or 16 billion will go to one gigabit upload networks. I also don't think the overall broadband ecosystem can handle 80 billion. And I implore you to consider a level closer to 20 billion. The consequences of these policies are very significant. Essentially, such a push for an inflated broadband speed will lead to a gigantic level of, un of a subsidized overbuilding since most of the nation does not meet the new definition. It wipes away any technology other than fiber and scraps all federal broadband programs. This would not only be wasteful, but discourage private sector investment and deployment. Equally important, government spending on served or scheduled to be served areas with very functional broadband siphons the energy and ability to address those Americans who are truly unserved. If passed, all efforts will shift to easier and richer areas over these unserved areas without 25.3 today. We are so close on this. On a related topic, the simple fact is that some state and local governments and private company limitations are acting as barriers to greater deployment. I'm pleased to see the broad array of legislative efforts introduced by committee members to address many of these obstacles. The record is clear. Providers can face high fees to utilize existing communications infrastructure poles, docks, conduits, and the like, or convoluted processes to gain rights away and zoning approvals. They also encounter limitations on the placement of, of or expansion of wireless facilities. Yet the bill excludes any attempt to fix this colossal mess. By not addressing this, the, commission, the committee is effectively making broadband deployment slower and more expensive. On the positive side, I appreciate the efforts by the committee to continue to exclude state and local government 911 fee diverters, specifically New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and Nevada, from receiving any of the new federal grant monies identified for modernizing 911 networks. I stand ready to answer any questions of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Riley. O'Reilly. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Wheeler. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, ranking member, members of the committee. Uh, it's a privilege to be back before you again. The Lift Act is historic, um, and that's not just hyperbole. Um, it's historic because it recognizes that the almost 100-year-old approach that supported the expansion of electric and telephone service into rural America doesn't work for broadband. 
the legislation creates a new plan for universal service, a build it once plan, that not only will deliver broadband, but also will finally stop the drip, drip, drip of billions of dollars constantly being paid out with limited results. The bill is also historic in that it recognizes that the 40-year-old Reagan administration program to support low-income telephone service is inadequate to support broadband. The Lifeline program was the right idea, but it was built for telephone service, not broadband. It was built for the ability to call 911. But in terms of both costs and capabilities, that is far different from the needed support to go online, to go to school, to apply for a job, or to get a COVID shot. So I'm not engaging in hyperbole when I say this is a once in a generation, maybe once in a century opportunity. A few quick points that are covered in more detail in my written testimony. Solving the rural broadband problem once and for all requires supporting the build out the same way we build highways. Pay it once. The 1930s model that subsidized rural telephone and electric service is inadequate for subsidizing broadband. You build a telephone network to get a dial tone. You build an electric network to flip a switch. But building a scalable broadband network is not as simple because of the ever-increasing demands for throughput. Thus far, we have repeatedly subsidized just good enough networks that were soon outdated. This bill focuses on subsidizing future-proof networks. The bill focuses on unserved rural and tribal areas breaking out of the trap of always having to hope for another round of subsidies just to catch up. While I was chairman of the FCC, we increased the definition of broadband to 25.3, 25 megabits uh, uh, down, three megabits up. And today that is wholly inadequate. I've included in my written testimony AT&T's forecast of how usage in 2025 will far exceed today's usage. And it is because of that exponentially expanding usage that today 80% of Americans can get one gigabit service. One gigabit service. Private capital didn't build that capacity to waste money, but to meet demand. Public monies have an even higher obligation to prevent 20% of Americans from being trapped in second-class service and to spend taxpayers' dollars as wisely as private capital is spent. To catch up on the other 20% of Americans means building with fiber and hybrid fiber coax. I've appeared many times before this committee promoting the wonders of wireless connectivity, and I remain a wireless advocate. But wireless is constrained by the finite nature of spectrum from being a full-fledged substitute for wired broadband. At last week's analyst meeting, AT&T reported that average household data would grow to one and a half terabytes by 2025, and that usage of this magnitude won't be supported by mobile networks on frequencies below six gigahertz. And that traffic, the traffic mix will shift towards the uplink, thus favoring fiber and full duplex HFC. If AT&T is spending private capital to build that future, public funds must have an equal discipline to invest for that future. The LIFT Act also is historic in its funding of broadband subsidies for low-income Americans through the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. The EBB is a breakthrough because it identifies the broadband support should be different from telephone support. The LIFT Act appropriately funds the EBB. But ultimately, what is necessary is a permanent solution for low-income consumers in rural and urban America, just like a permanent solution for rural development. The LIFT Act is also historic because of its pro-competitive initiatives such as transparency, 
non-corporate network ownership, and the collection of pricing information. And finally, Mr. Chairman, a personal observation. I made it a point in every single appearance I made before this committee as chairman to highlight the need for support to upgrade our nation's 911 capabilities. This bill does that. This bill will save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. And that uh, concludes our uh, witnesses uh, opening statements. So we're gonna now, now move to members questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. And I'm gonna start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, I, I wanna get to three questions. So I'm asking you each to be brief. Uh, first, the Secretary Muniz, I appreciate your hard work uh, uh, at DOE and, and uh, especially the comprehensive quadrennial energy review reports, which we would always mention. Um, the committee is actually going to hold two hearings on the Texas power crisis this week. And I think that highlights the need for robust grid infrastructure. Um, so just my question is, what are the specific benefits of grid modernization, especially as it relates to resiliency and also meeting our climate goals? Does the Texas power crisis present any specific lessons about not prioritizing investments in our nation's energy infrastructure? And you're supposed to answer that in about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a few comments on Texas. Uh, one of the major lessons, very important, is that as we do grid modernization, we have to look at the intersections with other uh, infrastructures, in particular, uh, the failed approach uh, to integrate response on the gas side and the electricity side uh, was a was a huge problem in Texas. So that's important. Secondly, I would just add more generally, it's the integration of IT uh, and the electricity system on both the high voltage transmission uh, and the distribution system uh, that will be extremely important for new services uh, and for resilience and reliability. So actually, I would just link that as well to your broadband uh, initiative, which is very, very important uh, uh, because uh, that will be part of this integration of IT uh, and grid that's so important. If I may make one quick observation, um, I have a rural place in Southern Colorado and we just got fiber optics and it's a revolution in what you can do in a rural setting. So I just wanted to make that observation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Deget just put fingers up on that one. Let me go to Dr. Frieden. I know you really stress uh, that that the COVID has has you know highlighted the chronic in, uh, underfunding of state and local health departments as well as the federal public health system. Can you explain why a predictable, stable, and consistent funding for public health infrastructure is so critical? Um, and even though we've provided some funding during CARES Act that it isn't sufficient for the long-term sustainability of the public health system. Again, you have about a minute. <laughs> let, me, let me just give you the experience as someone who has run public health agencies for decades. Um, when you get one-time money, there's certain things you just cannot do. You can't necessarily recruit the best staff because they know that in two or three or five years, they won't have a job. You can't necessarily hold contractors accountable because if they don't do a great job, they think, eh, the money's gone next time. You can't have partnerships with state, local, county, or global partners who can trust you because when the money dries up, you're going to pull the rug out from that partnership. And that's exactly what happened after Ebola. Congress uh, devoted hundreds of millions of dollars to really important programs. And we worked hard, hard, hard to collaborate, figure out who to work with. And then the money dried up and dozens of countries had to be defunded, CDC operations stopped, including China. Um, and that might have changed. We don't know, but it might have changed the trajectory of the pandemic. So we need a consistent approach, not an on and off approach. I agree, thank you so much. And then uh, finally, Chairman Wheeler, I know you said that the bill um, before us is a good approach, but if you just would spend a minute telling us again why it's important that we make a really bold investment in broadband right now at this time. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. But I mean, let's let's look at we are confronted right now with multiple existential crises. 
And the fascinating thing is that every single one of those can be attacked using broadband. Broadband helps meet those crises. We're facing a pandemic, but responses can be coordinated and surely shots, uh, you have to have broadband to be able to get a shot. We're facing an economic crisis. The new digital economy, the creation of jobs and economic growth built on broadband. We're facing a social justice crisis. 10 million school kids can't have distant learning because they don't have broadband. 40% of seniors don't have access to broadband. And we're facing a climate crisis. And broadband does help reduce emissions. So my point that I would make in response to your question is, here is one tool that can attack four of the major existential crises that we as a nation are facing today. Thank you. Now I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Rogers, ranking member, for five minutes. Uh, I yield to her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. You're the the only minority witness today to discuss this massive bill, and I look forward to hearing from you on the important topic of broadband deployment. However, this bill does much further than just wasting billions of taxpayer dollars on an ineffective broadband deployment program. It also contains over $100 billion in funding to subsidize unreliable renewables over clean baseload power, like natural gas, nuclear, mandates electric vehicles and electric vehicle infrastructure, which will further burden our grid. And that's why I requested another witness, former Deputy Secretary for, for Energy, Mark Menzies, to testify on the massive expansion of government in the energy sector. Unfortunately, this request was rejected by the majority, uh, we did have two minority witnesses for our last full committee hearing on this bill when it was less than half the cost of the current bill. Had he been allowed to testify, I would have asked him how the LIFT Act further weakens our grid reliability, increases our dependence on China, and prioritizes urban areas at the expense of rural America. These are important questions that we should have been allowed to explore today. But the negative effects of this bill and, and what it would have on our broadband deployment are equally important. The legislation spends over $100 billion on broadband, broadband funding, but I'm concerned that it will only widen the digital divide. It increases the minimum speed thresholds for areas to be considered severe so that every part of America will be eligible for this funding. What does this mean? It means that Americans with zero broadband service today will even move further to the back of the line. While ambiguous, quote, anchor institutions get gold-plated service. This bill also directs the FCC to expand the E-rate program to serve households in addition to schools and libraries, something already funded by other federal programs. Mr. O'Reilly, what are some of the real impacts to Americans and the communication landscape in this country if this bill passes? Thank you for the question. You're absolutely right that if this bill were to pass, the dollars would go to those areas that are easier and more well-to-do than those Americans who don't have broadband today, depending how the count, whether it's 14 million or 20 million Americans don't have broadband. And I would agree with Tom Wheeler's point that he just made on the benefits of broadband, but all of those things that he highlighted can be done with the current speeds, certainly on the upload side. The, you know, in terms of getting your pandemic uh, appointment, you can do wirelessly in most instances. So the idea that you need this advanced network that we're talking about in the bill is not necessarily true to his point. But to yours, and it's very valid, that, you know, the anchor institutions will be have extensive build out and serving the community, which will depress the private investment by those communities trying to survive and it, with small providers with very little money. Um, I've dealt with those companies and I've sat in those, those, those kitchens of those Americans without service and they will, be they will be put at the back of the line and dealt with another day as other things become priority. Thank you. You know, in my district, we have needs in urban Spokane. We also have needs in the rural underserved areas. I represent remote and very difficult to serve counties in Eastern Washington. 
In your opinion, Mr. O'Reilly, will this bill close the digital divide between urban and rural areas? I would think that it would widen it in terms of my previous experience. And I happen to have visited your, your district or just outside in some of the rural parts. My sister lives there. Uh, and so I've seen the territory in the mountainous regions that, where she lived. And so I believe that this would make it harder to serve those communities that don't have broadband today. So what would be the best way to close the digital divide once and for all? I would target the money towards those programs and that are already operating and focus on those 14 to 20 million Americans or whatever the exact number is. The commission's been working hard to this. It's taking criticism for the RDOF program, but at the heart of the RDOF program will be beneficial and getting to phase two and getting the maps done. All the things that are in line to be addressed will be incredibly beneficial and help solve the problem uh, for those that don't have access today. You brought up the important work of the maps uh, and updating the maps. What's the, what's, the, what's the status of getting the maps updated? It's been over a year since the bill was signed into law. In fairness, I don't have a great answer. I've, I've been removed for, for a number of months from the commission, um, and I'd have to, def what I did hear from my last Senate hearing, uh, that there was talk of doing the maps in four months, and, and I'd welcome that because they're absolutely needed to move forward on at least two programs, but that's if the rest of the bill doesn't wipe off those programs completely. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thanks to the uh, ranking member. Now we're going to move to members. Now, you know, back and forth, Democrat, Republican. Now, I just want to tell everyone, and I know some are going to get not happy with this, but, you know, this is based on seniority at the gavel. If you weren't present on camera at the gavel, then, uh, then you go to the back of the line. Okay, so the first person uh, is uh, Ms. Esch, who was recognized for five mm -hmm. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, to each one of the witnesses. It's uh, it's an all-star cast, and it's really wonderful to see and uh, each one of you, uh, and to not only read your testimony but to uh, to hear you uh, make your comments this morning. Um, I want to go to uh, former Chairman Wheeler first. Um, uh, your colleague, former colleague on the uh, commission, has. Um, offered his critique of the bill. Uh, can you, in a, in a minute, respond to uh, what he has put forward? Uh, I, I think I'm hearing in each area, um, essentially people looking in the rear view mirror and thinking they see the future. Th this bill is all about building out our future in specific areas, whether it's energy, broadband, uh, public health. So can you, um, would you just respond for a minute? Uh, thank you, Ms. Eschen. And, yeah. And thank you very much. Um, the, um, you know, I have the greatest respect for my former colleague and we did work together. Um, and, I and I do too, and I do too. But frankly, I don't get this back of a line stuff, <laughs> all right? I mean, the reality is that under the $80 billion plan, which is based on the study that we did in 2017 as to what would it cost to have fiber to every location in America, okay, under that plan, everybody gets access to the network. There is nobody in there that gets some access to the money. There's nobody in the back of the line. Everybody gets the same opportunity to bring their service up to the kinds of levels that the vast majority of America enjoys. And I agree entirely with your point that we can't fall into the trap of defining tomorrow in terms of yesterday. Mm -hmm. What I was trying to point out in my testimony is that AT&T has told us that's not how they're spending money. And they're telling us they're spending money on fiber. This was just in the analyst meeting last week. And that's the kind of approach that public monies ought to take as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Frieden, you uh, uh, rolled out six uh, major points um, uh, relative to, uh, to public health. Uh, do you see the, uh, the LIFT Act um, addressing those? I think it's really important. The investments are crucial for our future. Um, what is also crucial is to ensure that they are sustained over time. Right. Um, well, we know that from uh, from NIH. Uh, you know, we 
increased uh, at one point, we doubled the funding, uh, but we went through a period of time where funding was not um, sustained and it didn't cover uh, the increased costs of, of, of living and all of that. So um, uh, I agree with you. Do you think that, uh, that this bill meets those six points or is there something missing? Um, I think what's missing is the long-term sustainability, that, that addressing this is important. I also think it's very important we look at primary health care. I didn't address that in either my written or oral testimony because I was focused more on public health. But if you look very frankly, um, the U.S. does not have primary health care at the center of our system. And this is something that I truly do believe, like public health is a bipartisan issue that everyone can agree on. People should have a family doctor, a family clinician, um, mm -hmm. urban and rural. Uh, all well, they're of the, the entry point to the system. They really are the uh, primary care. Uh, Secretary Muniz, it's wonderful to see you, hear you, yeah. uh, read your testimony, and uh, to all of you, your contributions to our country are really significant. Uh, have we missed something in this legislation? Uh, I think the infrastructure bill uh, lift uh, really will make tremendous across the board uh, 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 advances. I, I do think that there is uh, another emphasis uh, that could be stronger in terms of things like the integrated infrastructures, as I mentioned, like uh -huh. carbon large scale carbon management uh, with uh, with hydrogen, for example. Uh, the uh, if we're going to make net zero and eventually net negative. We will need technologies like carbon dioxide removal uh, from the atmosphere in multiple ways, including terrestrial and mineralization. Uh, we need to have our infrastructure minds also focused on uh, these new infrastructures uh, that we will uh, that that we will need. But I think the the bill uh, does a uh, uh, certainly moves across the board on each of those four areas I mentioned at the beginning of my testimony. Thank you very, very much to each one of you. Mr. Yes. Chairman, if, if I may add one other note, Mr. Chairman, besides the, it, it's just to reinforce what Tom Frieden said. Uh, I also serve as the CEO of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And in 2019, we issued a public health, uh, a global health security index. The world was unprepared, the United States, was relatively prepared, but the big markdown was lack of access to a robust public health system, just as well. Wow. Thank, Thank you. you. They yield back. Thank you to each one of you. Thank you. Uh, next is Dr. Burgess is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Frieden, good, good to see you again. Uh, you spent a lot of time in this committee over the last 20 years. It's good to good to have you back in the in the committee again. Let me, I, you know, I I don't disagree with with many of your points. Uh, I do I do suggest that there's a, a bit of a disconnect between the bricks and mortar and the actual people who are working within the bricks and mortar. The reason I bring this up, uh, I was visiting a hospital down in in the southern part of Texas uh, last week and uh, hit hard by, by coronavirus. The area, uh, community spread was just beyond what anyone expected in the early days of the illness, and, uh, and they got hit pretty hard. Now, they managed, and they're, they're coming through, and, but their biggest problem today is they can't keep staff. We have made so much money available <laughs> through other things that their staff kind of gets pulled away by, oh, uh, uh, contract, uh, labor arrangements and emergency department uh, staffing arrangements, such that uh, although they have managed during the crisis, they are they're really having a tough time with their staffing. And and I know that's not the purpose of this bill, but I just ask us to be careful when we're when we're pumping money into systems. It's not always done. It's it, sometimes there are unintended consequences in places where you might not have expected them. But but kind of along those lines, when you look at all of the the healthcare infrastructure investment that has been made going back to, even to the 1940s, um, th how do we make sure that we're putting the proper emphasis on on the staffing, the men and women who are actually going to deliver the healthcare rather than just the facilities themselves? If, 
Thank you, Dr. Burgess. That's a, a great question. I'm really delighted to, to, to dig into it with, I'm gonna make three suggestions because uh, I think it is a really important issue. We have a shortage of public health staff, 50,000 lines lost in the past 10, 15 years in public health departments. We have a shortage of primary care doctors because quite frankly, we don't pay enough for primary care. There's no mystery why there are fewer primary care doctors. They make a lot less money than other doctors and it's supply and demand. Um, so I think there are three things that we need to do to address the personnel issue. First, we need a robust federal program that embeds staff in state, city, and local health departments. Thousands of people who will be on the federal payroll and rotating from cities and states into and back to Atlanta uh, CDC. We started this in my time with something called the Public Health Associates Program. It's a, it's a big success story, but it's a drop in the bucket for, uh, compared to what's needed. Uh, 200 people on a top year, we, we would get four or 5,000 applications in just a week. So one is CDC embedded staff. Second, in the healthcare system, we need to embrace team-based care where every member of the team practices at the top of their license. That will make our healthcare system uh, more efficient and better for people. Uh, well, right now we don't do that. Pharmacists, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and physician all need to practice at the top of their license. That makes our system much more efficient and the outcomes can be much better. And third, uh, we have to address some of the efficiencies. One of them is telemedicine. There's a lot that can be done on telemedicine. Maybe this is one area where the broadband issue and the health issue intersect because we've seen parts of the country where you can't do telemedicine because you don't have high-speed internet. I've, I've worked on um, uh, electronic health record programs both in um, central city areas, impoverished central city areas, and in rural areas where you can't do it because you don't have fast enough internet connection, however you define broadband. Um, and you also have to think about the interstate agreements. And this is an issue that I think, you know, would have both bipartisan support and maybe bipartisan opposition. But fundamentally, what you have in this country is different states have guilds, and they make it difficult for uh, perfectly qualified practitioners from other states to practice in those states. We, we call those professional standards, but I, I understand what you're saying. Look, I, I just want to ask you another question, and it, it kind of goes to the, when we talked about the telecom side and, and the issue was made about the private sector, uh, private sector is, is moving uh, faster in the telecom side than the, say, the public sector. And this is to some degree true in public health. We saw it big time with the testing available for coronavirus in those early days. Um, Frank Malone always says he wanted to see a national testing strategy. We had that at the CDC, and unfortunately, it failed us. We only got on top of the testing when we embraced what the private sector could bring to the equation as well. And we saw the same story essentially in vaccines. So it, it is not a, it's not a silo. We, we do have to allow the partici participation and the energy and enthusiasm of the private sector as well. Total agreement. It's an all of the above need. The CDC provides public health laboratory testing uh, academic medical centers provide great testing for their centers, and the private sector, well-regulated and supported, provides quality testing uh, for the country. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Next is Mr. Doyle. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Chairman Wheeler, uh, and Tom, it's good to see you back uh, here in front of the committee. Um, Chairman. I just um, find it amazing that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle seem to be telling their rural constituents that uh, any kind of broadband is better than no broadband at all, and, and that you should be happy to get yesterday's broadband because right now you don't have anything. But it seems to me if we're going to keep building networks that are already antiquated by the time we put them in the ground, we're just setting up people and, uh, and the networks being built for failure. So and I think you've made that point pretty clear. Um, I want to talk, you know, the Lift America Act includes billions of dollars for broadband adoption and language to ensure that people have access to affordable service. Uh, and communities like my own in Pittsburgh, uh, our main problem isn't deployment, uh, although more, more competition would be nice, but the big barrier to adoption is the high price of service. 
so why is closing the affordability gap more important than ever in this bill? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Doyle. Um, you know, I mean, the fascinating thing is that more people could get broadband, but don't get broadband than the number of people who can't get broadband. Right. And, and why is that? Can't the afford principal, it. The principal reason, you know, Pew Research went out and did a study, and they found the principal reason was price. You know, the, the, the average broadband monthly fee is $70 and up. Benton Foundation, now I guess called the Benton Institute, uh, did a study of low-income Americans in which they said, you know, with all the other priorities we have in life, we can afford about $10 a month. There's the answer to your problem, sir. It is, what does it cost versus what is affordable? And, and it's wonderful what EBB has done to address that affordability problem. The point that I've been making in my prepared as well as my direct remarks here is that we have to find a permanent solution that enables um, um, access to, for those that have the wire going past their door, but they can't afford to bring it in. Right. Chairman Wheeler, my colleagues seem to think that uh, their constituents in rural communities are gonna someday be served by 5G. Uh, but we both know that if you don't have dense fiber networks, you can't have 5G. Right. So how does the legislation serve the dual purpose of bringing high-speed broadband to the whole country and enabling rural communities to get access to 5G. And do you see any other way for rural communities to get access to advanced wireless services without this legislation, such as through the deregulatory proposals that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, like to talk about all the time? Well, let me answer that in reverse, Mr. Doyle. Um, you cannot deregulate your way to full coverage. Yeah. Um, the, the, um, it, which is not to say, by the way, that there aren't some legitimate issues and tensions that exist between local and national governments, and those can be resolved through common efforts. The fiber issue is fascinating in its, you know, everybody thinks about 5G, it's all about the airwaves. One of the reasons that China got out front on 5G is their fiber infrastructure because in using the um, spectrum made available for 5G, the physics of that spectrum limit the propagation of the signal. Therefore, you have to have more antennas. And those antennas need to be connected by more fiber. <laughs> and and so, so 5G is a fiber issue as well as a spectrum issue. And if we don't have the fiber backbone, you can have all the spectrum in the world and you're not going to have uh, an effective service. Yeah, let me just last question. Uh, some people on the other side of the aisle said that the federal government doesn't need to invest in next gen 911 technologies uh, for the systems to be universally deployed. But why is that wrong? And, and what will we lose if we fail to upgrade these systems in a prompt, organized, and systematic fashion? Well, Mr. Doe, we're stuck, we're stuck with the buggy whip uh, era, the horse and buggy era of analog 911. There are things that you could do on your cell phone that the first responders who will have the chance to save your life or keep your house from burning down do not have. They can't get video. They can't get pictures. They can't get precise location. They can't get all kinds of data. But the other fact is, and when, when I was chairman, I would go out and tour next generation 911 operations. And I found that not only did it increase capabilities, but it lowered costs. Yeah. Which Thank you. Uh, that investment. Thank you. Uh, good to see you back, Tom. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. Now I'll move to Mr. La to recognize for five minutes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, it's great to see you again. And also, I uh, want to thank you again for coming to my district twice when you were with the FCC. 
Uh, you know, it was almost exactly a year ago tomorrow that President Trump signed the Bipartisan Broadband Data Act into law to update our nation's broadband availability maps. As you know, these maps aren't completed. The LIFT Act would create uh, several broadband grant loan programs totaling over $80 billion. The timeframes in this bill would require the FCC and states to put this money out the door, likely before the FCC is able to complete its maps. What are the risks of this $80 billion being spent before the broadband maps are completed? Well, it looks to be, the, your point is exactly on, on, on point, is the timeline will be the dollars going out before the maps are done. Now, even if the maps are done in four months, you're going to have to restart the maps and restart the data collection based on the new definitions that are put forward. I don't want to give anyone the impression that everything is, is copacetic and that everything is going great or we should remain with the status quo. We still need to solve the broadband issue for those that don't have access. And the maps that you speak of are so critical, they will be completely wiped out, as I see it, by the new bill. Well, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, follow up. Uh, while there are plenty of questions and concerns about what is in the bill, I'm also stunned as to what is not in the bill. Under Republican leadership, we enacted the bipartisan, bicameral Ray Bombs Act, which included permitting proposals through a bottom up regular order process. Republicans also recently introduced 28 bills as part of the boosting broadband connectivity agenda, none of which are also included in the LIFT Act. Would you discuss the importance of Congress enacting permanent regulatory and permitting reforms to close the digital divide and lower prices for consumers through competition? Absolutely. What I think I heard Tom Wheeler agreeing that there were some issues here that could be resolved and relying on just uh, co co cooperation and it's not going to get you there. In both the Spectrum Act of 2012 and Ray Bombs Act, Congress came together and said, we need to resolve these sticking points that we've identified that are, extent that are preventing the extension of networks, um, multiple layers, whether the environmental, whether the, the permitting process, whether the federal lands now exist. And those are being, you know, we're facing tons of lawsuits. Uh, every time the commission tried to do something, it's getting sued on this exact point. And those things need to be resolved in order to move forward and get deployment to the hardest corners of America. Well, thank you. To exclude them, in my opinion, to exclude them is missing a, a vital opportunity in this bill. Uh, and this should be part of, you know, whether it's all 28 or even more things that I would recommend should be included. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Moniz, it's good to see you before the uh, committee again. And uh, the bill would authorize $22.5 billion for state and local governments to support projects that encourage the use of EVs. In comparison, this bill would authorize $375 million to expand development of alternative fuel infrastructure and expanded use of alternative uh, fuel vehicles. With the billions of dollars of investments that this bill would make in EVs and electric vehicle infrastructure, do you think uh, automobile manufacturers would be more likely or less likely to invest in vehicles that use other sources of fuel, such as biodiesel, natural gas, ethanol, hydrogen, or propane? Well, thank you for the question, Mr. Latta, and it's a pleasure to be uh, back uh, with you and the committee. Um, uh, look, I, in my view, the reality is that we have seen the auto companies uh, make their declarations. Uh, the GM, uh, with their commitment to all electric by 2035, Ford, uh, not to be outdone, uh, stratospheric valuations for Tesla. Uh, so I think there is no doubt that electric vehicles are going to be a very central part of, of our path forward. Now, there still may be alternative fuels as well in there, uh, particularly with plug-in hybrids, uh, uh, for example. But the but the reality is, uh, I see the EV infrastructure being invested in early uh, as something that enables our companies, our manufacturers, to go where they want to go. Uh, they they have made it very very uh, very very clear. As well, what we are seeing is an enormous increase uh, in the battery man, uh, manufacturing uh, industry in the United States. We've just heard uh, multiple commitments made. Uh, uh, again, Ford and GM uh, driving uh, much much of the construction. So I think the uh, I I do support very strongly the EV uh, infrastructure uh, uh, charging. I do think there are many challenges that have to be met, particularly with regard to social equity issues, 
because clearly the uh, the architecture for urban environments for suburban environments and for rural environments are going to look very very different so we got to think it through but that's what will allow our companies our manufacturing companies uh, to follow their commitments uh, that they have made uh, uh, as far as EVs uh, critical to our future. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Chair, my time's expired, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Levitt. Uh, next, we go to Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start by just saying we have learned a heck of a lot about the need for a more robust public health infrastructure during this COVID, COVID time. Um, I wanted to particularly um, emphasize now and focus on um, community health centers, several of which I have, many of which I have in my district, and they are a real godsend. So uh, Dr. Frieden, and I'm so happy to, um, to, to see you again. I wanna thank you for all your past service and for being with us, uh, with us today. As you're aware, community health centers play a critical role in providing care to vulnerable populations who are um, predominant, uh, predominantly lower income, people of, uh, of color um, and black and brown and indigenous and immigrant, uh, immigrant communities across our country share a disproportionate burden of the Ill illnesses and, and, and death caused by COVID and other diseases in the uh, responses uh, in the response and, af and aftermath of the pandemic, we must prioritize um, uh, uh, addressing these these disparities that are so chronic in our in our society. So here's my question: We know that uh, that COVID led to more severe consequences in the communities that. Uh, that, that I, I described, they have high, higher rates of certain chronic illnesses. What does the um, correlation between minority communities and a higher burden of COVID um, tell us about what we have to do about our public health infrastructure? Dr. Frieden. Thank you so much. And it's nice to see you and your colleagues again, uh, Congresswoman. I think first we have to look at the cause. Three things. One, in the disadvantaged, underrepresented communities, you see more exposure, more underlying health problems, and less access to care and vaccination. So uh, Black and Latinx Americans are twice as likely to die from COVID and half as likely to get vaccinated. And that's not because of resistance or reluctance. That's because of a lack of access and appropriate outreach to the communities. So. What do we need to do differently? We need a much stronger public health and primary care system. We need sustained investments. And when it comes to primary health care, I'm a big fan of community health centers. My first job was working for a community health center before I went to medical school. Um, but uh, I have to say that they, um, they need to be fully supported, but they're only going to address 10 or 15% of the population need. And therefore, we really do need to fix the way we fund health care so that we have an ongoing support for primary care. Primary care has to be central to our healthcare system. That includes uh, community health centers, and as the bill has, uh, Indian health services uh, and others, but it also means looking at how we make sure that doctors, nurses, pharmacists, physician assistants, and others can play a critical role in quarterbacking and improving care. It's, it's quite striking. It's not just about the minority communities. The U.S. as a whole lives on average about four years less, and the time we're alive, we live with more disability than other countries in Europe and elsewhere. And that's so, that, because that, we that public health that, and we primary care. That's an unacceptable um, number that you just gave us. Um, I, I wanted to connect, though, what we're talking about to what people commonly think about infrastructure. A recent survey of health centers across the country found that capital project investment through 2025 would cost about $17.5 billion, billion. The top areas of focus for um, current planning is um, has to do with medicine, medication, um, um, mental health, and um, 
um, uh, et, et cetera. So how do we um, link this to infrastructure? What are the infrastructure issues that are gonna address the problems that we're facing? So um, one, briefly, one of them is uh, data. Data systems need to be updated and maintained over time. Another is uh, training of staff. So we need to upgrade the number of people. A third is actual facilities for primary health care, community health centers and others. Um, in addition, we need uh, to ensure that, that we are uh, strengthening not just the people and not just the informatics, but, but also the broader systems that collect information, surveillance or monitoring systems, so we can track diseases and track the effectiveness of primary care programs, because we're not getting the kind of health value for our health dollars that we need. So we need data systems, we need information systems that are broader than data systems, and we need the people and the places to do it right. Thank you so much. And I look forward to addressing some of these in this bill that we're discussing today. Thank you. Good to see you, Tom. Bye. Thank you. Uh, next, we go to uh, Mr. Guthrie. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the, the recognition. And uh, to, to Dr. Frieden, Frieden um, according to the American Journal of Managed Care, hospital acquisitions of physician practice has increased from 35,700 practice hospital and practices in 2012 to 80,000 in 2018 further according to March 2021 medical payment advisory commission report hospital access to capital remains strong due to years of relatively high payer profit margins the report states that access to capital and I quote is reflected in significant hospital construction and strong bond offerings at relatively low interest rates and so, so my question is given that hospitals and facilities have access to adequate access to capital, why should Congress authorize federal funding for capital improvements? I think what we see is in the hospital sector, you have the haves and the have nots. And in rural hospitals and places that are uh, not dealing with um, the kind of uh, patient population that gives lucrative uh, reimbursement, you have real needs. But the, the bigger problem I wanna come back to is primary health care. Quite frankly, all over the world, including in the US, we have an imbalance where the relative funding of hospitals versus primary care is not what will maximize health. And we need that sustained investment in primary health care to pe keep people out of hospitals and let hospitals mm -hmm. focus on uh, the, the conditions that absolutely need hospital care. But if we don't invest in primary health care, we are never going to have enough money for the hospitals that, that are aging population needs. And remember, our population isn't just aging. We also have a high rate of obesity that increases the need for hospitalizations. We continue to have a high rate of tobacco use, which increases the need for hospitalizations. We have unhealthy uh, nutrition and lack of physical activity so that people aren't active. All of those things result in more expensive care with not as good health care outcomes. Okay, thank you. And I, I will ask you a, a second question. In uh, se Section 40004 of the LIFT Act, it authorizes $4.5 billion to support the modernization and improvement of testing in clinical labs. Would you agree that instead of creating a brand new program, Congress should work with the CDC on expanding and improving the epidemi epidemiology and laboratory capacity for infectious diseases cooperative agreements? So I, I do think that ELC, as it's called, the EL, uh, yes. uh, <laughs> that's epidemiology and laboratory, yeah. that's yeah. one of the best grant, grant programs at CDC. It works very effectively. It's been used in a series of emergencies, and we need to build on that program over time. Um, I, I do think that laboratories tend to be the poor relation in public health. They tend to be neglected. And quite frankly, CDC didn't get it right with the laboratory work this time around. And, and that didn't happen before. And we still don't have a clear public accounting of what went wrong. Uh, so I think that is needed. Um, I, during my time at CDC, when a pandemic hit H1N1, we had a lab uh, test approved within days. It was 
million copy tests were distributed. But as Dr. Burgess indicated, it's not just about the public health laboratory system. You really have a three-legged stool. You have the public health laboratory system. That needs to be much stronger, including genomics. Then you have academic medical centers that make their own tests. That's largely an FDA regulation issue of allowing them to do that. And then commercial laboratories, which need to be given standards. Because quite frankly, during COVID, we spent as a country hundreds of millions of dollars for tests that came back so late that were virtually useless. And we need to sell, tell the commercial sector, you're great, you can move faster and, and at scale in a way that other sectors can't, but you have to meet these requirements for performance, for example, res results in 24 hours. So I think there are multiple areas, but remember that laboratories do tend to be the poor relation. They're neglected. Uh, it took us a long time to get even a little bit of money for things like genomic uh, surveillance at CDC and strengthening of laboratories. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the answers to those questions. I'm going to move uh, to Mr. O'Reilly. And during your time at the FCC, Open RAN is something that you worked on as well as uh, I worked on with uh, several of my colleagues last Congress. Can you tell us about the benefits that adopting to a software-centric visual virtualized network can bring to other telecommunication networks? Absolutely. Simply put, uh, Open RAN can provide two things. One, it can increase the security of the network putting plugging in a critical new piece of equipment uh, it's by software rather than requiring a, an end to end uh, solution through hardware and two it can reduce reduce the cost for wireless providers that are trying to deploy these networks as soon as possible and get to the technology certainly at the edges that they can so open ran has great promise i want to be careful though there are some concerns and i've been mindful of this in terms of technology neutrality, in terms of vendor mandates that we want to make sure we do, don't cause harm with doing so. But Open uh, Rand has quite the promise. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. We're going to go now to uh, Mr. Butterfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me say good morning and good afternoon to my colleagues. It's good to see all of you today. And thank you to you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. Thank you for this very, very important and enlightening hearing today. And last but not least, thank you to the witnesses. It's good to see all of you again. You know, Mr. Chairman, as you have heard me say over the 14 years that I've been on this committee, I represent a rural district in eastern North Carolina where some communities still today, 2021, lack access to high-speed broadband that has become so necessary for us to participate in the modern world, especially uh, since we've had the pandemic. Uh, qualified broadband providers are being discouraged. They're being discouraged from participating in FCC programs that could expand broadband access into these underserved and unserved communities. Uh, these communities are they, they're outdated, they're inconsistent, uh, eligible telecommunication carrier requirements that we have to deal with. The ETC requirements are out of date and they need our attention. In addition to expanding access, removing the ETC designation will spur competition, in my opinion, improve both efficiency and quality of service for consumers. So last Congress, I introduced the Expanding Opportunities for Broadband Deployment Act, a bill that would retire uh, this unnecessary restriction so that providers will no longer have to wait for state-by-state -state approval to participate in the FCC's lifeline and broadband deployment program. Similarly, the funds included in the bill before us today for broadband build out across the country do not require an ETC designation for their use. And so I will introduce Mr. Chairman, uh, reintroduce this bill very soon. And I intend to work with my colleagues on this committee on both sides of the aisle for passage. I'm pleased that the ETC requirement is not included in the Lift America Act because retiring the ETC designation requirement is critical. It is so it is so critical to reducing barriers to broadband deployment. And so in the little time that I have left, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna start with uh, Tom Wheeler. It's good to see you, Mr. Chairman, again. Uh, I remember the first time you met with a small group when I came onto this committee. Uh, at the end of the meeting, I approached you and told you that you were one of the few witnesses that we had that I understood 100% of what you said. <laughs> Uh, so often it's above my head and sometimes I can't get my hands around it, but you have such clarity. Uh, Chairman Wheeler, I understand that you tried to address the ETC issue yeah. in the Lifeline program uh, and Commissioner O'Reilly, I understand that you've written about this 
as a barrier. Could each of you, starting with Mr. Wheeler, talk a little bit about that? Mr. Butterfield, thank you. It's great to see you. And I, I'm, I'm reminded of that old Robert Browning to have great poets, there must be great audiences. Yes. Um, but, um, but I think that this is a um, situation where Commissioner O'Reilly and I can be in violent agreement that ETC doesn't make any sense anymore. And it is, it is a legacy of the fact that we're dealing with a telephone program that wasn't designed for broadband. Um, you're right. Um, I tried to do something about it uh, when I was chairman. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a uh, majority of the votes to do it, but it makes no sense to, uh, to continue ETC as one of the tests. So, Mike, take it away. Yes, Mr. Riley, take it away, please. Thank you, yeah. Congressman, and I really appreciate your, your leadership on this issue. I completely supported your bill last go around and will do so in this one. Tom's right. I wasn't able to support uh, his effort, and it wasn't because I disagreed on policy with some legal matters, and that's why Congress is so actively, and your so your engagement is so critical in this point. The ETC designation no longer makes any sense if it ever did, and it's preventing providers from participating in FCC programs and building out and extending their networks in nearby areas because it crosses the street lines in some instances, and that burden isn't worth the cost that they would have to go through. So they they stop particip they don't participate, and it raises the cost. Um, so I think it's absolutely something that should be corrected uh, going forward. And we have example of the EBB program that, that I'm in favor of and Tom has spoken about um, doesn't include this. And you mentioned the LIFT Act, which I have a lot of problems with, um, but here it's not included as well. And you'll run into some problems with state regulators on this issue, but it absolutely has to be done is to get rid of the ETC designation. Thank you for your clarity. You are so enlightening. And for those of you, my colleagues, who don't fully understand this issue, I know you can't get your hands around everything that we talk about. But if this is something that you have an interest in, we will be delighted to talk with you about it because it is a big deal and it makes sense. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. Next, we go to Mr. McKinley. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I direct my comments to uh, Dr. Renee. Uh, I'm looking for you again on this someplace on here. There we go. Uh, listen, I've missed having you testify before us for the last few <laughs> years. I've always enjoyed your, your insight into it. Uh, and listen, I got to say, uh, Doc, I, I, I agree with you that not having, not including carbon capture in this bill does not make sense. It really doesn't. Uh, but since this bill, if I could direct my question to you, since this bill begins the transition uh, of the federal fleet, uh, to electric vehicles by uh, 2025, beginning in 2025, and hybrid hybrid fuels uh, could be banned by 2050 uh, if by, if President Biden has his way. So let, let's talk a little bit about the federal fleet. Uh, it, it's about 650,000 vehicles, and according to the Journal of, of Power Sources and testimony we had a few weeks ago uh, from Mark Mills of the Manhattan Institute, to acquire the critical minerals of lithium. Uh, cobalt, nickel, graphite, copper, we will need, manufacturers will need to excavate 250 tons of earth, 250 tons of earth to get enough ma materials just for one battery. So uh, just imagine what that would be over 650,000 vehicles. I did some math on that. And, and, and so if we don't have if we don't have available biofuels or, or hydrogen as an alternative, and we have to go to electric vehicles, we're talking about uh, enough uh, dump load, <laughs> dump truck filled with dirt across the, just to, for the the uh, federal fleet to go around the world, a, a convoy around the world twice, just to get the materials we need to build the batteries for our federal fleet. Uh, so I, I, I'm just wondering about, since the other nations are going to say, uh, uh, we're not doing this in our backyard, we're getting it out of Chile and, and uh, Colombia and other nations all around the world. How long are they going to tolerate us taking all their raw materials and tearing up their hillsides? How long do you, th do you think they'll continue to say that's okay? Well, uh, Mr. McKinley, and it is, it's good to see you again, indeed. Uh, the, uh, the, the, it's a very important issue, this question of critical minerals and, and metals uh, and the whole supply chain. Uh, there is no doubt that we need to uh, reevaluate this. 
uh, I mentioned in my in my remarks uh, that uh, we have to look at uh, environmentally uh, improved mining uh, in the United States because the uh, uh, critical uh, mineral minerals uh, will probably go up by a factor of 10 to 100 in many cases, except that innovation will also come in. So on lithium, for let example, me, me we are seeing. I could, doctor, and I'd like to get back. I, oh. If you and I can have more of a conversation, I, I've got to slip in two more quick questions, one to you and one to O'Reilly. So let's go to the grid for a minute. Uh, the, the Boston Consulting Group said that if 15% of the vehicles are electric vehicles by 2030, that we expect, we'll have to have a 25% increase in our electric generating capacity. So if we once if, if this mission is ultimately to get to 100% of electric vehicles, that means we're going to have to have 165% more power generating America than we currently have today. I, I just I'm wondering, are we going to ever going to be ready for something like that? Uh, so uh, in difference with the time on it. So if I could switch over to O'Reilly uh, on on this. Could, could I just know, Mr. McKinley? I don't. I don't understand those numbers. I don't. I don't agree with them. But okay, I, I uh, we, we can that discuss that later. It's, yeah. From from one engineer to a scientist, you might be able to keep up. You know, we'll see. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go to O'Reilly for a minute, please. Uh, so I, I want to switch the jobs impact. Uh, I want to stay in the refineries because if if what this purpose of, of this ultimate legislation uh, that the that the administration is is pushing by 2050 to ban all fossil fuel uh, uh, emissions and fossil fuels, uh, what will happen to the jobs in the refinery driven economies of Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma and elsewhere? What what will happen to those? What will happen to those jobs if we can't use gasoline or diesel fuel? O'Reilly? OK, um, well, I uh, appreciate your question. I could speculate and, and I would agree with your yeah, concern. I know it's not your field. You're an FCC. It's not my guy. field. I, just I, like, what I, happens? Yes. If we do this, what happens? Sir? They're going to evaporate. They're, 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 gonna, they're actually going to evaporate. The uh, jobs are not going to exist in critical states that are so important. Uh, and that's why, that's why I want people to just slow down sometime and think about the consequences of this. I know we're ultimately going to get to there. But to do this so quickly as we're doing right now, I don't know that we've thought about the consequences with it. So thank you very much. And, and uh, Frank, I, I yield back to my chairman, balance of whatever time I've got left, Frank. Thank you. So next we have um, Ms. Matsui. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I wanna thank all the witnesses who are here today, many of whom I worked with in the past. It's great to see you. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has only reinforced the value of and growing demand for telehealth. This committee has made funding available to support telehealth through the FCC's telehealth program, but because of overwhelming demand, just 539 of the more than 5,000 applications have been funded. Clearly, the want and need for us to properly equip our health systems is there, and providers broadly recognize that 21st century healthcare is so much more than just the four walls of a clinic or hospital. Dr. Frieden and Chairman Wheeler, um, do you both agree that we should prioritize digital infrastructure alongside physical infrastructure within our healthcare system? And I like comments from both, even though a lot more questions to ask. Well, if you have more questions, I'll keep my answer simple. Yes, we need a much stronger, more robust digital infrastructure and um, we definitely see gaps in rural areas, definitely see gaps in some central city areas. Right, thank you. And I, I, will, I will be equally short. The answer is yes. And one of the good things that's in the LIFT Act is prioritizing into central locations in a community to make mm -hmm. sure that they get connectivity, such as hospitals. Sure. And that, that also, by the way, opens up the ability to interconnect and get beyond there to the rest of the community. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, climate change is reshaping our country's needs. My district faces both severe droughts and devastating flooding, requiring uh, fresh ideas. I am sure many of my colleagues representing these areas are livid. Oh, hold on. Uh, okay. Hmm? Okay. Do I have my time here? <laughs> um, in Sacramento, I've been working with the city and regional water authority on the Sacramento water bank, which will increase the region's storage 
and recovery capacities by more than 50%. Similarly, the flood agency is proactively looking at upstream reservoir modifications to increase capacity for flood protection during severe weather events or providing water for groundwater storage. Secretary Muniz, beyond hydropower, how do you believe we can effectively use our waterways, particularly in dry western states, to both minimize flood risk while maximizing water use for our communities? Well, thank you, Ms. Matsui, and again, good to see you and uh, back here at the committee. Uh, the uh, uh, first of all, I might just uh, add that uh, uh, broadly, uh, the uh, need to address our whole dam system uh, in the United States is absolutely critical, and there have been some very encouraging uh, activities jointly uh, between uh, those uh, uh, worried about emissions for climate, those worried about conservation, about preserving ecosystems. So, uh, so I think that um, this committee moving forward on on uh, on those issues of of water infrastructure would be would be very would be very important. Uh, and in fact, of course, as you know, uh, we have. Um, uh, extremes uh, that will be getting worse uh, from drought to flood, uh, and a lot of a lot of them providing uh, public safety issues. Uh, we saw the disasters, for example, in Michigan, uh, in terms of some some dam failures uh, and 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 uh, and and tragic consequences. So, um, uh, in other parts of the country, I I might add uh, the inland waterway infrastructure. Uh, is also badly in need of uh, of of being addressed for energy and other commodities. So I would just uh, reinforce what what you've indicated that uh, we need a comprehensive uh, look, and it must be regional because the regional needs are going to be very different in let's say the Sacramento uh, water basin uh, and some and and other parts of the country. No, so, thank you, uh, Dr. Moniz. I big deal. Yeah. I joined a bipartisan group of lawmakers to meet with the president to discuss important issues of supply chain security, including the strategically important semiconductor industry. This meeting built on the progress we had in Congress by including the CHIPS Act and the NDA to support America's semiconductor manufacturing and R&D. Chairman Wheeler, can you discuss the role of a reliable semiconductor supply chain to place for American innovation. And we've got 15 seconds to say that. Without it, it does not compute, right? The 21st century and modern telecommunications and the benefits of what that delivers has been built on Moore's law. The constant mm -hmm. improvement of semiconductors. If we have a problem with semiconductors, we have a problem writ large. Right, thank you very much, and I want to thank all the witnesses. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, may I just add a note that the Solar Winds cyber event also uh, pointed out the importance of supply chain security uh, mm -hmm. for our infrastructure. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, so next we have uh, Mr. Griffith, Morgan Griffith. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. O'Reilly, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and I appreciate all that you've done to, to narrow the digital divide and advocate for the truly unserved out there in our rural communities. Although here in some of the, the discussion today, I am reminded that sometimes people in my district feel like they're Charlie Brown and the federal government is Lucy. We keep promising and we keep promising and we keep promising that we're going to do something on broadband and we keep pulling the football away. And, and I think this bill does that too, although I think it's well-intentioned. And the problem is, as you have pointed out, that trying to get to 100, 100, 100, uh, before we get big chunks of my district to 25, three is, um, it, it's going to open up uh, the areas where some, a lot of companies are going to put the money into servicing areas that already have some broadband. We don't have any in many parts of my district. In fact, as it would be timely, the Roanoke Times ran an article this weekend uh, by Amy Friedenberger on March 20th. That would be Saturday. Can Starlink solve Virginia's broadband challenges? And it talks about a, a Mr. Markham, who's called Verizon every couple of years about getting internet cable to his household in Ahala in Wise County, Virginia. The answer is always the same. They'll get it there for $23,000. That's one household. That's not a cul-de-sac. That's not a community. That's one household. And obviously it's too expensive for Mr. Markham's family 
to do that. Uh, the, the governor's team, uh, Governor Ralph Northam's chief broadband advisor, uh, Evan Feynman, says that, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we can be doing. Uh, we can, they're a little uneasy about doing the satellites, but, but there are 300,000 locations in Virginia, mostly in Southwest, that would be mostly my district, and Southside, part of which I represent, and then the Tidewater region that don't have broadband access. And the Commonwealth has been pouring dollars, more and more dollars all along. Another, another constituent, Mr. Short, lives about 600 feet away from relatives who have broadband through Comcast. Now, I'm not sure it's 100, 100, but he's got something. But for him to get it to his house 600 feet away, it's just too expensive. I fear that we're gonna eliminate services like Starlink or their competitors down the road as they come on board from being able to provide in some of these rural areas. And right now it looks like they might be able, when they get all their uh, satellites up, it might be able to uh, service a big chunk of the territory, but it doesn't look like they're gonna be able to, um, it doesn't look like they're gonna be able to do it necessarily at a cost effective means, but I'm not sure they get to the 100, 100. Do you know about that? And uh, do you think that, as you said earlier, do you believe that this is part of why it's gonna intensify the or widen the divide between those who have broadband and those who don't. You're absolutely right on in the point that parts of Virginia do not have broadband. I visited them myself. I've represented different members uh, over my my time praying praying in, in my career. Um, the cost of construction to areas such as that you represent are higher than they are in other places. And so the dollars, if the Lift Act were to be enacted, would shift to other places. And so we would not deal with the communities that, that you represent. We they would be the dollars would go elsewhere. It doesn't mean that eventually they couldn't get to your point. But every time we kind of get to that point to deal with the absolute people who have nothing today, we move. The the goalposts. We did it when we were at 4-1. We did it when we were at 10-1. We did it when we were at 25-3. Um, and every time we get close, we get down to that population that absolutely has nothing. And I've sat in those kitchens and talked to the people. Uh, you represent a lot of those folks. That is absolutely a big, big problem. And that's why my point was get everybody to 25-3 before you figure out how to shift the, the, the agenda. But your point in terms of satellite, I'm a big fan of satellite. It, it's got a critique um, a lot of people are dis disagree with the satellite, and I like Starlink and what they're able to do. Um, in terms of 100 and 100, I can't promise you any speeds. I don't think they would promise you any speeds. But I know when I did a demo, um, we got 150 down. We didn't get 150 going up. Um, that's just, you know, the upload speed is what I've been criticizing from the Lift Act. I don't think it matches up with reality. You don't need synchronous uh, All right, quickly, speeds. quickly, because my time's running out. For folks back home who might think 25.3 is nothing, what can you do with 25.3? You can do everything that, that is being done today under pandemic and most everywhere. I, I was criticized for my speeds uh, in the Senate hearing, and I would tell you, I came back and, and tested my speeds. I'm at 30. Uh, I'm 30 in my household, and I can you know, operate my business. My, my wife's operating her work. There's a lot of things that can be done with 25.3. So we can watch Netflix, and we can do homework, and we can do telemedicine at 25.3. Absolutely. I appreciate it very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, next uh, is Mr. Sarbanes is recognized for five minutes. Thanks very much. Um, I appreciate the uh, hearing and um, I'm a very proud sponsor of the Lift America Act. This is a terrific bill, uh, represents a lot of collaboration by many members and obviously experts who've helped to uh, provide perspective on it. You know, the average American, I think when you say infrastructure to them, they tend to think of highways and bridges and tunnels. We know it's much more than that. Uh, we've talked about public health infrastructure. We've talked about uh, broadband. We know we have to lift up the water infrastructure across the country, the electric grid, uh, et cetera. So infrastructure means many, many different things. The Lift America Act is uh, trying to address those. Secretary Moniz, I wanted to talk to you today um, a little bit about the electric grid. It's an, an area of I've had a uh, keen interest in when it comes to this discussion about upgrading our uh, infrastructure. We know there's challenges, there's growing demand, there's the need for reliability, of course. Uh, we saw what happened in Texas recently, uh, which was a commentary on lack of reliability under some very difficult uh, conditions. Um, all of that shows that we've got to adapt our grid to 21st century 
uh, requirements. Could you talk a little bit about how modernizing, modernizing the grid is a smart investment, uh, both from the standpoint of helping to address uh, carbon emissions as well as just promoting reliability and affordability? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, the, uh, uh, first of all, I think uh, we all recognize, and it's really always important to, to remember how the electricity infrastructure is like the Uber infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> we saw that with Texas, that when electricity went down, the gas supply uh, uh, was, was, was suffering. There were some poor policy choices, clearly, uh, but the interplay of, of infrastructures means electricity must be reliable and resilient, especially as its role in society grows uh, with the electrification of other uh, of other sectors. Uh, as I've said before, the integration with IT, uh, being able to make uh, uh, near real-time measurements in the grid will both stabilize it and provide uh, on the distribution side new services that entrepreneurs can can uh, can uh, take advantage of. So uh, it will help with efficiency. It will help with demand management, which is a big part of reliability and resilience. Uh, so it will help with emissions uh, and it will help with the economy. Uh, it also will be a big job driver. The electricity sector uh, is is already uh, the the home to about almost a million workers. Thanks very much. Um, and I'm I'm thrilled that we have included in the Lift America Act, the 21st Century Power Grid Act, which I was um, privileged to work on over the last couple of Congresses. That would empower the Department of Energy to support projects that improve grid performance, security, resiliency, and so forth. Um, we've got to make that kind of investment if we're going to meet these 21st century challenges. Let me talk briefly about green buildings in the time I have left. And again, um, Secretary Moniz, you uh, in the last appearance before this committee, I believe, talked about the investing in federal buildings to reduce emissions, create jobs at a time when the pandemic had severely impacted our economy. Of course, that continues to happen. Uh, since then, I've joined with uh, my colleague on the committee, Congressman Welch. We've introduced the federal buildings clean job Act, which would invest funds and leverage private funds to make federal buildings more energy efficient, resilient, reduce green gases, and as you were indicating in the other context, create a lot of very good uh, jobs in green construction and so forth. Uh, Secretary Moniz, with the substantial building portfolio the federal government has, how important is it, do you think, that the federal government get into the business? leading here uh, in terms of building efficiency and resiliency projects uh, in its own buildings? And is the Department of Energy in a position to assist in this effort through programs like the Federal Energy Management Program? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think it's a very, very important initiative. I will note that uh, when I was Secretary, we pushed uh, very hard on energy efficiency standards saved consumers over a half a trillion dollars out to 2030. There's no reason why the federal government shouldn't enjoy those same uh, savings on, on its energy bills. Uh, and so I think uh, advancing that is absolutely critical. And I would just add, if I may, I strongly support the, the LIFT Act's focus on residential. Uh, I strongly focus your, I strongly support your focus on, on federal buildings. And I would urge going further uh, to have energy efficiency programs that support uh, state, county, and uh, and local public buildings as well. Uh, an enormous opportunity, uh, and, uh, and often uh, public budgets, especially in rural America, otherwise don't support those money-saving upgrades, both emissions and money-saving upgrades. Thank you. That's a ter terrific suggestion. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we go to Mr. Bilirakis. Right. Yes. Two, two Greeks back to back. It's Greek Independence Day on uh, March 25th, Mr. Speaker. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. Uh, I, I, in, in regards to broadband, uh, this committee, uh, the FTC, and the private industry uh, spent years and tens of millions of dollars, as you know, uh, 
on broadband mass so that we could get funds to the truly unserved and stop wasteful spending by needlessly overbuilding uh, our, our areas. Uh, the LIFT Act ignores all of that work, in my opinion. Rather, it allocates upwards of $100 billion to developments that unnecessary, uh, oh, all right, to deployments that unnecessarily move the goalposts and target it to areas that are already served. Uh, and I know that, uh, that my good friend from Virginia uh, mentioned this, and I know there are a lot of people uh, that face this issue, uh, the same issue. I'm sure many of our colleagues, as I said, in these areas are, are livid. They will never see broadband if there are more populated areas eligible for funding. And this legislation will only widen that digital uh, divide. And I recommend that we, and I strongly suggest that we address this issue, Mr. Chairman. Meanwhile, my constituents will continue to pay for the failed results. A better impact on underserved areas is removing regulations that prevent effective market participation. Consistent requirements will help small businesses and startups compete and grow in these areas. And then we, we can leave the funding uh, again. Uh, we don't want our constituents uh, paying uh, and we need, we need to leave the funding to the truly unserved areas. And I really feel like everyone agrees with that. Everyone could get the help they need, all of our constituents. So my question is to Mr. O'Reilly, related to regulatory burdens and past experiences, one of the lessons learned from the FCC's RDOF auction is that broad participation by providers means more consumers will be served with far less funding. What can be learned from that experience, experience as we prepare for the second round of RDOF? Mr. O'Reilly. Yeah, I appreciate your question. I think you set it up sure. quite nicely. You're absolutely right that the RDOF had a wide participation um, and we had a number of different technologies that were able to be part of it. And if you look at what you know is contemplated in this bill, I think I've, and, and other people have said, it's just about fiber and every other technology pretty much gets ignored by moving the goalpost as you indicated. And so I think that's incredibly problematic. As we get to RDOF phase two, that really comes down to having the maps done and, and hopefully the maps as I understand, they're going to be done relatively quickly. But if you move the goalposts on the first part, then the maps unravel and you got to restart the data collection or you've got to try and figure out how to how to how to recontain that um, and, and, and repopulate it for different purposes. And you restart that time frame. So I, I disagree with, with, with doing that because then you just you, you don't get to art of phase two. You don't get to those those areas. And these are the areas not the hardest to reach, not, not in terms of we know there's absolutely no one in a block. These are the places where the partially served blocks. There's a house or a location or many locations, but part of the, the block is not being served. And how do we deal with it? And that's having accurate maps and it's not by moving the goalposts. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I wanna yield the rest of my time to Mr. Graff, if he would. Thank Morgan, you. would you accept that? Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope that in the end, this is a bipartisan bill. Because, uh, as you know, we, we're uh, famous for bipartisanship in this committee. And to, for it to become law, uh, of course, we need the other chamber as well. So thank you very much for the input. And I'll yield the rest of my time to Mr. Brown. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, um, Gus. Uh, Mr. Moniz, you and I have discussed in the past the importance of the U.S. maintaining its leadership in clean fossil fuel technologies because coal will be around globally for decades. As you note in your testimony, carbon capture utilization and sequestration will play an important role in the future. How important will permitting reforms be in getting CCUS projects off the ground? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, there's no question that I, I remain convinced and many others like the International Energy Agency uh, that carbon capture and sequestration uh, will need to be uh, a central technology uh, complementing renewables and and uh, and nuclear and and others. Uh, the permitting issue, uh, you've put your finger on one of the major issues. Uh, a CCS project can be very complex uh, uh, in terms of its permitting requirements uh, at federal, state, and often local levels as well. So what we need is um, uh, at the federal and at the state levels ways of streamlining, not shortcutting, but streamlining uh, the, the permission uh, process. 
Uh, we looked very carefully in California as one example, uh, and we found that there were uh, multiple permitting requirements uh, that were not go being pulled together coherently, uh, and that was a major obstacle to getting projects done. So very, very important uh, issue. I yield back to Mr. Bill Rockus. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McNerney is next. Well, I think the chairman, I think the witnesses, it's great to hear you all and see you all again. Um, Mr. Wheeler, my Republican colleagues tend to focus on deregulating the infrastructure siting process and taking away a local authority, believing that this is the civil bullet that will bring broadband uh, to everybody in the country. Please, uh, with a yes or no, Mr. Wheeler, uh, will this approach get us to a universal high-speed broadband access and adoption to every American in this country? The way you uh, outlined it, the answer is no. Okay. There are, the problem is, Mr. American, one thing is that each side comes in, the industry says, this is my, my wish list, I want all of this. Some folks come in and say, not in my backyard, I want all of this. We need to be working to how do we get to common ground. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Wheeler. My district includes the city of Stockton. It's kind of close to Silicon Valley, but it's very different. It's a low income area. A few years ago, the city wanted to build an open access fiber based broadband network, but the start of the city was relying on went under and the project wasn't able to move forward. Now, I recently introduced the Broadband Infrastructure Financing and Innovation Act, BIFIA, now included in LIFT. That would provide $5 billion in federal funding for low interest financing of eligible broadband infrastructure deployment projects. Can you explain, Mr. Wheeler, as briefly as possible, why the BIFIA program would help for open access projects like the one the city of Stockton was hoping to do? Well, BIFIA opens up for multiple uses, but for instance, one of the uses that it could be put to um, is funding the middle mile to connect to the Stockton project, funding the Stockton project. But let me, uh, this is apropos of, of that. I need to correct something that Commissioner O'Reilly has now said twice, which is incorrect, which is how the maps have to be redone. The, what we're talking about when we're talking about maps, quote unquote, are not maps. This is not an atlas that you take off the shelf and turn to a certain page. This is a database. This has to be a quasi real-time ongoing database that matches the lines of the companies and 160 million uh, residences and businesses and keeps evolving. It is not a frozen document. That capability is what needs to be available and I believe will be available at the time that the Congress makes the funding available. And that's important for BIFA. Thank you. Um, well, in your uh, testimony, you stated that the other great failure of our national policy is how low-income Americans may have broadband passing through their uh, front door, in front of their front door, but don't bring it inside. Uh, this is the case for too many of my constituents. They either can't afford it or they don't have the digital literacy skills. Now, I introduced the Digital uh, Equity Act with Representative Clark, uh, also included in Lyft. Uh, would be used to fund a wide range of digital equity projects. In a few sentences, please, why is it critical uh, that we address gaps in broadband adoption and broadband literacy? So Pew did a great study on why people who could don't subscribe. First, about half of them was about cost. But there is also understanding, fear, lack of equipment, um, and intimidation. One of the great things that the LIFT Act does is to and your bill does, is to move to the states the opportunity to work with the people that they are closest to, to help overcome some of those obstacles. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Menise, it's great to see you again. Um, and uh, I, I'm glad that you're continuing in the field. Uh, you, uh, in your testimony, you highlighted cybersecurity as it relates to energy infrastructure. This is something I care a lot about. Uh, how concerned should we be about the growing cyber threats to our nation's grid infrastructure? Oh, I, I definitely think we should be concerned, Mr. Uh, McNerney. And again, by the way, good to see you as well. Uh, the um, uh, again, the uh, for example, the Solar Winds uh, event, as I've already said, uh, uh, really should uh, catch our attention. Uh, it was undetected for so long. 
uh, it was found only because it wandered into one of the uh, cybersecurity companies. Uh, and um, uh, it has certainly penetrated the cloud. And I'm not sure we even know today uh, exactly what, uh, what all of those issues are. So uh, I think the Department of Energy um, uh, is doing a good job, actually, with its uh, ESCC process. Um, uh, but um, uh, the issue is in the utility space, there are clearly very variable capabilities. Uh, so I think that the, uh, the department uh, and the Department of Homeland Security uh, could really uh, increase their assistance especially to some of the um, uh, smaller smaller utilities that don't have quite the quite the capabilities of the large IOUs. Right. Thank but you. Big concern for our infrastructure. And and I might add not only for the electric grid but also especially for the interactions and interdependencies right. for example with the gas grid. Sure certainly certainly. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Representative Johnson, Bill Johnson is next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. O'Reilly, it's really good to see you again. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, you know, Chairman Wheeler in his opener said in reference to the Lifeline program that a law designed for telephones doesn't work for broadband. Uh, this demonstrates his extreme ambivalence on these important issues because he has consistently advocated for regulating broadband under those old laws to regulate them as a utility. So, do you agree that laws designed for telephones doesn't work for broadband? I would Chairman agree. Uh, yes, I, I would agree uh, that we shouldn't use old statutes that aren't applicable for these purposes. Uh, I have supported Lifeline in the past. I think we should migrate away from that. Something like an EVB makes a lot more sense or something that Tom's talking about on affordability. But your point is very well taken. Uh, he wants the positives and not the negatives. I do want to address the one point he made on terms of maps, and I apologize for using just a couple seconds of your time. The maps are static, and they reflect what, the, what it looks like at the given moment. Uh, and the data is not coming in on a constant basis. And so new houses that are, or new locations that are deployed are not constantly populating into the commission database. It's not something that's living and breathing. Um, it's something you could make to do that, but that would be incredibly burdensome on the providers to do so. And so when I'm suggesting the maps need to be done, it's the data that may have to be recollected or at minimum, the data that's there will have to be reanalyzed and set to these new standards. And I apologize for using your time. That's okay. Hey, I've heard that if new programs open up to eligibility to areas that lack service at 100 megabits per second upload and download, more than half the country would be considered unserved, which means that funding is now eligible for half the country. That sounds like the exact opposite of what needs to happen to target funding to truly unserved areas. If broadband funding is available in, area, in areas that don't have 100 megabits per second symmetrical service, doesn't that mean that the funding is, is most likely to be used for upgrading places that already have broadband while rural consumers continue to wait at the back of the line to get service? Absolutely, the dollars will flow to the, those areas that are easier uh, and cheaper to upgrade um, and to provide a greater re return on investment. And I've been to your district and I've seen how hard the geography is. I've seen the mountainous regions and how you know, many of your consumers and many of your constituents would be happy uh, to have broadband at, at 25.3 who have nothing today. And I remember being at the school that had no wireless connection uh, in your district. And so uh, when people say we want to get to 100, 100, I'm very mindful of the areas that I visited in such as your district and how they and many consumers have nothing. Well, and, and, and you're kind of alluding to it. Line. Yeah, you're, line. you're kind of alluding to it. So what does that mean for digital equity? It seems like that would be going in the wrong direction. Well, I would think so. I would think that it would, the hardest to reach parts of, of rural America will, will take longer to, to implement and, 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 and we'll have to see if the dollars stretch as far as they want to, depending on what's the funding level. Um, but the priority will be the other areas that are easy to serve and the consumers in, in terms of equity, um, I would suggest the consumers that have, have been left off before will continue to be left off. Okay. Um, continuing with you, Mr. O'Reilly, the COVID-19 pandemic shined a really bright light on the devastating impact of social isolation, particularly uh, with our senior population. Uh, everything from remote working, distance learning, uh, the need for telehealth, 
Uh, nowhere was that seen more clearly than in our nation's senior care settings. So do you agree that investments should also be made in broadband connectivity for senior care facilities? Not only would this investment save the healthcare system uh, critical dollars in the future, but it could ultimately save lives should safe isolation be required in the future. What do you think? Well, you make a lot of sense. I haven't analyzed the cost of doing so, and, and that's something that you have in your capable hands. I don't have in, uh, in mind in terms of policymaker, but it makes a lot of sense. My mom's in a, a center today, and broadband was very critical uh, to try and keep her connected as she has some serious health issues. Well, I'm sorry to hear that about your mom, but I, I, I absolutely believe we got to be very, very careful on all of these issues that we're talking about, the unintended consequences, going 100-100 symmetrical, and what that will do to, uh, to locking out rural America, and uh, especially with seniors that live in rural America that, uh, that really uh, enjoyed the expansion of telehealth. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, my colleagues like Doris Matsui uh, that has worked with me so strongly on, uh, on telehealth issues. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, member is uh, Peter Welch. Peter, recognize. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thank you very much. I have some uh, quick questions for an incredible panel. I really appreciate every one of you. Uh, Dr. Frieden, I want to go back to you. I totally am in support of your view that we have to have regular and steady funding for public health um, and uh, for primary care. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I am truly shocked at the failure uh, of our Congress, uh, Republican or Democrat, to start addressing the extraordinarily high cost of health care in our country. It's brutal. It means that uh, taxpayers are hammered, employers are hammered, and so are individuals. Workers lose wages. It, it, is it the right way to go that we just put more money into a place where I do agree we need it, primary in public health? without addressing uh, the out of, what I regard as a totally out of control and unsustainable cost uh, in the healthcare system. Well, if, if I uh, may, Congressman, uh, I'll enter into the record two articles I wrote just two weeks ago published about this very topic. I think we can control healthcare costs. It is shocking. We pay more for less uh, life expectancy, for more disability than any other country in the world. And there are ways to fix that. Uh, those include a payment system that rewards health, not volume of care. Right. I agree with that. And I'll, I'll distribute those articles to the committee with the chair's permission, but thank you. Second, uh, Secretary Menise, uh, very good to see you. I just want to report that, that uh, those tight, small, tiny homes that you visited, they're doing great here in Vermont, super energy efficient. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. McKinley and I have hope for homes. You've been helpful in the past, but it would provide uh, incentives to homeowners, 2,000 if they did retrofitting that reduced uh, by 20% what the energy consumption was, 40% uh, if uh, 4,000 if it was 40%. Do you continue to advocate as one of your comprehensive approaches? strong commitment to energy efficiency that creates local jobs uh, and saves on carbon emissions and saves people money? Absolutely. Uh, it's it's the best investment we can make. Uh, and typically, we, we do see typically north of 20% uh, uh, energy saving. So it's, a, it's, it's great. As I said earlier, I would even like to expand it further to other things like, like local and uh, public buildings and the like uh, for energy efficiency gains. But, but starting, starting with residential uh, certainly is, Thank is, you. is, is yeah. straight on. And we've, we've had some good bipartisan support on that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, you know, I, I listened to Mr. O'Reilly and actually I take quite seriously uh, his cautionary uh, observations. Uh, because when you have a big program and you can get money out, there's an excitement to uh, just, quote, get something done. Uh, but my understanding of what we're doing here is essentially making a public decision in Lift America Act uh, that uh, was made in the 30s with electricity. We have to have high-speed broadband. Um, first of all, is there a reason that we would not want to have symmetrical uh, speeds in rural areas? 
just as when in the 30s, we didn't have a different kind of second rate electricity that couldn't keep up with, with the progress that was being made. Can you address that? Thank you, Mr. Welch. Um, it's, I, I'm at a loss as to why there ought to be second class service um, for anyone, particularly when 80% of America can get a gigabit. But there's a, there's a misassumption that has percolated through this discussion about this back of the line business. Um, the, the 2017 study that we did that said, how much would it cost to build fiber to every home, every home, not just those that are picked and chosen, every home was $80 billion. And, and if I am the CEO of a small telephone company in Vermont, and I've got an unserved area next to me that I'd like to get revenue out of. And the federal government says to me, we'll pay you a subsidy to build that out to urban quality standards. And I say no to that, I ought to be fired. And my understanding of what Lyft does is like our 2017 study that says, this is what it takes to connect everybody to urban quality broadband. Uh, thank you very much. I yield back my time is up, but I thank all the panelists. They were terrific. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Next is uh, Congressman Long, Billy Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you all for being here today. And uh, before I start my line of question, I'd like to paraphrase something that Ronald Reagan once said. He said that uh, the trouble with our liberal friends is not that they are uninformed, it's just that they know so much that isn't true. And I think something that was said earlier by Mr. Doyle kind of falls into that category. The uh, Mr. Doyle said that he had a kind of a accusation about next gen 9-11 that Republicans, you know, what he said, you know, that us not being supportive and whatever, but Republicans were very supportive of moving forward on next gen 911, and we were working diligent with our Democrat friends. We really, really were, and we're working in earnest until they walked away literally the night before they dropped the lift back. So uh, I think that's more accurate of what actually happened here. I have a question here for Commissioner O'Reilly. This legislation, the Lift Act, tilts the preference for federal money towards projects that will delay open access broadband service networks. If an area already is so uneconomic to serve that it requires government subsidies to sustain even one provider, what are the impacts of favoring projects in this way? And is that an efficient way to use federal dollars? Well, it's gonna make the cost of, of, of those networks more expensive. Um, it may introduce, uh, you, know, a, you know, potential competitors to an area that can't, can't support them. Um, and that becomes you know, uneconomical depending on the provider. But I do need to respond to Tom's previous point. I didn't suggest that no, that they wouldn't get uh, the, the the rural areas today wouldn't be addressed. I said that they would be addressed later because the earlier, the easier areas um, would be uh, would be tackled first. And and it's one thing to talk about a small company in Vermont. It's another to talk about larger companies that serve greater areas and where they're going to upgrade first and where the dollars are going to flow. And that is my point uh, that he seems to miss. No, the dollars flow to the unserved areas, Mike. You set the standard. That's, that's okay. my turn. And then, my they, and then they flow. I uh, and I'm I'm concerned that some of the funding conditions on the uh, preferences in this bill, such as state regulation, open access requirements, will meet uh, will mean that fewer qualified broadband providers will apply for the funding. And still, with Mr. O'Reilly, isn't that the opposite of what we need to serve rural America, much of which I represent here in the Seventh District of Missouri? I would absolutely agree. And what changes do you suggest to make to this bill to be more effective to close that digital divide that we hear so much about? 
why I would focus on a laser perspective on those that don't have service today, 25-3, figure out how to get them. And we already have programs that are working. We need to finish the, the work that the commission is doing. That means upgrading the maps and dealing with the, 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 uh, the programs. If additional funding, I wouldn't put $80 billion for it. I think that's this ecosystem can't handle it. And I would say that the symmetrical speeds that we've been debating don't make any sense. And it's not because I want one part, part of the population to have and another part, part of the population have less. It's that you don't need 100 and 100 and you don't need symmetrical speeds for the current activities and even the growth of the current activities. So to go to symmetrical speeds makes no sense in my opinion. The, uh, the Lift Act includes an additional $6 billion for emergency broadband program subsidy. Congress authorized $3.2 billion at the end of last year in a bipartisan manner in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, not for a permanent subsidy program, and that program is not yet up and running. What are some concerns about Congress authorizing more money for a program without first understanding what the need is, especially as we restart opening schools and our economy with the new CDC guidelines saying three feet of social distance is sufficient? Well, that look at I, I think the program, you know, get it up and running but, and figure out where the problems are and if it's working before you add, you know, tr double its cost or double the amount of money going for it. I mean, if you compare it to Lifeline, which maybe is running last year, maybe 800 million, this is four times as large as the money that Congress has already appropriated on a bipartisan basis and then add another six billion. I, I would just say get the program up and operational and figure out the, the problems before you add new money, but that's for you to make the decision. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. All right. Thank you, Billy. Next is um, Paul Tonko is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to quickly highlight a couple of provisions that we might call environmental infrastructure. Uh, but I think we'll see uh, these are as critical to job creation and our economic growth as anything in this bill. Um, so, Dr. Uh, Frieden, forgive me if this is a little beyond the scope of your testimony, but how important is safe drinking water to our nation's public health? Safe drinking water is very important, and it's one of those areas of infrastructure that hasn't been adequately supported. There are significant problems in urban and rural areas uh, places ranging from Alaska to Florida, and it's a problem that's likely to increase because of changes in our environment. Let me just make one broader comment, if I may. Uh, from my perspective, having been a city health commissioner and working in my organization more than 40 countries around the world, most governments have a capital budget and an expense budget. The U.S. government doesn't have that. If we had that, Investments in infrastructure would be much easier to maintain, but I certainly agree that drinking water is crucially important for health. Well, thank you. And so if we improve water quality by investing in treatment facilities and getting lead pipes or getting lead uh, pipes out of our systems, uh, will that have a positive public health benefit? Absolutely. The, the lead service line replacement issue is one that has really uh, stressed public health for decades. The cost is high to replace them, and it's an example of what happens if a technology that's used turns out not to be safe. Uh, but the sooner we get led down, not only will we have less health problems, but the societal and economic benefits of reducing exposure to lead are quite substantial. Well, you say the cost is high, but then is it safe to say we'll create jobs building that infrastructure? Um, uh, the actual act, uh, the actual work of replacing the lead service lines will be an employment generator. In addition, there's strong evidence that suggests that lower lead levels are associated with higher economic um, productivity and activity uh, in the people who are no longer having their brains poisoned by low levels of lead. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Moniz, great to see you. This bill also has money to uh, remediate formerly used industrial sites known as brownfields, many of which are good candidates for renewable energy projects. Is putting brownfields back into uh, productive use a good investment? It, it certainly is, and it also uh, often has very, very strong uh, environmental justice uh, components as well. Uh, one of the approaches that I particularly like for brownfields is, um, is community solar. 
because often, uh, especially in disadvantaged communities, uh, there aren't roofs to put uh, solar uh, panels on uh, uh, in any practical way, for example. Uh, and community solar is a, is a wonderful way of serving uh, these communities using brownfields, uh, perhaps a couple of megawatts at a brownfield site. Uh, also, when done well, uh, employing uh, some of the uh, local citizens uh, in, the, in those projects. Thank you. And the Lift America Act also makes significant investments in zero emission vehicle infrastructure, including a bill that I've uh, authored to provide rebates to build charging stations to workplaces, multifamily apartments, and publicly ac accessible locations. So, Secretary Moniz, we know most EV drivers primarily charge at home, but as uh, more people adapt, uh, adapt to EVs, um, will it be important to provide more charging options? Uh, yes, in fact, we're doing a study in New York City, and just in basically in, in the center of New York City, we see the need for about a half a million charging stations. Uh, but of course, uh, urban environments, suburban environments, and rural environments will need very, very different architectures. But we need them all because it has to be an integrated system uh, where people with EVs have the confidence uh, to be able to drive as they need to, uh, whether it's for work or for pleasure uh, or for vacation and the like. Thank you. And our workplaces in publicly accessible locations, such as grocery stores and public buildings, good complements to ongoing EV infrastructure build out for at home uh, charging and, and fast charging along uh, long distance and interstate corridors. Uh, it, it's absolutely essential because otherwise we will be limiting the market when we know that EVs are uh, are already uh, economically competitive with uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, so it, it would be the height of unfairness, frankly, uh, to exclude the charging infrastructure uh, to those who could benefit from, from those vehicles with their lowering costs. Thank you so much. With that, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. Next is Dr. Bouchon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, this committee has a strong history of working across the aisle, crafting real and helpful legislation for the betterment of the American people and consumer. This, part, this partisan bill expands authorizations leading to massive taxpayer spending during a time when Americans are trying to return to normal life. Um, and I think it, that's unfortunate. Two Congresses ago, I had a bill, H.R. 2872, the Promoting Hydropower Development at Existing Non-Power Dams Act, that became law. This bipartisan legislation created real-world change for the betterment of the American people. It cut through the red tape and instructed FERC to create an expanded permitting process. The clean energy resource provides benefits in the form of jobs, economic investment, and improved public health. EIA reported that as of December 2020, 39 non-powered dams and, and 30, 305 megawatts of capacity are planned for commercial operation as a result, which is an increase from 2018. The United States has been a leader in reducing its emissions, and in order to continue that leadership, advancing technology and innovation is key. However, this legislation lacks any meaningful permitting or licensing reforms to remove barriers to deploying new technologies Thus, in my view, stifling innovation. Instead of rushing to yet another partisan, costly, and duplicative package through the process, we should all be working with the Biden administration to implement the appropriations from the Energy Act of 2020. The bipartisan provisions included $35 billion of R&D and grants technical assistance programs for developing and deploying clean energy and reducing emissions. Let's work together on bipartisan bills that actually improve our nation's infrastructure provide greater broadband access to rural America, pave the way for reliability and resilient electrical grid and make electricity affordable for all, for all Americans. With that in mind, Commissioner O'Reilly, are you aware of anything in the bill that will actually cut through the bureaucratic red tape and allow for a more streamlined permitting and licensing process, which will lead to greater innovation and more efficient broadband build out? On the communication side, those provisions didn't seem to make the cut as of yet, but I've endorsed the package, I think there's 28 different bills, and there's more ideas that, that should be included. It's not an all or nothing thing. I think my colleague, my former colleague has suggested that we're trying to deregulate our way uh, to, to, to network builds, and that's not right, but they are a critical point to reform, and they need to be addressed, or all you're going to get is litigation 
um, which we've, we've dealt with and the commission has tried to deal with for such a long time. And these problems need to be addressed and should be addressed here in the spill. Let me just say, as far as my bill, the hydro bill goes, we went from a process potentially of 10 to 12 years to convert a non hydroelectric dam to a hydroelectric dam. And our bill has cut that down to about a two year process. And it hasn't, it hasn't taken anything offline as far as the review process. It has just forced FERC to actually make a decision and to, and to get the decision up or down to get that decision out there. So I firmly believe that unless we do those things, we can have all the programs we want. But if, you, if it takes 10 or 12 years or longer uh, to develop any kind of infrastructure project, what part of the private sector is going to play with us, play, game, play in that ball, ballpark, right? They just, can't, they just can't do it economically. Also, Commissioner Riley, in light of broadband funding subsidies from the FCC's USF program, USDA, and now the Treasury Department allowable use funds to states, what modifications to the new FCC program proposed in the LIFT Act do you think are needed to ensure broadband companies can meet the obligations of this program in light of other programs potentially subsidizing the same areas? Well, I think you're going to have overbuilding of federal programs, and I'm just unclear how that's going to work, how the $80 billion in the LIFT Act would or Lift America Act would would operate when you just put when, when Congress just put all of this money through these other funding sources for different standards. I just I just don't know how that's going to be coordinated. First of all, the coordination is poor, uh, but even then, I don't even know how these would would act. And I would say that the Lift Act seems to wipe away most federal programs, certainly the FCC programs, in favor of its own. Yeah, I mean, I you know the federal government has a tendency of putting a lot of money out there and that people actually can't use. You know, and it, and it does. I mean, this is common across the federal government. We do that to the to uh, agency. We do that to parts of our economy all the time. It seems to me that we want to ask people who are actually in the game, hey, what actually amount of money do you, you do you need um, to do what we're propose we're asking you to do? And so my concern is, as is yours, is that the, this kind of funding is it may not actually be necessary, or they can't use it. I represent a very rural district. I just want to say this in closing, Mr. Chairman, and broadband access is critical. You can't have economic development, you can't do telehealth medicine, and you can't do distance learning if you don't have it. So I'm hopeful whatever we do here in Congress that we find a bipartisan solution to that problem. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, uh, Congressman Cardenas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank all the members for attending this important hearing. Um, also to the ranking member. It's our responsibility as we build for the future to provide a safe, sustainable environment for everyone today, especially for our children and grandchildren and future generations. In Los Angeles, we continue to work on reducing emissions so we can breathe cleaner air. That includes investing in our public transportation, which will greatly benefit families in the San Fernando Valley and throughout the region. The Lift America Act includes language from my bill, Clean Commute for Kids Act, language that will help provide communities with zero emission school bus fleets. There are nearly 500,000 school buses across our great country. Nearly 95% of America's school buses run on diesel. Yeah, diesel, a fossil fuel that has been shown to cause numerous health problems, including asthma, bronchitis, and cancer. And the most vulnerable among us are our seniors and children when it comes to health effects of things that cause cancer. Transitioning to cleaner buses would prevent the, the release of 5.3 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions each year to protect our children and their lungs and to keep our diesel fumes out of the air and inside of our school buses and also to have a better benefit for the world at large. The Lift America Act puts our goal to transition the entire fleet to zero emission buses over the next decade. This is the most aggressive attempt for us to do the right thing in America for our children and for the environment. Secretary Moniz, transitioning to clean school buses includes the cost of the bus, which is currently around $300,000 each bus, the cost of buying and installing charging infrastructure and the cost to train employees in the new technology. The Lift America Act authorizes grants for all of these costs and also includes strong Buy America language for the school bus program. Lift America authorizes $650 million over the next five years to begin this transition. But recently, the World Resources Institute wrote a letter 
noting that this amount would definitely not be adequate. Uh, Mr. Secretary, would you agree with me that Congress needs to commit significantly more funds if we're trying to transition the fleet of the, for the, over the next decade? Uh, I, I would, sir. The, uh, uh, the electric buses uh, are uh, having their costs come down rapidly. Uh, uh, charging these fleets uh, is, is a natural. And frankly, there would be uh, some environmental justice uh, uh, benefits as well in, in, uh, in many, many cases. Okay, so it's multiple benefits, not just the children. Yes. And how would a, yes. And how would a, a significantly higher financial commitment from the federal government paired with a Buy America requirement influence the private sector's decision-making regarding investing in manufacturing capacity here at home, including for components like batteries? Uh, we, we need to uh, really up, uh, up the game in our supply chain for these vehicles. Right now, electric buses are dominated in China. Uh, we'd like to get a domestic supply chain here for the vehicles uh, and for the batteries. Uh, it's encouraging on the battery side that we are seeing uh, a new, uh, many new battery factories uh, going up uh, to serve the EV, uh, the uh, light duty vehicle uh, market. But of course, they would also serve uh, the these electric bus market, uh, electric bus market, and the bus market has not only the school bus uh, uh, market, but of course. Uh, urban uh, urban buses would also be qu uh, quite natural if we That's can build our supply chain. Yes, thank you. The LIFT Act also includes language from my bill, the Affordable Solar Energy for our Communities Act. This language provides funding for community solar installations for underserved communities as well. Everybody who wants to have a, a safer and cleaner environment should be able to participate. Secretary Moniz, in addition to helping increase access to clean energy, can you please talk about the role of small solar installations like community solar in our energy transition. Yes, uh, again, as I said earlier, I'm a big fan of community solar. Uh, certainly in many underserved communities, there's very limited opportunity, even if you had the, had the resources to do a, uh, a rooftop uh, solar installation. So this way uh, uh, in those communities, you can, you can in effect own a piece of a, of a one or two megawatt facility uh, and lower your energy bills uh, 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 typically. So um, I think this is a major opportunity. And going back to the earlier question, it also would link in uh, with the Brownfields program. Thank you. The LIFT Act is something that, that we should move forward and I support it wholeheartedly. And also I think that we've had the worst example of bad government when it comes to Texas and the failure for them to require redundancy in their systems and to make sure that they do not fail the people. So with that, I'll, I'll yield back my time. Thank you. And now we go to uh, Congressman Walbert for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me first echo my, my colleagues in recognizing how deeply troubling it is uh, that uh, the majority has decided for go uh, some bipartisanship in working on an issue that we can all agree on, I, I truly believe. Uh, investing in our nation's infrastructure instead of reaching out uh, to Republicans to find areas of common ground. Uh, there was a decision, I guess, to introduce a partisan wish list that lacks the very basic principles of good governance. Uh, while the provisions in this package appear well intended, many of them actually undermine the larger objectives that this bill seeks to address. Uh, for example, while setting lofty standards for higher broadband speeds and trying to future-proof uh, network technology, which is a good thing, uh, the reality is that uh, this provision uh, in this bill would actually drain limited resources to upgrade existing networks rather than expanding underserved areas. I'm also disappointed that there's been a decision to uh, abandon our previous bipartisan work on next gen 911 services. Uh, NG 911 is critical for the safety and security of our communities, yet 911 dispatchers in my district and state have raised serious concerns that provisions in this bill would, stand, uh, would strand millions in of dollars in taxpayer investment over the last decade. Uh, let me start by saying that expanding uh, broadband to rural America is vital. 
and as someone who was recently connected to the internet thanks to the Connect America Fund, I understand how important it is that we use our dollars wisely. Uh, the bill. Did we lose yeah. uh, Miss Tim? Did we lose? Did uh, now I can. And now I can. Uh, I can't hear him. Is anybody else hearing him? Um, I can hear you. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we'll do our best. Uh, uh, um, I don't know if. Um, 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 appears that you've lost me again. Now we can hear you again. <laughs> what Brent, let, me, let me move closer to the screen. Maybe that'll do it. <laughs> yeah, and, and ask your question and then uh, go ahead. The question is this. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, I've heard concerns that uh, this, uh, this program could be used to overbuild existing broadband networks with fiscal in infrastructure that are in many cases already funded by other federal programs. Does this bill have sufficient safeguards to address this concern? I don't believe so. I don't, I don't. I, I think he asked it, uh, Mike, you can answer. Okay, I'll answer. I don't believe the bill uh, addresses that. And I worry that the money that's invested in other federal programs is either gonna be wasted or conflict and definitely lead to the point of overbuilding uh, the subsidized overbuilding. Uh, overbuilding is fine, this competition, but subsidized overbuilding is incredibly problematic um, and harmful to those that don't have service. Thank you. Uh, two years ago, I talked about how the disastrous heavy hand of Title II net neutrality regulations would destroy pro consumer service offerings like sponsored data plans. And now a California net neutrality law has done exactly that. Once again, it looks like heavy handed regulations like those in this bill are poised to hurt consumers. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, can you talk about how the heavy handed regulations in the bill's Title I, Subtitle C broadband programs would prevent small providers from being able to participate and undermine their ability to bring broadband to rural Americans like mine? I think the bill has a number of requirements, and you outlined one in one section. I, I think there are a number of requirements that will make uh, certain providers not want to participate or unwilling to participate or unable to participate. And the California example highlights that situation. Uh, the zero ratings, for instance, uh, case that, that, that California has as part of its prohibition is something where big providers and small are not going to be able to, uh, they're going to have to change their practices because of. Uh, and and, and that's, that, to me, is a detriment. Uh, to, to actually getting all and, and having many competitors in the space uh, that we'd want to compete for these dollars and having a full-on competitive bidding situation. Thank you. Moving to 911, Commissioner O'Reilly, what would be the impact of states like Michigan, who have already spent over a decade investing in planning and executing nine, uh, NG 911, if we were to uh, restrict existing technologies from being used? Yeah, I'm not sure why the, the bill goes in this direction. I'm worried, and, and we were tried flexibility, bipartisan structure in the Spectrum Act of 2012 to make sure that the, the states had an ability to, to work through their system. And Nina is so important in this equation. And, and I've visited those call centers, many visited during my time period at the commission. And I leery if they're saying that there's a problem in the states uh, and the, the, the value of the dollar that they're investing and also the program and direction they're going is being federalized. I think that's incredibly problematic. Uh, should be reviewed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Ruiz. Thank you, Mr. I, I, Chairman. Uh, I'm actually wearing my white coat today because I'm I'm actively participating and vaccinating some of our hardest hit, highest risk community members in my hometown of Coachella. So. If you see me wearing my white coat, it's, it's, it's not without its context. Uh, the Lift America Act that we are considering here today will help our nation build back better 
and deliver much needed infrastructure improvements for our districts. There are a couple key parts of this bill that I'd like to touch on today. The first issue is ensuring that tribal nation Well, we lost your voice. Um, I don't know if he's muted or what happened. Can't hear you. Uh, we may have to come back to him. Former FEC commissioners are not allowed to laugh. <laughs> All right, we'll have to come back to him. Next is um, uh, I guess it's uh, Debbie's not on. Debbie's there. All right, we'll go to Miss Dingle next, and then we'll come back. Debbie, thank you, Chairman Cologne, and thank you for hosting this hearing. Um, as we look to shift from relief to, to long-term economic recovery from the COVID pandemic, we've got a real opportunity to make bold investments in our infrastructure to build back better and at the same time rapidly transition to a clean net zero economy that will support good paying American jobs, protect public health and the environment, and invest in frontline communities, allowing all of us to thrive. I'm proud this bill has a number of my legislative priorities and bills, including the dam and hydropower safety, establishing a green financing accelerator, and makes investments in electric vehicles, manufacturing, retooling, expands the advanced technology vehicle manufacturing programs, and helps deploy a network. Of, it helps deploy the EV infrastructure that we desperately need in this country. Secretary Manos, I'm talking fast because I'd like to move right to some questions focused on the future of electric vehicles and the clean energy and sustainability accelerator as we aim to rebuild our nation's infrastructure and economy. And as you know, several of our auto manufacturers have said that they are committed to an EV future, but that means three things. We've got to build consumer confidence, which means they have to be able to afford the car. They need a battery that's got range and they need to know that they can charge it when they're out there. So my first question to you is how would, uh, so as you noted in your testimony, today's domestic battery manufacturing capacity is thanks in part to DOE's advanced technology vehicles manufacturing or ATVM loan program. The ATVM program still has $17 billion in lending authority the Lift America Act and the standalone legislation I will be introducing soon would expand and modernize the ATV program to include low and zero emission, medium and heavy duty, heavy duty vehicles and make it easier for component manufacturers to qualify. Lift America would also update and reauthorize DOE's domestic manufacturing conversion grant program at $2.5 billion per year. So, my questions for you are, how would these revitalized programs help with our economic recovery, increase domestic manufacturing of clean energy supply chains? And that's something we really have to talk about. We need to build those batteries here, not overseas. Those jobs need to be here. And three, accelerate the deployment of clean energy infrastructure. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Dingle, and it's good to see you again. Uh, the um, uh, well, you've you've put your finger right on it. First of all, the ATVM program, for those who are not familiar, uh, really helped uh, a couple of major battery uh, battery uh, production uh, factories uh, to be built uh, and uh, uh, modernizing uh, through the uh, through the Lift Act uh, the the ability to support supply chain. Uh, uh, EV supply chain development, uh, I think, is is re is really uh, right on, uh, and uh, I might say that look uh, quite bluntly. Uh, the last four years have seen uh, uh, the loan program uh, pretty much on hold. Uh, uh, Secretary Granholm has appointed an excellent, uh, experienced investor 
uh, to head the program now, and I'm, I, I believe that uh, it will be very, very active, uh, and this area of transportation uh, should be should be a focus. Uh, so, um, well, we're and and I think just to repeat, the fact that our domestic manufacturers are so committed in this direction, they've made those business model choices. The cost of ownership is going to uh, equal and then drop below that of an of internal combustion engine. So I can see why GM and Ford, et cetera, are saying that uh, this is uh, this is their future. Let me ask you another quick question, um, and then I have questions for the record. What do you think the growing adoption of electric vehicles will mean for the grid, which has come up in other questions? And in addition to charging infrastructure, what grid upgrades are needed to support the increased demand? But we need to not complain about needing to do it. We just need to do it for the future. No, in, in fact, uh, I, I think uh, we've heard some statements here that frankly uh, overstate uh, the, 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 the needs of, on, on the grid. For one thing, because uh, we will continue to see uh, much uh, more, more efficiency uh, and, uh, and this will contribute to some load growth for the utilities. But we should also remember the utilities are in the lead in terms of decar decarbonization. Uh, so it kind of it all fits together in a sensible way. The other thing is, and this is more speculative, I have to I have to admit, but we know that vehicle to grid integration will also be part of the new infrastructure and can supply some new grid services. So, so I, I think this is opportunity. Uh, it's it to me, it is it is not a concern. Thank you, and I guess I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Though I'm not sure I didn't have a little taken away from. No, from thank all. you. Um, we'll go now to uh, Congressman Palmer. Is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, you know, as my colleagues have pointed out, throwing billions of dollars um, in the federal programs, and, and yet we're failing to address one of the biggest obstacles that we have in terms of getting the infrastructure built that we need just to maintain our economy, much less um, move to a, a cleaner uh, energy uh, infrastructure. Um, last week in our hearing, uh, I asked a witness how long it takes to get new and cleaner infrastructure built. He stated that under NEPA, a, a federal transportation related infrastructure project takes up for the seven to uh, eight years just to uh, get the paperwork finished. Uh, a project to expand uh, public transit outside of Philadelphia has been under NEPA review since 2012. And I would think if we wanted to encourage more people to use public transit, that we would make it a, a, a priority to get it built. Now, these delays are not rare, and it doesn't <clears throat> only relate to uh, uh, transportation infrastructure and other infrastructure, it will relate to broadband as well. Uh, there was, um, I asked the Army Corps of Engineers to give me a list of outstanding feasibility studies. And it took nearly nine months for them to respond to that. And, and when I did get it, I got a list of 97 studies that had been underway for hundreds of months at the cost of millions of dollars. And my point about this is, is that uh, since some of my Democrat colleagues have uh, uh, predicted that we only have 10 years before we have a worldwide climate catastrophe. Um, shouldn't we be looking at ways to expedite our permitting process to, uh, for infrastructure, maybe for building nuclear power uh, plants that have no CO2 emissions? Uh, Mr. Moniz? Uh, yes, I, I, I agree that, uh, as I said earlier, in the context of CCS, uh, and it's true in many other contexts uh, that uh, we often have uh, too many uh, serial uh, permitting uh, requirements. Uh, what we need to have is at federal and state levels uh, processes that involve all the stakeholders, again, do not cut corners, but provide a coherence uh, that allows the end-to-end -end permitting process to be much shorter. Because frankly, I, I would share the concern uh, that some of these processes are going on so long that they conflict with the time scale in which we need to introduce new uh, new new technologies. So I think that is a very important uh, overarching 
uh, issue. And it's one where I think we need to have real serious coalition building to bring together the different constituencies uh, who really have legitimate claims uh, to be addressed uh, in the in the permitting process. That's one of the things um, that I worked on when we were in the majority and I chaired the subcommittee on intergovernmental affairs was getting rid of the uh, duplicative, the obsolete uh, regulations. I, I would also think that we we would do well if we had a, a portal where it was a, a one-stop shop for permitting to expedite this. And not only for building the infrastructure that my Democrat colleagues advocate, but for doing basic things like, uh, for instance, there was a, a study undertaken after a flood in 1983 in Louisiana to build a diversion canal from the Comey River over to the Lily Bayou. And it took uh, 38 years uh, before anything was done. And that was only after a devastating flood in 2016. So I, I I appreciate your uh, uh, candid and accurate response to that, uh, Secretary Monetis. Um, in, in fact, if, if I could add, in, in some cases, California, for example, does appoint one, one of the multiple agencies to be the lead, so it really kind of coordinates it. That's the kind of thing we need more of. Well, if nothing else out of this hearing, I would hope that we could come up with a productive solution to this, if we're going to waste hundreds of billions of dollars, let's do it as efficiently as we can. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. So now we're going to try to go back. I see Dr. Ruiz has got his his lab coat on there. Can we hear you? You're recognized again. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So let's let's get right to it. Um, you know, I already told you why I'm wearing my lab coat. I'm actually vaccinating people outside. Uh, I'm at a community vaccination clinic in one of our hardest hit high risk communities in my district. Uh, so that's why I'm wearing the white coat, just so I, I didn't throw people off as to why the hell am I wearing a white coat during a congressional hearing. But it's because I'm doctoring right now out these doors. Uh, the Lift America Act that we are considering today will help our nation build back better, deliver much needed infrastructure improvements for our district. Uh, I want to talk about two issues. One is the tribal broadband uh, prioritization in order to help our tribes uh, get the state of the art uh, uh, health care, educational and economic opportunities that uh, exist. Uh, they have been the least to be connected in America. What was already a problem turned into a catastrophe once the pandemic hit. When schools closed, and in many cases, the nearest hospital or clinics was was hours away. And without robust connectivity, people couldn't work remotely or take advantage of telehealth services. In 2018, as part of the Ray Bonds Act, Congress enacted my bill, the Tribal Broadband Deployment Act, uh, that required the FCC to study and report on tribal broadband connectivity. When the FCC finally issued its report in 2019, the data showed that there isn't just a digital divide in Indian country, it's a digital canyon. Uh, no matter what metrics you looked at, tribal lands have significantly lower access to internet than non-tribal lands. That is why the Lift America Act is so important. This bill will make historic investments to expand internet across, uh, internet access to increase economic and telehealth opportunity for tribal communities. To do this, the Lift America uh, Act includes my bill, the Tribal Internet Expansion Act. It amends the Communications Act to direct the FCC's Universal Service Fund to explicitly prioritize tribal lands along with rural and low-income areas. In addition, the Lift America Act, which I am pleased to co-sponsor, dedicates $500 million for tribal connectivity and sets aside funds to increase adoption and digital equity on tribal lands. Uh, Chairman Wheeler. Much needs to be done to ensure that tribal communities are fully connected. But in your opinion, will these provisions help increase broadband connectivity on tribal lands? You are absolutely right, Congressman. Your amendment, your bill, for instance, to amend Section 254 to make it clear what the responsibility is in tribal lands is important. The, what the LIFT Act does also includes tribal lands. Let me just to make one quick point about another provision of the LIFT Act that is gonna help tribal lands and everybody else. And that's the requirement for transparency. You know, I spent a lot of time on tribal lands when I was chairman. 
And what I was finding was that they were kind of given a take it or leave it choice by their lo local provider. And they didn't know what other areas were being charged for similar service. And the Thank transparency you, that this bill does will help in that regard too. Thank you. Thank you very much. The other area of this bill I wanted to highlight is the section advancing residential solar energy for lower income communities. Climate change is most significantly affected uh, many low-income communities, yet too many of the technologies that will save our planet are still primarily available to those with higher incomes. Production of clean, renewable energy should be accessible to every community, regardless of their zip code or economic status, especially in my district, where we experience over 350 days of sunshine per year in Southern California, Palm Springs area. There is huge untapped potential for every community to harness clean energy for their own homes. Secretary Moniz, I want to talk to you specifically about access and equity in the energy transition. The Lift America Act includes funding to build low-income community solar installations. Why is equitable access to clean energy important, and how do we ensure that our transition is actually equitable and inclusive? And in addition to community solar, what are other options we can pursue? Well, um, uh, Mr. Ruiz, uh, certainly providing uh, reliable, clean electricity uh, and affordable electricity on tribal lands has always been a very, very high priority of mine. Uh, I would, uh, because it is, it is well, it's the right thing to do, and it, and it provides also the opportunity for, uh, for education, for, uh, for, for employment. Uh, it, it is, it is an, it is an equity issue. Uh, in 2016, uh, I was very pleased with bipartisan support to finally uh, get, um, I think it was 11 million dollars appropriated. Uh, to provide credit support for perhaps a hundred million dollars of loan program for energy projects uh, on tribal lands. Uh, uh, I think it's time to uh, employ uh, that. And frankly, um, I would love to see that increase by an order of magnitude. Thank you very much. And I yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Congressman Dunn. Thank you very much, Chairman Plown. Uh, I, I think we can all agree that some federal investment aimed at improving our nation's infrastructure is needed, and surely every one of us can think of uh, huge infrastructure needs specific to our districts. I'm disappointed, however, this LIFT Act lacks uh, bipartisan buy-in and, like the American Rescue Plan, lacks targeted allocation of funds. Has this committee taken the time to assess the status of the trillions and trillions of dollars appropriated just last year to many of the same departments and programs that the LIFT Act would pour money into? I know that my Republican colleagues and I have not seen an accounting of these unspent funds or a timeline for spending those funds. I'd also hope, uh, as this committee engages in a thorough legislative process, that we'll see some data and analysis of the appropriated and spent funds as well. Uh, I'd like to focus my questions on what appears to be duplicative health policy in the LIFT Act. Dr. Frieden, uh, Section uh, 4001 in the LIFT Act requires the HHS Secretary to develop standards for voluntary accreditation of public health departments and labs. As you know, CLIA includes federal standards for all labs, and labs that perform higher complexity testing are also issued accreditation approved by CMS. In addition to these requirements, the National Public Health Performance Standard, the standards, assesses capacity and performance of public health systems. Given that all labs already comply with the aforementioned requirements and the labs were put through the ringer last year, why do we need a new set of standards for accreditation of public health labs? What's the problem with the current standards? Actually, uh, Congressman, there, there are some gaps, and I think um, accreditation can serve as a way of advancing quality. Uh, right now, there's something called the Public Health Accreditation Board, and that board set up sta voluntary standards for uh, health departments, including public health laboratories. And um, what we really found was that the vast majority um, aren't up to speed. And so, so I'd love to, say, you know, we can't in five minutes, we can't answer that, but I would love to talk to somebody uh, over there about that 
uh, offline because this or learn however you know white paper. we'd be happy to follow up with, with you congressman i i think the the, the big picture is that um, accreditation can set standards that um, can ha allow Congress and other funders to hold entities accountable. I, I think we can do that though, without adding too much more red tape to our public labs, which I don't think they just they they need. You know, so if if there's a problem, let's get what the problem is and add that to the accreditation we have. I want to shift to section four zero 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 three, hospital infrastructure funding. This section prioritizes grants for hospitals whose projects will, quote, include by design public health emergency preparedness and cybersecurity against cyber threats, end quote. Now, the already existing hospital preparedness program is a dedicated source of federal funding for hospitals and health systems to prepare for, respond to, and recover from all kinds of threats, including cyber. In your opinion, do you think that the existing hospital preparedness program is insufficient to address no. preparedness? And if so, why does focusing Phil Burton program funding on preparedness, why is that more appropriate than simply boosting the existing hospital preparedness program? Um, the hospital preparedness program has not been run by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which I directed, but by the what's called the ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Funding for that program has been substantially reduced over the past uh, decade, decade and a half. And I think quite, to be very blunt, the, the uh, impact of that program has been limited. It's important that it be focused, whether on this issues or other that Congress decides. It is a possible uh, route for funding. It has not been particularly effective in the past. And I think you don't look, need to look any further than COVID to see that. And this is one of the areas that a health defense operations approach would allow you, Congress, to decide on. You could decide which line okay, so I, I, you're going to be We're going to run out of time here, but I just want to say this is two examples among many. Uh, but it seems to me that f the funds in this bill could be targeted more specifically towards our goals. If the goal is to fund preparedness activities, and if the existing program is lacking funds, then some of the funding in this bill could be specifically targeted to, for instance, the hospital preparedness program. Surely we could find those funds somewhere in the $6 billion pot of money for open-ended you know, core public health infrastructure spending. And with that, Madam Chair, or I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Um, now we're gonna go to the gentlewoman from New Hampshire, Ms. Custer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you again for hosting this hearing. I think it's a really important for us to be addressing our infrastructure that has been crumbling all across this country. And right here in New Hampshire, we have red listed roads and bridges. I understand the American Society of Civil Engineers has given American infrastructure a C minus. So when Congress fails to make these investments, ordinary Americans are left holding the bag unable to participate in the digital economy or remote learning or home health care uh, because of bad internet connections. But the LIFT Act makes important investments in improving our, our infrastructure, including water infrastructure. And I wanted to discuss a damn good idea that I have come across. I'm super excited about uh, 21st century hydropower and projects to improve the vitality of our nation's rivers. So this morning, I led a letter with 39 of my colleagues, including many on this committee, to the Biden administration to include funding to rehabilitate, retrofit, and remove dams, the three R's in the next infrastructure package. The letter is supported by both river conservation and hydropower groups, it is built off of the Stanford University Uncommon Dialogue Agreement that robust investments are needed in the three R's to reduce carbon emissions, promote healthy river ecosystems, and create jobs. So Secretary Moniz, I wanna commend you and EFI for your leadership on the three R's. And my first question to you is this, should the U.S. rehabilitate, retrofit, and remove dams to bring the clean energy benefits of hydropower and the environmental and economic benefits of healthy rivers to fruition? And that's a... 
Secretary Meniz, you're muted, I think. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, I was thanking uh, uh, the Congresswoman for her leadership on this uh, damn problem, as she as she referred to it. Uh, the This is a tremendous opportunity. Um, uh, and by the way, we were pleased to help. Stanford was really in the lead uh, on this, but but we were pleased to help. But it's an opportunity for uh, more hydropower. It's an opportunity for healthier rivers. Uh, it's uh, an unusual coalition between conservationists and, and energy people. Uh, it's just a, a perfect program, and I think we should move out on this really, really fast. Great. That's why I call it a damn good idea. Right. A type of federal investment would be most effective for increasing hydropower generation and electricity storage and improving the health of our rivers. And if you might quickly explain to my colleagues the benefits of storage with hydropower. Yes, well, today uh, it's not commonly known that, that pumped hydro storage essentially pumping water up so that you can have it fall down and generate electricity when needed uh, is actually the dominant storage technology today uh, in this country. Uh, but you need to have the right water resources, the right topology, uh, and maximizing that through this uh, dams uh, initiative. By the way, we have about 90,000 dams in this country, some powered, mostly unpowered, uh, and some safe and some unsafe. So this is, has all kinds of dimensions uh, from providing storage for our wind and solar resources to safety to, uh, I'm a very avid fly fisherman, uh, to better ecosystems uh, for cold water fisheries as well. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, quickly now, I'm going to shift gears a bit. Mr. Wheeler, I want to quickly touch on high-speed uh, broadband. As Congress and the FCC look to deploy additional resources, can you speak to the importance of first deploying broadband to completely unserved communities? Thank you, Congresswoman. That's a great question. And, you know, one of the things we've learned today, you all, one of the great things about this body is your representative. You're also representative in what we've seen today in some of the connectivity problems that this country has. And one of the members said earlier that we need to use the dollars wisely. I think that's the point that you're making. We don't want to have second class service for rural areas. And the excuse that somehow unserved areas are going to get to the back of the line is just a figment. You run an auction and you say, y'all come. And everybody gets the opportunity to come to participate in that auction. And that's what can happen in your state, in rural areas and elsewhere. Terrific. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Um, we now go to Congresswoman Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for the witnesses, I'm a Congresswoman from Arizona. Um, it's great to be in front of you today uh, and have you here. The, I share the, I don't understand, I should say, why the standard in this bill is 100 megabytes per second um, upload and download, you know, download and upload. Uh, I, I don't understand the need for that. And um, it's been said here that there is a concern that because that is the standard set in this bill that just about every single community in America, including communities that already have, uh, you know, broadband services are, are going to get the money as well. And these rural areas that don't have anything aren't going to get it. So I am hoping and I want to tell my colleagues that I'm willing to work with you. It seems like a simple fix to me on that is to prioritize areas that don't have broadband at all uh, in this bill. And so um, I'm willing to work with my Democratic and Republican colleagues on that fix. My question, though, is changing subjects is for Mr. Moniz. Um, you had brought up the 
mining of critical minerals. And I just want to read a couple things that I had read first and then ask you a question. Um, it says that 35 critical and rare earth minerals of strategic importance uh, to energy applications, high tech manufacturing and defense have been identified by the previous administration. The energy applications of these critical minerals include magnets and wind turbines, batteries in electric and conventional vehicles, phosphorus and energy efficient lighting and displays and catalysts for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. The US is entirely reliant on imports for 14 of the 35 while imports account for at least 50% of the supply for another 17. And I think I read recently that uh, as far as lithium that's used in these electric vehicle batteries, that most of it is produced in Australia, if I'm not mistaken, and then Chile, and then China. But I'm pretty sure, and I want you to confirm that it said that China processes most of it using coal-fired plants. Um, so first I want you to confirm if China processes most, most of the lithium. But then my question is, how do we get more mining here of critical minerals, including lithium, uh, and make sure that we are able to do so? Because there's a lot of environmental concerns. And so how do we balance that? So, uh, Congressman, let's go. Uh, first of all, just let me reaff reaffirm uh, that the need for these critical uh, minerals is going to just uh, uh, skyrocket, um, uh, frankly, uh, as we deploy uh, new technologies. Number two, you're absolutely right that China, uh, it's not only lithium, actually, China uh, dominates the processing of many of these critical critical minerals. So I think there is no doubt as a uh, you know, as a sane uh, energy security issue, uh, we need to work to diversify uh, these sources of minerals and their and their processing. Now, in the United States, we will be able to expand our production in some of these areas. In lithium, for example, there are initiatives in the Salton Sea, uh, initiatives in North Carolina, uh, et cetera. But for other minerals like cobalt, I just don't think we have the natural resource. So what we need to do is to really work with our allies, uh, Canada, Australia, uh, for example, uh, which have uh, significant mining uh, experience uh, 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 and, and active mining, uh, so that we uh, can have uh, a balance at least against the uh, the, the Chinese uh, processing dominance. Um, now, the um, in terms of re-examining mining, there there is a lot of discussion going on. For example, in Minnesota, uh, the old in the Iron Range, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I think that this is again a case where we the, where where constituencies need to come together. Uh, balance climate, environmental, improve environmental footprint. Uh, but I, I believe we do need to expand uh, domestic mining uh, as an energy security issue uh, in a low carbon world. In fact, if I may just give one factoid that gives you an idea of the scale, one of the very large offshore wind turbines and where I live in New England, uh, offshore wind has got to be a big part of the solution. Just one of those turbines requires a ton of a rare earth uh, mineral. Mm -hmm. So this is big. Yes, thank you. That it's, it is really big. And so I, I hope all of our committee can figure out a way that we're not so reliant on hostile countries, including uh, China, uh, to process and also to mine, we have to come. We have to do it. And so, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, next, we go to Congresswoman Balagon. Thank you, Chair Pallone, for holding this important hearing on the Lift America Act, which invests more than three hundred and twelve billion in infrastructure to reduce pollution, combat climate change, narrow the digital divide, create jobs, and increase access to health care. I'm especially proud that provisions from my bill, the Climate Smart Ports Act, have been included in LIFT 
to help ports reduce pollution by investing in zero admissions technology. Nearly 40% of Americans live within three miles of a port, including communities of color in my district near the Port of Los Angeles. While ports create jobs and help our economy run, they also are major sources of air pollution that often impact the public health of communities of color. Modernizing our ports is good for our climate, environmental justice, and our public health. Secretary Moniz, America's trade volume is expected to see an increase of 300% by 2030. Do you agree that electrifying our ports is an important climate solution, given how connected they are to the goods movement system nationally and globally? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I might say that in the Quadrennial Energy Review back in uh, 2015, uh, we made that recommendation, uh, and your acting on it is is really, uh, really a very, very good idea. As you said, there are envir environmental justice uh, uh, issues. Uh, there's a lot of energy uh, uh, trade as well that goes through our ports. And I just mentioned offshore wind as, as an example. That's going to require a whole port infrastructure uh, to develop, maintain, et cetera. So electrifying that and or using hydrogen, uh, uh, clean hydrogen uh, or a zero carbon fuel, there are a few options, but going to zero carbon ports would be an enormous, enormous step forward. Well, thank you for that. It, it kind of leads into my second question that you covered a little bit. The lift bill includes a critical down payment of $3.8 billion over five years in decarbonizing ports. Given that there are 360 commercial ports in the United States, and we are hearing the average cost to decarbonize a port is at least half a billion dollars, do you agree we need to be investing as much as possible to meet that need? Uh, yes, I think, uh, I think uh, the, but with the, with the federal funding, of course, as much as possible, leveraging leveraging other funds uh, to, to come in uh, with perhaps creative financing uh, ways because uh, it will require a lot of, a lot of resources. I would also argue that uh, environmental justice could be used as one of the priority factors in terms of how the investments are made. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for you next. The lift bill makes critical investments in grid modernization to improve resiliency during extreme weather events, which will become more frequent due to climate change. When you were Energy Secretary, your department provided grants, small grants to towns and cities to assist in building microgrids to support critical facilities such as hospitals or fire departments during power outages. Do you think Lyft should invest in clean energy microgrids for communities across the country as part of a climate resiliency strategy? Uh, yes, and I might, I might also add, by the way, of course, microgrids play a huge role uh, in our in our defense facilities, uh, our, our our bases. Uh, but going back to 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 the question, I think microgrids should be looked at as one one integral part of the overall smart grid structure of the future uh, because it provides the ability, uh, especially uh, during um, uh, risky periods for the, for the grid stability, uh, it, 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 it provides the ability to, in a certain sense, decouple and serve a, a critical load uh, in a reliable way uh, during, uh, during a, um, a, a stress on the grid. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I have a clean energy microgrids bill with Representative Clark that focuses these investments in environmental justice communities. I hope as we mark up lift that we can include further support for microgrids in this legislation. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Next, we go to Congressman Pence. Thank you, Chair Pallone and Ranking Member Rogers for holding this meeting today. One third of the legislation we are considering today authorizes clean energy programs. And so I would like to focus my remarks today on these considerable provisions. Following a long career in the petroleum industry, I came to Congress to address the challenges facing our critical infrastructure in both the short term and on a long term basis. In Indiana, the crossroads of America, 
We have always recognized the importance of modernizing and investing in our aging infrastructure. We rank number one in roads. This contributes to the prosperity of not only Hoosiers, but all Americans. What the current administration fails to realize is that the demand for affordable, reliable energy is only going to increase. As my colleagues on this esteemed committee know, sources of clean and renewable energy will only be as useful as they are reliable. I support an all of the above approach to energy production, but the intermittent nature of solar and wind will leave a gap in baseload power that consumers need for reliable and affordable energy. To support the robust network of electric vehicles that the Lift America Act suggests, disruptions in available power will have even more disastrous implications in our economy and national security. Fossil fuels like natural gas and coal are needed to protect the integrity of our grid and affordability of electricity prices on a baseload basis. Unfortunately, this legislation misses a mark on any meaningful expansion of the pipeline infrastructure that is needed for cleaner burning reliable fuels. I hope that the majority will consider additional provisions that support the robust pipeline distribution that will be necessary to sustain energy needs for the electric vehicle network that this legislation envisions. Pipeline distributions will continue playing an important role in other clean energy technologies. I'm proud that Cummins Engine Company, headquarters just miles from my home in Columbus, Indiana, is developing world-class innovation to advance cleaner technology using hydrogen and fuel cell solutions. However, like any other fuel, hydrogen will need to be transport, transported from point A to point B. And pipelines will have to be part of the equation if we are to enable the hydrogen fueling infrastructure provisions in this bill. My bipartisan Clean Energy Hydrogen Innovation Act is a good first step to advance U.S. leadership in hydrogen inno innovation through the Department of Energy's Loan Guarantee Program. Mr. Moniz, in your testimony, you touched on the need for low carbon fuels to complement clean electricity. I agree with your sentiment that hydrogen has the potential to play a critical role in an all of the above energy strategy in a wide range array of applications. My question is this, how quickly do you think we could create a distribution network to bring this innovative carbon neutral, or in some cases, carbon negative solution to market? And what are the elements of this, and this network? And finally, what does it, doesn't it include pipelines? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pence, uh, for the question. The, the, um, in fact, uh, in my testimony, uh, there was a rather complicated figure uh, which, uh, in which my answer uh, really is centered. Uh, namely, uh, I would see the opportunity to really uh, focus on hydrogen market development uh, in this decade. Uh, we need to move out, I think, uh, quite quickly uh, on this. Uh, for example, we showed in that figure, uh, to which, I, um, which I'm referring to, how in the United States, and I think Indiana would, would, would be one of those cases, where the convergence of, uh, of, of industry and, and power uh, and the opportunity for CO2 sequestration, they all converge. And so uh, what we would argue for is the Congress could really incentivize two, three, four of these hydrogen CO2 hubs uh, to be uh, really focused on in the near term. Uh, and that could be a mixture, uh, given the CO2 opportunities, a mixture of so-called blue hydrogen and potentially green hydrogen as well. But hydrogen, as you have said, has this capacity to uh, essentially, in the longer term, replace the role of natural gas in serving multiple end, uh, end uses. 
and I think uh, in, in a low carbon way. And so that's really important. And I think we could move out in five years if there was a focus on these uh, dispersed number of demonstration hubs. Well, thank you. I sure hope we consider this uh, very quickly. I know there are some, I'll call them manufacturers that uh, believe this technology is here today. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, next, we go to Lisa Blunt Rochester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling this crucial hearing on the Lift America Act. And thank you to the witnesses for your testimony today. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has exasperated an already crumbling infrastructure. For too long, we have neglected to invest in our country's infrastructure needs, and many of our nation's roads, bridges, dams, and drinking water systems are in desperate need of upgrades and repairs. As we consider legislation to modernize our nation's infrastructure, it is also critical that we remember that investment must include broadband. The Enhanced Emergency Broadband Act, which I proudly support, expands access to internet for low-income uh, individuals and families that were disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And while I was pleased to see this bill's inclusion in the package, we need to look for the permanent solution for broadband affordability, especially as we continue to move toward an increasingly digital world. The Lift America Act also makes a long overdue investment to reduce emissions at our nation's ports, as was shared by my colleague, Ms. Barragan. This language is based in part on the Climate Action Planning for Ports Act, which I introduced earlier this year. Ports and the trucks, ships, trains, cargo handling equipment that serve them are major sources of greenhouse gas emissions and continue to threaten the health and well being of near port communities, which, many of which are low wealth communities and communities of color. By investing in ports, we will not only help to address the ongoing climate crisis and historic environmental injustices in this country, but we will also create good paying jobs. And we need to work together to do this. Uh, Secretary Muniz, uh, my questions are for you. Um, what are the benefits of investing in emissions reductions at ports and how will decarbonizing ports improve public health while expanding economic opportunity? Well, thank you, uh, Councilman uh, Rochester. Uh, well, first of all, of course, uh, decreasing emissions uh, anywhere uh, is very important for our for our collective well-being uh, as we see how uh, the climate is changing and the extremes of weather are becoming more uh, more and more frequent uh, and and frankly more and more expensive for us to deal with. So that's number one. Number two. Now, ports are pretty intense sources of, of emissions, so they represent a great opportunity uh, to uh, to reduce emissions. Uh, and at the same time, as you say, uh, in many, many, many cases, address uh, address social equity issues, uh, given the frontline communities that are often uh, uh, practically co-located uh, with these uh, with these with these ports. Uh, third, uh, there is going to be uh, a lot of action around ports uh, increasing. So again, they they pre they present a, a major opportunity. Uh, as I said, both I said earlier, both for uh, broader trade issues, but also in Delaware. Uh, I'm in Massachusetts, the Atlantic Coast. We are we already have 20 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, projects uh, in development. Uh, there's another. Another dozen being spoken of, uh, uh, it's going to increase, uh, and this is going to require developing major port facilities, uh, major onshore infrastructure, major job implications, uh, and those jobs hopefully could go as well to some of those uh, nearby communities uh, uh, that 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 could use uh, good jobs. So it's it's a winner all around. It's a, it's a great. That's a great segue into my next question. I got a chance to visit the Port of Wilmington in Delaware last week to talk uh, with them about the fact that local labor unions have worked with them uh, in our port to make sure that it's cleaner, it's electrified. And would you agree that an investment in clean energy ports will help to spur job creation with the proper labor protections, which are in this legislation, um, that we can mitigate any potential negative impacts on port workers. 
uh, uh, absolutely. And in fact, uh, I'd give you an anecdote. Uh, going back to the offshore wind case, uh, uh, at my organization, EFI, we have a partnership with the AFL-CIO. We have 10 areas that we want to study that would be part of addressing uh, a low carbon with a focus on good jobs. In the discussions with labor, number two on the list of 10 is offshore wind and developing those supply chains, uh, including, of course, the onshore supply chains. So spot on. Yeah. Thank you so much, Secretary Muniz. And uh, I'm excited to see what we're doing at our port and want to make sure that all ports across this country have the tools and the resources and the funding to decarbonize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you. Next is uh, Congressman Crenshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for your patience, patience um, and um, suffering through all of our questions. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Um, look, our, our main problem with this is, as usual, we are spending lots of money. We are attaching morality to a dollar sign. We're attaching the, the length to which we care about something to dollar signs. This is a fallacy, especially with infrastructure. Um, we cannot keep throwing money at things without a, a better plan to incentivize at least some private investment. And this bill does the opposite in many, many cases across the spectrum. When you, build, when you have an infrastructure plan, you should definitely start by making it easier to build said infrastructure instead of putting additional mandates and regulations um, that make it harder. But let me give you an example. Last week, we, we, we debated the Clean Future Act. One of, the, one of the big proponents of that act is to ban future plastic manufacturing. Okay, well, I thought we were trying to build fiber optic cables. So this question is for Mr. O'Reilly. If, if we're not going to be producing more plastics, if we're going to make that impossible, how does that affect our ability to lay down thousands of miles worth of fiber optic cable? Well, there, it, it's a component of, I mean, you, you glass and plastic and a lot of other things go into that, that universe. It's going to make it more difficult, more expensive, um, and it may even drive, drive to buy purchases uh, in other countries. Another question I, I, I've spoken to a lot of industry experts on this is: Is fiber optic cable into rural areas the only way to get broadband to rural areas? Well, it depends on what speed you're talking about. Um, many rural America consumers today get it through a very variety of technologies, and they enjoy it. Most consumers don't care what the technology is as long as it meets their family's needs. And so we have satellite, we have wireless, you've got definitely fiber, you got coax, coax. So there are a number of different technologies that are operating today and people are able to connect to uh, broadband. If you raise the rates and the speeds as, as identified in the bill, well, then you basically are saying it's only fiber. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, let's talk about those rates. You've mentioned 25.3 um, over and over again. I just uh, Googled what it takes to, to watch Netflix, what Netflix recommends. Um, at, if you have multiple people trying to watch uh, HD, then they want a five, uh, they want a five uh, megabytes per second speed. So that's obviously significantly less than, than 100, 100. Uh, okay, I live in Houston. Um, I, I don't think we suffer from, from low internet speeds, but look, but generally speaking, what, what does an urban area like mine have as far as speeds go? Would we be, un and, and my question, what I'm getting at is, would we be considered unserved if we went to this 100, 100 uh, speed rating? Well, there's a, wow. the, the, the estimate I've seen is that 57% of America will be deemed unserved under the definition. So I don't know if that would cover a major metropolitan city, top 10 market like Houston. I, I suspect probably not. But a number of, of markets that we would determine otherwise, I imagine Buffalo would be would fall in that case where I come from, um, and so I imagine a lot of markets that people wouldn't uh, wouldn't estimate as rural um, or unserved would be now be deemed that way. Congressman, yeah, eighty percent, eighty percent of Americans have one gigabit today. So, and and I'm sure, and that's basically what cable companies provide. They are, by the way, upgrading to ten. Gigabits. Okay. I mean, I certainly don't have one gigabit. I, I can I can check that. I mean, the, the point is this: there's a lot of, and there seems to be conflicting data on this. 
But the, the point is this, and I, I think the point Mr. O'Reilly was making earlier, and the, the reason we believe, and, and the reason industry has told us this is what will happen to the flow of dollars if you make it 100-100, is one that's it's unnecessary for what we're actually trying to accomplish just in our daily lives, okay? Uh, but second, it, it causes a lot of urban areas to be considered unserved when in fact they're, they're perfectly well served. And of course, money's gonna flow there. That this makes sense from an investment perspective. That, that, that's our issue with this. Um, I want to move on to Secretary Moniz uh, and, and move the conversation. Jeez, I'm already out of time. <laughs> About Mr. Mr. Moniz, um, this, this plan uh, um, it does not have anything for the, the one baseload energy that is carbon free, nuclear energy. You've written in the past about uh, supporting the need for nuclear and um, next generation nuclear. You haven't changed your mind, have you? We still need to, to do that, I would assume, because the thing about investing in purely renewables is that they're inherently unreliable. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't characterize the uh, renewables as, as unreliable, but I do support, uh, I continue to support uh, modern, modern nuclear, both uh, fission and fusion, by the way, uh, where the private sector in both cases uh, has really stepped up to the plate uh, with enormous infusions uh, more innovation that we than we've ever seen in nuclear, and and I think this is a uh, very promising uh, for 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 impacting our uh, our grid needs uh, in the next couple of decades. Well, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now go to uh, Darren Soto. Thank you, Chairman. President Biden ran on the promise to build back better. And he won. He won because he promised to defeat the coronavirus and bring us back to prosperity. He also won because he promised to, quote, create millions of good union jobs, rebuilding America's crumbling infrastructure from roads to bridges to green spaces and water systems to electrical grids and universal broadband as part of that Build Back Better plan. 80% of Americans support rebuilding our nation's infrastructure. Even President Trump said he wanted a $1 trillion infrastructure package. Yet Infrastructure Week became a long-running joke for four years. How sad for the American people. I'm hearing criticism today from my colleagues across the aisle. But you had your chance. You had your chance for four years and wasted it. We're not wasting any more time. Americans across the country are serious about infrastructure. And we're serious about infrastructure. And that's why we're moving forward with the LIFT Act, with or without you. The LIFT Act will finally lift America's infrastructure into the 21st century. First, it'll modernize our electric grid and boost renewable potential, and make our grid more resilient against natural disasters like hurricanes that Florida experienced and cyber attacks. We're boosting energy efficiency. And we're gonna create an electric vehicle charging network across this nation as was mentioned many times, including by Secretary Moniz, the, the private sector is already there and past that. We just need to step up. Second, the LIFT Act will rebuild crumbling drinking water infrastructure from Flint, Michigan to St. Cloud, Florida, in my district, to cities and towns across the nation. We need to step up to help them. It recently made national news when an attacker hacked into Florida's water system in an attempt to poison an entire community. We need the support, and I'm pleased that we're extending this EPA program in this bill. Also, PFAS chemicals are a pressing threat to our community and lift, the LIFT Act would invest significant sums to help get this out of our water. Um, we even had a cancer cluster in central Florida among our firefighters because of PFAS. So we need to partner with local governments. Third, the LIFT Act would provide internet access to Americans across the nation from precision farming and orange groves in rural Polk and Osceola counties in my district to modernizing classrooms in more urban and or districts areas of Orlando and Kissimmee, uh, to making sure we have high-speed internet, to learn, to conduct business, to have telehealth, among countless activities uh, that modern Americans face every day. We need to make sure all Americans have access to internet. And finally, the LIFT Act will upgrade our healthcare infrastructure. We saw the COVID-19 pandemic laid bare our waning healthcare infrastructure. The bill improves our workforce capacity, expands lab laboratory systems and health information systems. So CDC and our hospital network can be better prepared for future pandemics. Secretary Moniz, in your testimony, you spoke about 
the grid upgrades that are necessary to accommodate distributed and clean energy sources. Speaking specifically on solar, which is really important for Florida, what are some grid considerations as more solar is added to the mix and what upgrades and investments are necessary to accommodate both utility scale solar as well as distributed solar? Well, thank you, uh, Congressman Soto. Uh, well, first of all, one of the issues with solar, of course, uh, we all know is that uh, the sun, uh, the sun, the sun peaks uh, in the uh, in the afternoon, uh, and uh, as solar becomes uh, a very very large part of the grid, and I'm very bullish on solar, I have to say, uh, clearly the storage requirements uh, that go along with it will have to will have to be uh, addressed, uh, and um, as solar is going up, and California has has seen this, uh, then battery storage. Um, is going to be very important for uh, addressing the intraday storage needs. But we still have some innovation to do for, uh, for when solar gets really, really big uh, in terms of also what's called long duration storage, uh, day, days, weeks, uh, and frankly, even seasonal uh, may, uh, may become uh, important uh, as uh, solar be if if solar is dominant in, in, a, in a system. But th this is all manageable. I think the innovation programs uh, need to be pushed hard in, in that direction. Secondly, solar has the uh, unique advantage of being able to, to be deployed at utility scale, at community scale, and at, in, at, and at individual scale uh, with, with individual housing. So it's really an extraordinarily flexible uh, 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 approach, but again, we need to integrate it with uh, with storage in these cases, and battery prices falling down really help with that intraday uh, 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 intraday storage. Now let's get some of those um, uh, longer duration storage. We mentioned earlier, pumped hydro is a great solution, but it doesn't work too well in Florida, for example. Uh, but there are other approaches like flow batteries, etc. Uh, which could be used. Thank you. My time's Thank expired. You. Okay. Next, we go to Congressman Joyce. Thank you, Chairman Colon and Ranking Member Rogers, and thank you for the witnesses for being with us here today. I'm extremely concerned about how the provisions in this bill would affect rural communities, like the one that I represent in South Central and Southwestern Pennsylvania. Many in my district have no access to reliable broadband whatsoever, and this has impact. It has impact on commerce, on health care, and particularly now in education. One of my top priorities in Congress has consistently been to expand services to these areas. Sadly, the direction that this committee is going with the LIFT Act America will only further grow the digital divide and widen the gap between rural and urban America and not close it. Commissioner O'Reilly, the LIFT Act would mandate government collection of pricing data, require providers to open their broadband networks to competitors after they build the infrastructure, and encourage local governments to build their own networks in direct competition with companies. Do you think that this can be a model for success? Well, I think, as I've indicated in my testimony, I think it discourages private investment uh, and favors other, you know, by adding new burdens and favoring, comp you know, competitors from local governments. I think your 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 recipe for disaster and the areas that, that aren't served today are, are are likely to remain that way, um, and and you make it more difficult for the private sector to serve and bring benefits. I think the the speed rate of a hundred up, which you know. My, my my former colleague indicated that the, the cable offers one gig, but they don't offer one gig on upload. Uh, and then two, uh, I would say to that point is is that uh, very few people take that that service. So to, to argue that everybody needs it at that rate uh, and we should pay for it just means that the areas that we should be targeting on that you've talked about in your district and the consumers and con constituents that need service are not going to get it. We're on the edge. We're at the last five percent of America. To get, or give or take to get to the 25 3 threshold and I realize it's not ideal in terms of what you know the future may bring uh, in terms of speeds but it is getting everybody to a basic level and we've never gotten there 
I was at 4-1 trying to get everyone to 4-1 and we moved the, the goalpost. Then 10-1 we moved the goalpost and now it's 25-3 and we're trying to go to a different place. And, and it just, it means that those consumers that you represent that don't have service um, are going to be further uh, further away from, from getting there. Now the idea that you can have one auction and it will solve all the issues, uh, we're, on the, we're on the edge of getting service to those consumers and the attention and energy and efficient activity will all flow to the new $80 billion program and away from these programs, which will be dis dis dismantled. Mr. O'Reilly, I've seen funding proposals that are supposed to be tech neutral, but they require providers to offer, as we've discussed, 100-100 service. That would seem to limit building to fiber builds. And even though, as you've discussed, other technologies might make more sense in some areas based on cost, where I live, based on terrain or remoteness. Do you agree that the programs need truly to be tech neutral to ensure that many parts of the country as possible are able to receive this incredibly necessary broadband? We should use all technologies. Uh, can the consumer, the, the end consumer doesn't mind what the technology is. They want it to work to meet their family's needs. Um, and so to basically say everyone has to have fiber um, that is that that is the wrong direction, in my opinion. We certainly want speeds to be as high as we can, but we still have the population that you represent a portion that doesn't have service today. And we should be really focused on them like a laser. I think that analogy is spot on. We need to have the development and be able to use all forms of technology to provide this service. As I mentioned in my opening comments, we have areas where commerce and healthcare and education are not being served. So being able to utilize all of these is so important. Again, I thank all of you for being present here today and I yield the remainder of my time. Okay, so next we have um, Congresswoman Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you all for being here today. In my state of New York, our hospitals and health systems are among the finest in the world, but our buildings are collectively the oldest in the country. Funding cuts to state and local health departments have undermined their ability to protect the health of the residents in their communities, and decades of underinvestment in public health left us unprepared for this pandemic. We simply cannot afford to ignore the needs of the public health sector until the next crisis arises. We um, ad adequate and sustained federal investment in public health infrastructure is needed to ensure that we can protect and improve the health of all Americans. It shouldn't fall upon states alone to make this investment. So I'm very happy that um, included in the Lift America Act is my bill to provide grant funding to state and local health departments for core public health infrastructure needs. Um, across the country in areas that were hard hit by the virus, like in my district on Long Island, local health departments were on the front lines and played a critical role in providing care to their residents. I do believe it's in our country's best interest to invest in modernizing our public health system to ensure that we can combat emerging health threats in the future. Um, Dr. Frieden, if you could um, just talk about how the core public health infrastructure authorization in this bill will help state and local health departments. What we've seen over the past two decades is a loss of 50,000 jobs in state and local health departments. We've seen data systems that are not up to today's standards and that couldn't manage for the COVID pandemic. We've seen monitoring systems that are out of date and we've seen a population that lacks resilience. And because of that, mortality was higher, more people died and economic disruption was higher. It was more than there needed to be. So it's crucially important that we strengthen state and local health departments. We can do that by not only funding more, but also providing more cohesive staffing with thousands of CDC staff who are embedded for years and learn what the front lines really means, really mean in public health. That is possible through this bill and a health defense operations approach that allows for sustained funding year after year because the risks are not going to go away. And we just cannot keep having this cycle of panic, neglect, panic. We have to get out of this cycle so that we can avoid the avoidable death and economic disruption of infectious disease threats. 
Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Doctor, can you please uh, tell us what accountability mechanisms are needed so that we can ensure that federal, every penny of federal resource, um, that that money is distributed effectively and equitably to local health departments? So first off, um, the, uh, uh, the CDC works on a system of what are called cooperative agreements. They have specific outcome indicators uh, with the recommendation of the health defense operations uh, approach, what we would suggest is specific programs like the CDC influenza program, vector-borne diseases, which could be a huge risk for emerging infections, antibiotic risk, food safety, safety epi uh, epidemiology and laboratory capacity, which we discussed earlier in this hearing, surveillance, workforce, global health security, public health emergency program, the strategic national stockpile, um, the, ho the hospital pre preparedness uh, program, and possibly others from Food and Drug Administration and elsewhere. These are specific lines that have specific accountabilities. And more broadly, we have proposed that resolve that every country in the world commit to what we're calling 717, a commitment that every outbreak is identified within seven days of its suspected emergence. Well, Second, that it's reported, investigation started, and control started within one day. And third, that within seven days, a comprehensive, effective response is established. That kind of approach, that's accountability. We need that in this country and around the world to protect Americans. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to introduce a letter for the record from a group of bipartisan senators that supports 100 symmetrical broadband speeds as the baseline for federal funding for broadband networks. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And I'd like to offer um, my, to yield my final 30 seconds to Mr. Wheeler to um, if you could just respond to some of what my Republican colleagues have talked about today um, that you can address from your perspective. If wow. Thank you for the opportunity, Congresswoman. Um, the current program has not worked. It has not delivered us rural urban equivalents. And we want to keep doing it that way, we ought to be saying, let's spend the people's money the same way that private money is being spent. This whole concept of tech neutrality means tech inadequacy. And it means that there are going to be future hearings asking, why didn't we do it right the first time? Mr. Will, you got to wrap it up, though, because the time has expired. I just did. I'm done. <laughs> All right. All Thank right. You, Thanks. Thanks. All right. Next, we go to uh, Kelly Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Moniz, I actually I appreciate over the last several years uh, some of your comments uh, and statements that have been supporting uh, natural gas as a bridge fuel, and I promise I'm not going to put words in your mouth. So, other than direct quotes, but in 2013, before the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, you stated in broad terms, we find that given the large amounts of natural gas available in the U.S. at moderate cost, natural gas can indeed play an important role over the next couple of decades, together with demand management in economically advancing a clean energy system. In 2019, before the House Energy and Water Developmental Development Appropriations Subcommittee, you say natural gas in particular will continue to play for some time an important role in providing dispatchable electric power generation and high temperature industrial process heat applications that are not readily, readily amenable to non fossil fuel options. But I think, and I appreciate that, and I'm going to give you a chance to uh, answer a couple questions. We've seen too often, I mean, and I, I can use my colleagues in the House that. We have waged a consistent war, at least since my time in 2018, against natural gas, despite its benefits in reducing overall carbon um, emissions in the power sector. According to the Department of Energy, between 2005 and 2019, total U.S. electricity generation increased by almost 2 percent, while U.S. Re related CO2 emissions fell by 33 percent. EIA calculated that during the same time, CO2 emissions reductions from shifts in electricity generation totaled 5,475 million metric tons. Most of this reduction resulted from the increased use of natural gas. But at the same time, we see the political side of this where uh, 
We have had a tax on the natural gas production. Last Congress, uh, many, if not all of the member, uh, Democratic members on this, on this committee voted to ban liquefied natural gas by rail. Uh, we have seen all of the litigation in, in, in not just in new pipelines, but in, in, but in improving existing pipelines. So when we talk about methane and reducing methane emissions, one of that, one of those factors has to be to get uh, to re re replace old pipe that's been in the ground for a long time with new, better pipe and better technologies. Unfortunately, we see that happen at a way where uh, there is no streamlining to the process, right? We see it with the Enbridge line in Western Minnesota. We've seen it with other lines where you cannot get the new pipeline in the ground without dealing with new permitting. Um, obviously, capacity comes into play and different litigation moving on. So um, how do we, How do, this will be the short question. How do we bridge those two things? <laughs> that was a long intro to a short question. We know that this is going to be part of the foreseeable future. It has to be because the technology and the build out of the infrastructure doesn't exist yet. So how do we do that while streamlining the process and understanding the realities of energy production and what we need to fuel our economy? Uh, I may have forgotten the beginning of the question by the end of the question, but thank you. Uh, the uh, uh, certainly the quotes, by the way, I, I certainly own up to the quotes that that you that you said. I do believe that natural gas will continue, will have to continue uh, to be uh, part of the system, uh, uh, particularly uh, as we see the continued acceleration uh, uh, by by the private sector of uh, phasing out coal plants to be replaced. By a combination of gas and uh, and renewables uh, and battery storage, uh, that that will continue. I do think we need to uh, accelerate the introduction of carbon capture and sequestration uh, on uh, both natural gas combined cycle plants and on industrial facilities. Uh, but, with regard just, to yeah, and just real quick, but that's going to require more pipe as well, right? Yeah, yeah, and with, I was going to say, with regard to infrastructure, uh, number one, uh, industry has to get in there with both feet on uh, suppressing the methane emissions. That's very, very important, uh, both technically and, frankly, politically, uh, to, to do that. Secondly, ex using existing rights of way, uh, I think, for a lot of infrastructure, uh, including pipes, uh, is, is absolutely essential to minimize any kind of eminent domain or uh, and and public opposition. Uh, so and, I mean, and, and, so, and eminent and, domain law is different in every state, right? Like North Dakota doesn't have it unless and, you're a common carrier. It's it's different in different states. There are without getting into it, the 2007 uh, uh, Energy Security Act did provide DOE with some eminent domain authorities when it overlaps with some of the um, uh, power marketing administrations. But the other thing on infrastructure. And as much reutilization of infrastructure as we can get is important also in what is a likely natural gas to hydrogen transition uh, when you look down the road 15, 20 years. Well, I appreciate that. If you can figure out how we can deal with the reutilization without numerous lawsuits and permitting hurdles that I, I, I'm all in. And with that, I yield back. <laughs> well, can I, can I just add, is that, can I just add brief for one thing, for example, we could already now start to uh, move some component of hydrogen and uh, renewable natural gas in natural gas pipelines. Uh, we could do 5%, maybe 10%. Uh, so we could start introducing this right now with existing infrastructure. All right, thank you. Now we go to Angie Craig. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this important hearing. There's uh, really no bigger topic we can take on next uh, than revitalizing our nation's infrastructure and economy. Thank you to our panelists for being here and sharing your expertise as well with us today. Closing the digital divide between our urban and rural communities is one of my top priorities as a member of Congress. I have the great honor of representing a district that is part urban, part suburban, exurban, and rural. High-speed internet access is a lifeline to education, to health care, and to economic opportunity. Lift America increases broadband infrastructure development from 40 billion in full year 2020 to nearly 80 billion for 2022 to 2026. 
For my constituents in rural communities, broadband access can mean access to potentially life-saving telehealth services, particularly within the realm of mental health services. So my first question uh, is to Mr. Wheeler uh, this afternoon. Uh, you launched the Connect to Health Task Force during your time at the FCC, which studied the link uh, between broadband and health. In your testimony, you mentioned the need for internet access to sign up for a COVID vaccine. But in your view, uh, what are some of the other ways that broadband impacts healthcare delivery and access? And uh, what do you personally hope we maintain having come through this public health crisis that we've learned as we move to the future of telehealth? Well, thank you, Congressman Craig. I mean, you're right. And, and, I, and credit needs to be given where it's due that it was, it was Commissioner Mignon Clyburn who took on the personal responsibility on that telehealth task force. And I was privileged to travel around the country with her and see how technology is being put to work. It's, it, there's a very simple issue here. The doctors are here, the people are here, okay? We have to be able to connect them. We can't connect them with yesterday's slow speed technology, the kind of technology that we've been hit, seeing hiccups with today, you can't have that happen in the middle of an exam. We need to have quality connectivity between the doctors and the patients so that wherever you are, you get quality telehealth services and that's based on quality broadband connectivity. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, Dr. Frieden, I wanna to turn to you as uh, you noted today, COVID-19 has also laid bare decades of underinvestment in our country's uh, public health infrastructure. In my home state of Minnesota, community health centers serve around 200,000 people annually and employ over 1,700 full-time staff. Centers like Open Door, which operates a dental clinic in Jordan, Minnesota, provide an invaluable service to our patients and our community. The $10 billion in capital project funding authorized by Lift America would provide clinics like Open Door with the ability to expand their facility and their services to reach more patients in my district. Dr. Frieden, can you expand on the importance of capital project funding at the community level and why such funding must be predictable moving forward? This is really important, and it goes into the bigger issue of strengthening primary care. We spend, last I saw, more than $3.5 trillion a year on health care, and we get worse health outcomes than any other high-income country. We live four years less with more disabilities, and we pay more. We are a negative outlier. And um, earlier mentioned some uh, data I, I sent around, we'll sent around after that demonstrates that the part of the fix has to be strengthening primary care systems. And community health centers are a critically important part of that effort. Um, now, community health centers don't have the kind of access to capital that hospitals have. Community health centers serve communities, urban, rural, um, generally underserved. It's crucially important that they have additional funding so that they can serve more patients. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Frieden. And as a new member of the committee, I'm going to yield a whole 15 seconds back to my chairman. For and if I can just take two seconds of that to say that has to be sustained because uh, it can't be just one time. There needs to be a continuing uh, uh, support. Sorry. That's okay, Dr. Frieden. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. Uh, next is John Curtis. Thank you, uh, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our witnesses. It's amazing that you'll stay, uh, sit and stay with us this long. I'd like to spend my time talking about this um, digital divide issue, uh, broadband. Uh, I, too, have a district that is urban and rural. But I think I bring a, a, a very unique perspective uh, to this discussion, um, and that is uh, several years ago, almost a decade ago, I was a mayor of a city. Um, and we had tried as a municipal government to bring broadband into our city. As a matter of fact, my predecessor spent more per resident uh, than this bill does if we put it on a per resident basis. 
and we failed. Uh, I took over a failing uh, network. Uh, by bringing the private sector in, we were actually able to offer gig speed. Now, remember, this is a, nearly a decade ago. Gig speed was a big deal back then for about 70 bucks per resident. But more important, every single resident in my city had free internet and free connection uh, to that internet. Well, how did we do it and, and what did we learn? Uh, well, we learned that government is ill-equipped to deal with the fast changing nature of technology and especially broadband. I've heard today, pay it once, uh, get it right for the first time. My experience says well, you can't do that with this. It's changing so fast and needs so much continual investment that government can't come in and write a check and be done with it. Uh, from my experience, and I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we know by the time the money is spent in this bill, if it's passed, the technology that we're spending on it, it on will be out of date. That's just the reality. Seven years ago, we made national news by having a gig speed as a city. Today, we look back and we kind of laugh at, at that gig speed. Uh, Mr. O'Reilly, what is your experience and, and what, who is best equipped to deal with the fast changing nature of broadband, uh, government or private sector? And, and let me acknowledge, I think both have a role, but are we overlooking the, the valuable role of the private sector here today? Yes, I would agree with you. I think it's both a private sector role and a government role. And I spent time in the government at the FCC working on these issues and working to make sure that the private sector can deploy the network as far as it possibly can. And then those areas where the market wasn't succeeding, how do we design those subsidy programs to entice them to serve the other portion of the population that's not being addressed today? And each market's a little different. You know, and we've done this through reverse auctions, which I help lead uh, at the commission. And so I, I think you know we've, we've learned an awful lot through the process and we're fine tuning it. And we're finally down to that last four or five, 6% of the population that's really hard to serve. That's, that's not necessarily always in the urban centers that you represent. So, yeah, so my district- Can I talk about keeping up? No, to I'm, I'm your sorry. Point. I'm sorry, your Mr. Point Wheeler, I've got a very limited amount of time. Mr. Chairman, please help me out here. This is my time and I've got just a precious little bit of it. Um, Members should only address, uh, you know, response to the people who've been addressed to. Thanks. Um, so my district would represent what you're talking about. We've done an amazing job of getting a good gig speed into much of my rural district. It's that last little bit of it that, we, that we're just not done with. Now, I'm, I'm attending this hearing today in a, if a different location. I've got at times as much as as little as four megs up, excuse me, four megs down and 10 up. And I had no problem with this hearing, so I don't I don't want to waste my time on this, but I want to emphasize what my colleagues have said that we don't need 100 100 to get what we need to be, uh, do here. Now, my last question, Mr. O'Reilly is. Um, can we get fiber broadband to every American household without permitting reform in my district? It takes 9 years to permit across federal land. Are we missing the point here? I, I know it's not the only part of our problem, but are we missing the point? And what do we need to be doing with regulation? I fully agree that a number of legislative efforts that the committee members have introduced should be part of any package. The number of burdens that have been placed on the industry on the permitting side, uh, on the cost side, uh, on terms of the, 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 reg uh, the environmental regulations, and then federal lands slows down projects to considerably uh, and, and prevent the deployment that you just spoke of. And so to getting yeah. those things to happen, proceed. I, I've got just a few seconds left. Let me make this point. As a mayor, I also learned that when we brought in and did an infrastructure project, if we spent $1 of federal money, it increased the cost of our project by 30% because of the excessive regulations. If we want to give a 30% discount right to this project right off the top, Let's figure out how to get government uh, to, to be more cooperative with state and local governments in their efforts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is uh, Lizzie Fletcher, Congresswoman Fletcher. Thank you so much, Chairman Pallone, uh, for holding this hearing today. And thank you to all of our witnesses for your testimony, your insights about the challenges and opportunities before us in this moment and then to, in this infrastructure legislation. Um, have been really, really useful. Um, and there's so many issues to cover, but I'd like to use the few minutes I have to talk about some of the issues that are priorities for my constituents here in Houston. Um, perhaps it's not a surprise then that I will direct my questions primarily to you, Dr. Moniz. Um, 
in your written testimony and during the hearing today, you've talked about the importance that carbon capture utilization and storage will play in meeting a mid-century net zero goal. And this is an area of great interest here in Houston. There's large scale support for CCUS. I've met with a number of my constituents and folks who are actively working in this area. Right now, uh, we worked hard to address some of the 45C tax credit guidance in the last Congress. Um, and here in Houston, we're really well situated to lead the way in the technology with our industrial presence, the existing pipeline infrastructure and our geology. Um, but despite all this interest and all of this work, we just haven't seen the kind of deployment that we need to meet our carbon reduction goals. So in your testimony, you say that in order to create a large scale CO2 management infrastructure, there need to be new regulatory frameworks with additional financial incentives. So I would like to hear your thoughts and about sort of whether and how Congress should assist in this process, what the framework would look like and what funding mechanisms you think would be most effective for these critical projects. Thank you, uh, Congressman Fletcher. Uh, uh, first of all, of course, uh, as you know very well, uh, your, your region would be an excellent place for one of those combined hydrogen CO2 hubs uh, that I that I mentioned uh, with uh, with with industry with CO2, you already have hydrogen uh, not not very far away uh, serving refineries uh, and and the like. Uh, in terms of the uh, need, the incentives. Well, uh, w one of the things is I would uh, say the the DOE uh, carbon safe uh, program to characterize major CO2 sequestration hubs uh, could be supported more strongly and uh, uh, and expanded in scope. That would be one thing. Secondly, I think uh, I appreciate, uh, especially in the work in the Energy, the Energy Act of December, in terms of extending the 45Q tax credits. Frankly, I think more could be done there uh, uh, because in particular to push the CCS on uh, NGCC plants, um, I think we need a little bit more oomph. But the other thing is, uh, I think that we need to really get together in a strong push to uh, use CCS right now across uh, much more of the industrial sector. Uh, that's where you have much more low hanging fruit, some of it in Texas, some of it elsewhere. Uh, for example, in California, we found that all four ethanol plants right now would be in the money uh, if they if they put CCS uh, on those uh, on on those plants. Uh, third is again this issue of of permitting. There are, um, in my view, we are going to have to move ultimately when we start talking about very large scale CCS to addressing the long term liability issues. Uh, I believe we're going to need third party players. I mentioned a possible utility model. Uh, for CO2 disposal. Well, when you're doing that, you have to have some insurance approach uh, to to the long term long term liability issues to turn it over to a, to a third party. So those are a few examples. There's a uh, a lot of a lot could be done, uh, and of course, also in December with the the authorization of six major CCS projects, it's really time. It's really a good time to really implement those. Uh, because we need to show uh, how those work in both the power and in the industrial sector, uh, in my view, by 2030, uh, so that they are ready to really scale in, in the 30s. Terrific. Thank you. And, and one follow up question uh, in the few seconds I have left. You mentioned earlier in your testimony, I think in response to a question from Mr. Sarbanes, about the need for direct removal or direct air capture. Um, and that seems like a critical part of the path forward. Can you talk a little bit just about how you envision that direct removal and what we can do in Congress to facilitate that as well? Yeah, I, I think this is an enormous, uh, enormous, uh, enormously important area. The Congress did add almost $100 million to CDR uh, uh, last year, but we estimate a $10 billion RD and D uh, program over 10 years is needed. I want to emphasize it's not only direct air capture, it's many other approaches as well. Terrestrial mineralization, uh, upper layers of the ocean, getting more alkalinity, uh, alkalinity in, the, in the ocean. Uh, it's a broad program uh, and um, very, very high priority in my view. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Moniz. Um, I have gone over my time, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you.
So now we go to uh, Buddy Carter. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here. This is uh, certainly an important hearing, and we appreciate all your expertise. Mr. O'Reilly, I want to start with you. In preparing for this hearing, I, I reviewed this uh, legislation and this, this bill, and, and I reviewed it with my staff as well. I'm having a little bit of trouble, and I wanted to know if you could help me understand exactly what digital equity means. I, I, it seems like it's very broad to me. It seems like it it includes not only speeds, but devices, applications, contents, digital literacy, and a whole lot more. And I just want to know if you can articulate for me exactly what digital equity is. Well, I think the term is is, is intended to be very broad to meet a population that may not be a subscriber today or may not be a user uh, to bring them online and to de deal with all of their potential needs. And you're right, it, as I read it, it deals with devices and, and literacy and a bunch of different components. I'll try to tie to, to one. Is there is there a clear understanding of what the federal role should be in, in any kind of digital equity program? Well, I, I, I'd have to defer to those that are still in the roles, but I, I don't know that I can exactly determine where this money would go or how you would spend it. I worry that it could be um, you know, misused or could go to some really suspect programs. We've done that in the, uh, we had that in the 90s. There were a couple of different programs, not exactly, and weren't called digital equity, but they were, they, they connected a number of different communities and some of it was wasted and, you know, some of it just didn't go for what was intended. And so I think it's, it's, it's very, you know, can be, it can be vague and I don't want to criticize the intent, but I, I think that there's some, some, some certainly could be uh, addressed. And, and, you know, I have to say, I believe it's intentionally vague just for that reason. Um, you know, I'm not trying to question anyone's intentions here, but I, I do believe that that is the case. Don't you think that a, that language like this could it could it potentially uh, the, the 1.3 billion dollar digital equity program could it potentially prevent it from simply replacing the the lifeline program or the emergency broadband benefit program by just subsidizing the cost of internet? Well, it could be a, a source for that purpose. It can also do everything else that those programs don't do, and you can have this this big, huge package of, of, of services, potentially. I don't know exactly what uh, what, what could go in, the, in this space at, at the current moment. It, 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 it's, it's, um, I'll tell you this, though. As a former regulator, um, as I read it fairly broadly, and I could see where you can you know, basically spend the money anywhere you want to um, and, and make up a, an argument for where the money should go. And that doesn't mean it would be wasted. It just means that you could, you know, when the Congress writes very broad language, you it gives it gives a regulator broad authority to kind of interpret where it wants to go, and if it if it's just that that's what the goal is, well then then that's the the public policy decisions being made. Well, and and that's what concerns me because I I feel like we defer too many times to to the agencies and and don't make our intent clear. So that's why I'm concerned about this because I think it is it's extremely broad and and I think it. It it leads to what some people may interpret to be waste, and and we need to be more specific. And I, I just think that we're falling down on our responsibilities as members of Congress to to do just such. So, um, let well, me ask I, you there. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, was, I fully support addressing affordability, and I think there's ways to go about it. Um, and, and Congress has looked at some of that in a bipartisan way in the EBB program. Um, I, I couldn't agree with you more that the more specificity Congress can provide, the better. The answer which way you want us to go, even as a former, as a former if I disagreed, it, it's irrelevant. Congress has decided, make it as specific as you want to. That helps the agency. It just is a decision you make and the, the agency can bless it rather than trying to guess what the interpretation should be and going down ro roads that it wasn't supposed to go. And I and I couldn't agree to you with you more. And I could name numerous numerous examples of where we've done just such. So, um, listen. One last thing before I, my time's running out here. But this act proposes a number of different concerning changes for me, um, such as redefining un unserved areas. What do these changes mean for for satellite and fixed wireless connections? And and because of those changes, ultimately, what do they mean for consumer prices and competition? 
Well, I think it, you know, as defined by the by people who, who advocate for it, they want it to be fiber and would exclude all other technologies. Um, and so in terms of competition, there necessarily wouldn't be, there'll be either fiber or not. Maybe some places there'd be multiple fiber providers, but really you wouldn't see competition um, and you'd have to, you know, and that would be, you know, then they'd regulate the rates and different things to try and keep the rates down um, through government means. Great. And that's all of my time. Thank you all. Thank all of you and especially you, Mr. O'Reilly, and I yield back. Thank you. Next is Dr. Kim Schreier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to our witnesses. This is such an interesting discussion. Uh, the LIFT Act highlights the need for electric vehicle charging infrastructure in low-income neighborhoods, but we also need to support the demand for those charging stations with vehicle exchange programs for older, more polluting vehicles and provide secondary market credits to make electric vehicles more accessible. And I think it's important to remember that right now, about 60% of electric vehicles are purchased by people with household incomes above $150,000. And most Americans right now are not in the market for a new car. So we have to drive down emissions everywhere, especially in areas of disproportionate impact and public health concerns. Um, and we have to remember also that electrification for many areas means transit, school buses, even reducing emissions from medium and heavy duty vehicles, which represent a quarter of emissions, but only 7% of vehicles. So um, Secretary Moniz, how can we better engage with underserved communities, given this understanding and given our concerns about equity, how can we also uh, incentivize the purchase of electric vehicles, including used ones, so that people in all income brackets have access? Well, thank you, Congressman Schreier. Uh, the uh, first of all, I, I'd like to point out that I think you put your finger on a very important point, uh, and that is uh, a focus not only on the, uh, say, light duty vehicles, but on the fleets that are operating in urban environments all the time uh, would be very important. And often uh, that would that would certainly help uh, some of the underserved communities uh, in these, uh, particularly in these uh, in these urban areas, uh, and the. With the reduction of battery costs, uh, that has been very, very substantial. As I, I've already said, on light duty vehicles, uh, we will be seeing, uh, we, I, I think we've already seen cost parity uh, in terms of lifetime cost, but we'll be seeing equivalence as well in the capital cost uh, with, within, within years. That also applies to the kinds of fleet vehicles, uh, especially because they have big advantages uh, in their charging infrastructures. Now, in terms of the uh, the um, uh, light duty vehicles, uh, it, it first of all, you're absolutely right uh, that you know, the turnover uh, issue uh, is an important one, uh, and uh, the incentives that we've had uh, so far for uh, purchase of EVs, to be perfectly blunt, has favored uh, more well-off people uh, because up to now the capital cost. Has been has been higher. We need to incentivize it. Uh, we may need to have other uh, cash for clunkers kinds of programs uh, help help with the turnover. Um, uh, people driving less in COVID is going to extend the life of the current of the of, of the current vehicles. So I think you're right. Incentive programs uh, targeted more uh, at the um, at the underserved communities would be welcome. But then we have to be creative on the charging infrastructure because the suburban model is not the one that's going to work. That's right. And and of course, attention to public transport transit. Thank you for talking about the delivery vehicles. We have a bill for the US Postal Fleet. We've heard about oh, FedEx. Right. So I really appreciate those comments as well. Um, I'm going to turn to Dr. Frieden really briefly here because uh, again, in the context of underserved areas, I'm thinking about hospital deserts, even within urban areas, even like in Washington, D.C. Um, this is sort of like grocery store deserts. And as we think about the impacts of COVID-19, I'm concerned about how many hospital beds we have per capita in this country compared with other nations, what that means for underserved or unserved communities. And so I was wondering, Dr. Frieden, if you could talk just a little bit more about the importance of investing in the physical infrastructure of the healthcare safety net and how those communities 
could benefit from modernization um, and maybe how that could impact health, health disparities? Well, first, there are clearly hospitals in great need. Those include both rural hospitals and some hospitals in uh, central cities that don't have the kind of revenue streams that others have. But unless we do a much better job at prevention and public health, we'll never be able to build enough hospital beds. We have an aging population with more uh, morbidities like hypertension, diabetes, and we have to fix primary care. We have to fix um, public health, and that's the route to both a more productive and a healthier population. Thank you. As a primary care provider, I appreciate those comments. I yield back. Thank you. Next is uh, Congresswoman Trahan. Oh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and the committee for convening this important hearing. I really appreciate the witnesses' time today, your depth of knowledge and insight. You know, my district is home to the first community health center sponsored residency in the nation, uh, Greater Lawrence Family Health Center, which offers primary health care to more than 62,000 patients in my district. Centers like these across the country are doing double duty, uh, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic while also training medical professionals who will go on to serve the most vulnerable in our communities. The pandemic highlighted the need uh, for our country to rethink and be creative about the way we provide health care, especially to areas that serve high proportions of low income and minority patients, rural areas, and areas that operate tribal or uh, urban Indian health programs. The Lipt America Act authorizes $500 million in grants to support the improvement, renovation, or modernization of infrastructure at teaching health centers and behavioral health centers. These grants could mean state-of-the-art teaching equipment, long overdue building repairs, and even renovations that expand capacity. Dr. Frieden, can you speak to the importance of infrastructure investments in qualified teaching health centers and specifically how these investments could lead to a future healthcare workforce prepared to care for historically underserved populations? Well, the issue of graduate medical education and funding of uh, medical centers is a complicated one, uh, to be frank. And uh, I think what we see is that many of these centers uh, perform a huge amount of service for populations that aren't adequately served otherwise. And we don't have really uh, a sensible business model for that, a sensible way of paying and ensuring quality and continuity of care. I was encouraged to see the mental health uh, uh, provi provision in that because mental health is neglected and it's really important. If you look at disability, if you look at suffering, there's a lot of mental health care uh, that is needed and not obtained. Uh, there, there is in something uh, in mental health what's often called the rule of halves. Only half of people are diagnosed, and only half of those are adequately treated. So support to our behavioral health colleagues is is extremely important. And uh, for all of these, we have to strengthen primary care, including primary care systems that work as teams and have a mental health professional as either a virtual or a present member of that team. I really appreciate it. that was actually my second question uh, in terms of uh, improving the infrastructure of behavioral health centers and increasing access to to treatment for addiction. Um, so I appreciate uh, I appreciate you tackling both questions uh, all at once. Uh, I'm really excited that the LIFT Act uh, could mean the qu that quality and access to health care in this country will uh, improve. Uh, I think I have time to actually switch gears and ask uh, another question. I know it's been touched upon several times in this, um, but my district is home to passionate uh, entrepreneurs that combined world-leading research from MIT and, and Boston College, uh, Secretary Moniz's alma mater, with the work ethic of the Merrimack Valley, uh, which is the, you know, the start of the Industrial Revolution, they are developing inputs to the green economy, uh, magnets for offshore wind, uh, powders for batteries, and new energy storage techniques. But one challenge these innovators face is that even when their processes are more environmentally sustainable, they struggle to build components at a price that's competitive with overseas suppliers. And many times they struggle to even source those input, inputs from the U.S. So, 
Secretary Moniz, with my remaining time, in your testimony, you emphasize that as the market for electric vehicles increases, the global battery manufacturing capacity and number of public chargers need to increase by an order of magnitude. Um, beyond permitting, uh, which is also something you mentioned, can you describe other ways we can improve and expand battery manufacturing in the U.S., including by developing complementary policies that might incentivize domestic battery manufacturing? Well, again, uh, uh, Congressman Trahan, uh, by the way, and I'm from Fall River, not 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 Lawrence, but anyway, uh, the um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are DOE programs that are already have been used and could be uh, could be re-energized, if you like, to uh, to to help uh, with uh, uh, battery battery manufacturing, but there are huge also supply chains there, cathodes and anodes, et cetera, where I think the kind of entrepreneurial activity that you are you are referring to uh, um, will will come into play. Now, I personally believe, that, and and this is always tricky, uh, but I personally believe that uh, we need to develop uh, without prejudging the answers. But we do need to develop not not necessarily uh, a made in America only strategy, but something that takes into account. The security of critical supply chains, uh, and there is no doubt that uh, batteries, uh, for example, are 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 one of the areas that is critical today. I think in my testimony it points out that today uh, battery manufacturing is only 10 percent in the United States. Um, uh, I mean, China is the biggest market right now, but not by that kind of a margin, uh, and uh, and so. Uh, it's been very welcome to see more manufacturing coming into the United States, but we need more of it. Of course, creating the market is ultimately the answer. Uh, and that's where, with the announcements of GM and Ford and and the the history of of Tesla, many new models coming into the uh, coming into the market, including foreign suppliers with with u s. manufacturing plants. If you got the market here, that I mean, that really provides an enormous incentive incentive for the supply chain to be here as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I know I'm over my time. I appreciate all of that. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, next, we go to Robin Kelly, Congresswoman Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. And I want to commend you for putting together this legislation to make long overdue investments in our nation's infrastructure. This holistic approach will allow America to modernize our system and improve the delivery of health care, energy, and the internet. As we've all adjusted to online and remote work, we've seen just how important connectivity is to education and health care. Historically, as we know, rural and low-income urban communities have lacked access to high-speed connectivity. It is, it is perhaps not surprising that companies have invested the highest speed and more reliable networks in wealthier communities, but this is where the government can and must step in. As more and more essential services are offered primarily or wholly online, it only exacerbates the divides that already exist in healthcare, education, and commerce. Commissioner Wheeler, as companies build out the next generation high-speed networks, we cannot let these communities that were left behind during the last upgrade be left behind again. Are there pro provisions in the LIFT Act that will address these disparities and ensure that they are not repeated? Thank you, Ms. Kelly. That is a spot-on question um, because what we need to be doing, and I think what the LIFT Act is trying to do is to focus on fiber so that you build once and don't have to come back and rebuild later so that some segments of society have to play catch up ball. There is in my testimony a chart that shows the growth in computing power, which is Moore's law, which we all are familiar with, and the growth in fiber throughput called Keck's law, which parallels it. And so if we want to talk, the question was raised, the statement was made a while ago about use the money wisely. 
If we want to use it wisely, we ought to spend it as wisely as the companies are spending their money, which is to build fiber. Because once you've got fiber in the ground, then it becomes a matter of the electronics at both ends and the increasing throughput capability of fiber. And that's how you keep up. So your question is spot on that, that it is possible with this kind of an authorization based on the study that we did to have every home in America wired with fiber to future proof for tomorrow and have no second class service. Thank you. Last Congress, I introduced HR 2119, which amends the energy policy of 2005 to increase the authorization for a grant program that was set up to provide grants for states to improve the energy efficiency of public buildings and facilities. That provision is included in the Lift America Act we are considering today. State and local communities often lack the financial resources to undertake large scale efficiency retrofits for public buildings. This grant program makes it easier for states to make these investments, which in turn lowers the utility bills for the community operating the building. Mr. Secretary, do you agree that making our public buildings more energy efficient is important, is an aspect of improving our energy structure? And is there a role for DOE to play in supporting states and local communities who may lack the resources to retrofit public buildings? Thank you. Uh, yes, ab absolutely, Congressman uh, Kelly. Uh, uh, we have strongly advocated, in fact, a, a for, as an example, a program uh, where uh, the DOE could award, if there were the appropriations, of course, uh, uh, energy efficiency upgrades to the uh, hundreds of thousands of public buildings at the state, county, uh, and local level. Uh, uh, this would be uh, often, as I think you know, the, the funds are not there uh, with, without, without some help. This would be great for jobs. It's jobs immediately. And, of course, we, we hope we're coming out of COVID now, but, uh, but still, uh, there's going to be some residual reluctance, I think, in many families of having workers coming into the home. Uh, we hope that's overcome soon. But that problem doesn't exist for these public buildings, which often will be have at least one shift of the day, if not two. They are prime real estate for, for efficiency upgrades. So that, that could be a very, very important program. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Scott Peters. I don't know if he's available. He was there. He was on before, but I... Well, we can go to uh, uh, Yvette Clark and come back. Congresswoman Clark? Uh, she's on mute. I don't know if she knows that we're asking for her. I'm trying to unmute. Okay, it's good. I can hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank you and Ranking Member Rogers for this uh, convening this very important hearing on the committee's Lift America infrastructure proposal. As our nation battles with interrelated crisis around COVID-19, the economy, racial injustice, and climate change, I believe we have a unique opportunity to meet the magnitude of this moment with bold legislation that will finally lay the groundwork for a 21st century America that prioritizes workers, safeguards our climate, and addresses the deep racial and economic injustices that have persisted in our nation for far too long. I'm excited about the fact that uh, we recognize now that it's time for us to turn the page on our 19th and 20th century infrastructure and build a new infrastructure worthy of the 21st century. It is my hope that we can use this legislation as a starting point to work with the administration and with our colleagues in the Senate to create a forward-looking infrastructure and recovery package that allows us to truly build back better. Secretary Moniz, you mentioned in your testimony how the deployment of public EV 
charging stations will need to scale up by orders of magnitude to meet the widespread adoption of electric vehicles over the coming decade. And I agree with your assessment, but I also think it's crucial that we keep equity at the forefront of this conversation. History has shown us that unless we are intentional in our actions, the communities who have the most to gain from new clean technology, particularly in terms of environmental and public health benefits, are often the last to receive the least investment. So Secretary Moniz, do you agree that we should also be focused on equity and access as we look to increase the deployment of EV charging infrastructure in communities across our nation? Uh, absolutely, Congressman Clark. Uh, uh, as you said very, very well, uh, these are communities where uh, cleaning up the air uh, would have a particularly uh, important effect uh, uh, in 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 these in these communities. So, absolutely, on the charging stations, it will take creativity, uh, 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 give, given the uh, patterns of um, of uh, multi multi-family units and the like. Uh, but uh, that can be managed, uh, as we also discussed. There has to be incentives as well. Uh, for being able to introduce the vehicles uh, and the delivery vehicles, et cetera, in those areas. Also, if I may comment, and this is a comment to you, but also to the chairman, uh, that uh, I really appreciate your emphasis on a 21st century infrastructure. We've heard in this hearing a lot about the, you know, the EV charging infrastructure. We've heard about the, the broadband. Uh, the reality is this is a bill focused on going to where the puck is going to be. Uh, and that's what you need to do on infrastructure. You build for 15 years out or 20 years out. You don't build for tomorrow. I thank you. And uh, I'm so pleased to see that so many major pieces of my electric vehicles for underserved communities act co led by Congresswoman Barragon is included in this infrastructure package. Not only does building back better mean ensuring a strong focus on equity and justice, it also means building back smarter. And that's something that I've prioritized as co-chair of the Smart Cities, Smart Communities Caucus. Uh, and I'm also focusing on uh, my Smart Cities, Smart Communities Act with uh, Congresswoman Susan Del Benny, which is a part of the Lift America package. Our proposal would establish a pilot program to generate partnerships between DOE, the national laboratories, and communities seeking to leverage smart cities technologies. Secretary Munez, do you agree that communities across America could benefit from increased collaboration with DOE and the national labs to better facilitate research, development, and deployment of smart city technology? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, uh, we say in the testimony that when we think about smart cities or smart communities, uh, the real focus has to be on what we call the backbone. Uh, the backbone is uh, kind of coherently developing smart electricity with tel with telecom, linking it uh, linking it to to big data analysis, AI, and then the people of that city and the people who are attracted to that city will exercise all kinds of entrepreneurial. Uh, juices uh, to to use that to use that backbone, and and of course the DOE and the laboratories uh, are steeped in those technologies. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. And I just wanted to say to uh, Dr. Frieden that I couldn't agree with you more about the need for us to build out a 21st century public health infrastructure. What we experienced here in New York City as the outbreak epicenter of the pandemic, knowing that we had one of the strongest public health infrastructures in the nation at one point in time, and to see that we weren't prepared, that uh, we really had a flawed system uh, is, is a dear price that we had to pay. And I hope that we will look at the need for our national public health infrastructure. And thank you for all of the work that you all do. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congresswoman. Let's see, several members have come back. I think the next one is uh, Scott Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the irony of having internet difficulties during this hearing. Um, but thank you for holding it. And um, as we heard from Secretary Moniz today, modernizing the energy infrastructure is a vast undertaking that includes 
expanding and upgrading long distance high voltage transmission systems, building out CO2 pipelines and hubs for CO2 storage, scaling up hydrogen technologies for use in transportation and power generation, rolling out EV stations, decarbonizing natural gas systems. The LIFT Act and its companion Clean Future Act take significant steps to address these critical infrastructure challenges. And I'm gratified that uh, part of that discussion has been uh, based on my, the Power On Act that we drafted to develop a, a interstate high voltage micro, uh, macro grid. Uh, Secretary Meniz, you have discussed the concept of collecting energy infrastructure around hubs. And I believe this, uh, I was actually talking this week about the concept with Peter Fox Penner of Boston College, who I believe works with you. The notion involves integrating the various energy systems. A 2021 National Academy of Sciences report concluded that building a national hydrogen pipeline network will play an essential role in meeting a zero emissions target by 2050. And, and in appropriations, we've supported for hydrogen, we've, we've provided support for hydrogen pipeline research at DOE. But could you explain a little bit more about how the energy infrastructure hubs might work and how that might look to lay people like us and specifically about co-locating hydrogen and CCUS hubs and how that might accelerate the hydrogen economy. Yes, thank you, Congressman Peters. Uh, am I on mute? No, I'm okay. Uh, the, um, uh, in fact, let, let me start by saying that one of the studies we did was specifically for California uh, CCS, uh, and what it showed there, there, there were about three natural hubs uh, in the state uh, where you could, you could really focus on uh, the infrastructure in those hubs without having to worry about, at least initially, you know, a macro infrastructure uh, 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 cutting across everything. And of course, it's not only carbon dioxide, but if you look at, uh, like one of those hubs involved the, uh, you know, the Long Beach uh, uh, port, uh, and clearly using hydrogen uh, in that port, uh, electrifying the port uh, would be a, a tremendous uh, step forward. So really a comprehensive hub of that type. As we looked around the country, and that was the figure in our in a, in the written testimony. Looked around the country, we saw similar uh, kind of accumulations of large industrial activities uh, with the opportunities for for sequestration, uh, with the opportunities for supplying hydrogen to those industrial facilities, possibly to the power facilities, uh, and utilizing to the extent possible. That's where, by the way, your support for research on hydrogen pipelines is really important because the extent to which you can have uh, perhaps pipeline structures that could employ at different times, of course, uh, CO2 and then hydrogen uh, could be a very, very efficient way of doing, uh, of doing the infrastructure uh, 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 evolution. So, so we, Secretary, we, do, you, do you have a sense that the bill before us will adequately accommodate and promote the development of energy infrastructure hubs, as you imagine, or should we make changes and amendments to it? Um, uh, I, I think it could be strengthened. Uh, I, th be, I, think it's a, I think it's an important organizational concept. And as I said earlier, uh, uh, one way would be also to focus on a federal program to, in some cost-shared way, develop two or three, at least, of these regional hubs, certainly in this decade. Uh, and 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 that would you know, doing by I mean doing by example would be a, would be a tremendous way for the committee and the Congress to uh, to, to to get this kicked off. If, uh, if okay, earlier, we we'd like to follow up with you and your um, your organization offline to sort of come up great. with some of those ideas we can offer it up to the committee. Um, yes. Also, just wanted to comment too, real Love quickly to on methane emission strategy. The EU Commission uh, wants to review. Uh, obtain substantial reductions by 2030. And it's interesting that the French government blocked a domestic company from signing a $7 billion contract for uh, liquid neck, uh, LNG from a facility in Brownsville, Texas, because U.S. natural gas was too dirty. So there's a, an economic incentive to deal with this. Could you elaborate on what kind of future policy and regulations you have in mind for managing emissions from the natural gas system? Well, first of all, I think the industry has got to got has got to be full in on on getting methane reduced. But there are also new technology. For example, you can do electric drilling. Uh, that's that's being advanced. So we we think, for example, on LNG specifically, and I was part of a project that was looking at at the architecture. Uh, we think that you could do 
a, a net zero LNG facility from wellhead to dock, for example. Uh, you know, uh, these are the kinds of initiatives uh, that we need. Uh, the LNG exports, I think, remain very critical for our, for our allies. Uh, and, and so I think going domestically to net zero uh, would, be, would be a very, very good move. Well, we'll look forward to discuss that more when my time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Congressman Bobby Rush. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and hello to our witnesses. Good to see you all again, uh, Dr. Moniz, uh, Mr. Dr. Greenan, um, Commissioner O'Reilly, and uh, uh, Commissioner Wheeler. So good to see you all again. Uh, and uh, you all have really uh, passed the durability test for today. And I want to thank you so much for your fine testimony. Dr. Freeding, in a shocking analysis, the Chicago Tribune recently found, that, and I quote, that more than eight of every 10 Illinoisans live in a community where brain damaging lead was found in the tap water of at least one home during the past six years, end of quote. The analysis also found that Illinois has more service lines made of toxic metal than any other state. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent to insert an article from the Chicago Tribune explaining the analysis into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Fortunately, the Lift Act includes $4.5 million for land service line replacement with a, with a priority on disadvantaged and environmental justice communities. Dr. Freeding, can you speak to the reasons why replacing these types should be a top priority for public health and safety? Uh, thank you very much, Congressman, uh, and thanks for raising the issue. Lead poisoning remains a significant problem, uh, not just for kids, but also for adults. There's growing evidence that it increases blood pressure uh, and has other health effects among adults. It's a toxic chemical, and we want to get it out of our environment. That's going to take work. Uh, water is one of the sources. Uh, as we've done a better job controlling lead paint, what we're seeing is uh, the residual sources are showing up, and that includes lead service lines. Lead service lines and lead poisoning uh, have long-term negative consequences on a child's development. And the modeling studies suggest that those consequences are have very large economic and educational impacts in terms of the productive capacity of that individual, the societal costs that they will contribute to or require in their lives. So uh, eliminating lead poisoning is not only an inspiring goal, but it's possible, and efforts to do that by addressing all of the sources, uh, including water, are important. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Moniz, today's legislation also invests over $100 billion in clean energy, energy efficiency, clean ports, smart communities, and electric vehicles. Investments of this magnitude and in these areas support our goals of creating a cleaner economy for high quality, good paying jobs. We, uh, Secretary Moniz, uh, during your recent tenure at DOE, you established the user uh, report. And I want you to, I want to thank you for, and the Energy Futures Initiative for producing this manual report. Uh, consider your work with me, you sir. Will you please describe the current state of the energy and job market and how investment of this variety will support job creation? Thank you, Congressman Rush, and it's uh, great to see you again. Uh, the, uh, uh, first of all, uh, in doing five annual uh, uh, energy employment reports uh, uh, pre-COVID, 
a very important result is that uh, we found that job growth uh, in the energy sector was uh, double the pace of job growth uh, in the sector in the in the economy as a whole. So clearly, there's a high leverage uh, here in the in in clean energy uh, to also try to get dig ourselves out of the uh, jobs hole uh, that we still have from from the COVID uh, uh, period. Uh, unfortunately, we don't yet have the data for 2020. Uh, and I'm hoping that the new administration is now going to uh, uh, get that project going because, frankly, uh, uh, let's say it fell through the cracks uh, in the last administration. Uh, but getting a rebaselining for 2020 when we had the COVID impact will be very, very important. Uh, and looking at the patterns uh, of uh, who lost jobs, where jobs were lost, for, a, for example, in energy efficiency, we know that three years worth of job loss, of job gains, excuse me, were lost uh, in that in that one year. Uh, so, so I'm hoping that um, that uh, exercise uh, will happen very very soon to collect the data from uh, 2020. And, 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 and by the way, and, and the Congress has spoken clearly in terms of appropriating funds to the DOE specifically to execute that job. Uh, Thank you, Bobby. Um, and uh, I think last, but not least, certainly is uh, Kathy Castor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm excited that I can bat clean up today, and I want to thank our witnesses for their qual the quality time that you all have spent with the committee today. Um, I, it's been um, heartening to hear all of our colleagues uh, bring forth their ideas to help lift America and create jobs. And it's clear that the Lift uh, America package will really help us build back better and create those good paying family sustaining jobs that we're going to need as we move out of COVID. Um, Dr. Frieden, it's really good to see you again. We thank you for your leadership. It's clear we've got to rebuild our, our public health workforce, infrastructure, data systems, and I appreciate your endorsement of this, of the ideas in this legislation. Um, but I want to focus with Secretary Moniz here on the clean energy future. Uh, because more and more American families and businesses, consumers, they they are demanding clean energy. They know that it's cheaper. They want uh, the modern tools of energy efficiency to help them lower their electric bills. Uh, in fact, there was a recent analysis by Vibrant Clean Energy that found that a clean electric grid with expanded distributed solar and storage is $88 billion less expensive than business as usual. What we're doing, if we just kept doing what we're doing, we didn't make any changes. If we invest in clean energy, $88 billion in benefits. Uh, and that's just one of a, hand, a whole bunch of reports that have informed what's happening here in the Lift America Act, including the, the big uh, report last year out of the House uh, Democrats, this, the Solving the Climate Crisis report. I wanna thank Chairman Sloan for incorporating a lot of our recommendations into this bill. But Secretary Moniz, we've discussed everything today, the grid enhancing technologies, the uh, distributed solar power, uh, how we, we advance ports. But let's talk about the jobs, the opportunities for good paying, uh, a lot of good jobs, union jobs with fair labor standards. This appears that we have an enormous opportunity here all across uh, the, the country to create all sorts of different jobs. Tell me what really excites you when you think about our clean energy future uh, and helping to tackle climate change and the jobs piece. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Congressman Castor, and thank you for your heroic effort last year on that uh, massive uh, uh, report that you that you also uh, led. Uh, with regard to the jobs, well, first of all, as I've said a couple of times, uh, we at EFI have are partnering with the AFL-CIO 
Uh, and one reason for doing that is that, well, first of all, I, I've <laughs> been working with them for a long time, and, and, at, at, and at the Department of Energy, we established uh, a strong jobs, uh, jobs program. But also, uh, frankly, uh, uh, I've said many times that if we do not address the issue of jobs and communities, we will have headwinds in making, in making our climate progress. So it's important for that reason as well. Uh, secondly, with the, uh, with the uh, AFL-CIO, uh, we have written out 10 areas uh, uh, for a clean energy future uh, where we think there are massive opportunities for creating uh, a good, good high paying jobs. Uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, offshore wind was one of those, carbon capture and sequestration infrastructure, those were our top three. So this Lift America Act uh, fits right, 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 right in there. Uh, and labor, the labor is very, very excited about, uh, about this. Uh, third, uh, there are uh, one area, you mentioned uh, solar, for example, uh, uh, just to say that in solar, uh, what we have found is that there are about a quarter million uh, jobs uh, today or the, I'm sorry, in 2019, uh, the last data that we have uh, in 2019, uh, uh, and an additional 100,000 jobs for those who work at solar less than half the time, typically in the construction business where they would spend some time, say, mounting uh, photovoltaic panels, uh, but less than 50% time. If you add them, 350,000. Uh, there's also been a lot of confusion uh, in terms of uh, uh, wages, uh, the wages for those jobs are substantially above the median wage in the country. Uh, and, you know, if one compares it to something like nuclear nuclear jobs, well, of course, nuclear jobs are double the median wage uh, because of very very high safety standards and high high training training requirements, et cetera. So these are good jobs. Uh, they are they uh, pre COVID were being created at double the rate uh, in the economy as a whole. Uh, as we are still 10 million jobs down, uh, uh, this is a high leverage situation uh, where the LIFT Act, the LIFT America Act can come in to, uh, to get the clean energy future and create jobs at a really good clip. Thanks so much. Well, let me thank, um, thank you, Kathy. Let me thank um, our witnesses. They've been, I'm looking at the clock. They've been here over five hours, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> taking our questions and listening to us. So thank you for your participation and your willingness to stay here for over five hours. We certainly <laughs> appreciate that. And I want to remind um, members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses. So you may get written questions from us um, as well, in addition to the five hours in person. Uh, and of course, I would ask you to get back to us as uh, promptly as you can. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, before we adjourn, I do have to go through a list of, uh, of items to include in the record. So I request unanimous consent to enter the following documents into the record. A letter from the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, a letter from the Coalition for Health Funding, a letter from the National Association of Community Health Centers, an article from the Chicago Tribune entitled Brain Damaging Lead Found in Tap Water from Most Illinois Communities During the Past Six Years, Tribune Analysis Finds, a letter from the World Resources Institute, a letter in support of the Lift America Next Generation 911 provisions from the International Association of Fire Chiefs, Major Cities Chief Association, Major County Sheriffs of America, National Sheriffs Association, National Association of State EMS Officials, International Association of Chiefs of Police, Metropolitan Fire Chiefs Association, and Association of Public Safety Communications Officials. A letter from America's Essential Hospitals, a letter from U.S. Telecom, the Broadband Association, a letter from the Environmental Defense Fund, a letter from the American Nurses Association, a letter from the American Clinical Laboratory Association, a letter from the National Association of State 911 Administrators and the National Emergency Number Association, a letter from the American Gas Association, a letter from U.S. Senators Michael Bennett, Angus King, Rob Portman, 
and Joe Manchin, and finally, a letter from the GPS Innovation Alliance and the CompTIA Space Enterprise. So without objection, those will be submitted uh, for the record and they will be so ordered. So at this time, let me just thank everyone again, all our panel, all our uh, members. I thought this was a uh, very good hearing. I, I was rather surprised that we were here for five hours. It seemed a lot uh, shorter to me because it was so interesting. Uh, but with that, we'll thank you again. And at this time, the okay, committee yeah. is adjourned. Okay. Oh, did someone have a question? Uh, yeah, no? yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you all. Thank you so much. This is the committee. Uh, we've got. Oh, a member so do we have something else, in. Morgan? Yes. Yeah, apparently, apparently, we have a member who's trying to get in, log in. I don't know if he's going to make it or not. <laughs> who's that? He's having technical difficulties. Mark Wayne Mullen. Is do you, does he is he trying to get in or what have you got? What's he trying to do? I don't want to hold up the witnesses any longer. They've been here for five I'm hours. Trying to log in. How long have you been trying to log in? <laughs> yeah. Apparently he's trying to log in, Mr. Chairman, but I can't tell you how long it'll take. Yeah, I think we gotta forget it. Couple minutes. We kept him here for five hours. If he wants yes, to, he can send a, a some written re uh, request. All right. Thank you all. And at this time, the committee is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.